Hello and welcome to my series on rapid prototyping. I'm Chris Delion. I'll be your instructor for this. This is a totally free thing. I want people to adapt. If you're running in a classroom setting and you want to adapt this like a textbook, you're welcome. That also means in terms of adapting, these are designed so you can skip entire modules. If you feel like part of it doesn't address what you want for your classroom, certainly just don't assign those parts to be watched. Um, each one of these videos will include a bit of an optional assignment encouraged between them. This is a rapid prototyping thing. So A, the intent is it shouldn't take a ton of time. It's not a big ask of anybody's time to say complete at least one of these a week if you're doing this weekly. Or if you want to aggressively go after this daily, it is possible someone could really take this in just a couple of weeks, about 14 of these units could cram it out. But really, I would encourage kind of pacing yourself if you're especially if you're self-guided, if you're learning online, give yourself that space. And I want to include if you are not in a school context and you're just on the Internet, either find some friends if you know some locally or maybe connections online. Part of what's great about a lot of these, you can do a lot of this prototyping online. So if you're friends from a Discord, friends from Twitter, peers that you've met from going to GDC or former classmates or something, consider looping them in for this. And I think there might be more you can gain from it. You can do it solo. It's possible. But I'm going to encourage a team structure is helpful. Now, they're also going to be varying in length, and this is because it's not meant primarily to be a lecture format of me talking at you, right? I don't, I'm not a strong believer. That's how learning really happens. To me, it's about moving the ratio of work and thinking from my end to your end, that the purpose of the course, is, it is to try to move forward your understanding, your practical experience, having built some prototypes. And so I'm trying to say enough to kick that off. But a lot of the time, some of the time might be a 15 minute, 20 minute, 25 minute. It's going to fluctuate a little bit depending on what the topic is, but if it doesn't take a long time to get the across, then I'm going to encourage you as the time you're setting aside for this to start off a work period, to start really doing something with it. You might think of this almost more like a wood shop class where, and I, you know, and maybe not ever had the opportunity to do this. I took metal shop, wood shop in high school and middle school. I love that stuff. And basically the instructors gave us enough notice to figure out here's what the equipment is called. Here's how to not harm your hands. Here's how to not destroy your materials. So I got to start over and, uh, you know, come to me with your project blueprints and let's make some stuff. And then thereafter that the instructor was there to help them out. And so again, this is where if you're in a classroom, then certainly your instructor may be able to help you out. Your, uh, if you've got a mentor guiding you through this, or if you have a peer group, that's also where they can be really beneficial. Part of what you're going to find is a lot of your learning can come from your peers. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not able to offer, unfortunately, at scale for people taking this thing for free that I can't answer all of your questions, look at your projects. That is where even just having peers trade notes as different perspectives, it's going to really be helpful to you. And also just better networking, better building up those skills and practice talking about it as i'll talk about throughout part of design is that communication that articulation now a few structural kind of notes about the course we'll talk about kind of the general quarters i'll be breaking these videos or topics into and also as a real quick note too if you're getting this through a class or want to use this for class i just want to make super clear in case it wasn't already implied no license is needed no uh no there's no cost there's really nothing you need to do structurally besides point people to it if you want them to learn it i want people to have access to this is what i've spent my career in my life becoming an expert in this first video is literally these concepts, this introduction, some few brief notes about why I'm teaching this stuff, but I don't want to focus too much on that. And then a few kind of general ideas to kind of lay foundation thereafter. The next three or four videos is going to be kind of a general introduction to prototyping. We'll talk about some general practices. We'll talk about uh, a wild card approach that you can use just to kind of get some momentum. That's something that's hard to get out of our heads about the thing we're focusing on. It gives us another idea of a, a, a simple angle of attack. Uh, we're going to look at some digital hardware or alt control. Some people call it, interface prototyping that is not as complicated as it sounds. You do not need an electrical engineering background, mechanical engineering background to do that. Uh, we're going to show some easy techniques and talk about some clever ways you can pull this off. Because part of what's cool about prototyping is it doesn't have to work at scale. It doesn't have to work for everybody. It's have to work in one isolated instance for you to test it and see, do you like this? Um, we'll talk about some real-time rapid design in a mechanical rules section. That's going to overlap sort of also a bridge into digital for, di for electronic games, digital games, which we won't be heavily focusing here on programming and those kind of techniques. That said, I do a lot of that stuff. I, I have some other courses for those. So you might hear me throughout here point you towards a free or affordable course of some kind that can help suggest if that's something you need to supplement in. I have things to teach that. Or obviously, you can go learn those things online. The resources out there are tremendous. Once you have a way you want to apply it, you've got a lot of options anymore. If you want to figure out Unity, you want to figure out Unreal, you want to figure out JavaScript, you want to figure out some other approach entirely, Pi Game, Game Maker, you name it. There's no wrong answer when it comes to prototyping as we're going to talk about it is very much what can you efficiently do to get something working on the machine to figure out what's a good use of your time and energy or your teams or your own resources, however you're going to look at that, as opposed to the opportunity cost of what else we can evaluate. So we don't 
regret our decision years later about a thing we could have figured out earlier on if we'd done a little different work, not more work, a little different work that we're selecting for. So the first few sections are going to be about that introductory area to prototyping. Quarter two, we're going to shift into non-digital games as a whole focus. And that's a few of those classes or a few of those videos we're going to talk about that. I want to stress too, that's not my primary strength. I, I am primarily a digital games designer. That was my profession. That's my background. That's what I have the lion's share of my experience. And that said, I've done some other kinds of prototyping and it is a very useful lens in how rapid prototyping works. So I want to talk about some examples of that uh, while still acknowledging my biases or perhaps weaknesses in those kind of spaces. We'll talk about social and verbal games, games with words. Talk about animal analog prototy prototyping of prototyping with pen and paper and markers and there's ways that can also play a role in your design process, whether for physical or actually also for digital products. There's still ways we analog we can utilize analog prototyping there or for turn based games, right? That's whether it's uh, tiles, board games, card games, dice games, which again, for certain types of games, especially those that are strategy or turn based or perhaps even multiplayer in a kind of a social component to it can still be a great way to rapid prototype that stuff before you put the work into doing it digitally to size up. Is there is there something we should be doing differently? Is this the right thing for us to move forward? And does this have legs? So that's gonna be our next section, non-digital games for the, uh, say videos six through eight or so out of the set. Section three or quarter three, depending on how you wanna look at for this time period you wanna pace through this in, is gonna be thinking about kind of green lighting, uh, collaborations, taking it further. It's basically, okay, we've, we've now tried a number of things. Since again, I'm gonna emphasize trying to do at least one prototype a week, but by that point, you should have enough, you can kind of narrow down because one of the things about prototypes, most of them should not move forward. Right. If every single product that you start or project idea you begin, if you just assume it's going to go from step one to step two to step three until it's released, then you didn't really prototype. That's not what a prototype is. Right. A prototype is an exploration of is this worth taking forward? And the answer is typically going to be no more often than not. So we're going to look at how do we figure out what to take forward? We're going to look at, OK, well, if we want to involve teammates, even just one other teammate. But again, if you're solo, that's OK, too. You can look at it as spending more time on it, teaming up with your past self in another sense of it. But how do we then justify and communicate? It's, it takes an extra level of effort and committing to it to involve somebody else and not just be kind of risking our own time. But now somebody else's how we approach that a little differently and then taking it further about what it means to turn it more to publishable release, how we start sorting out someone understanding who doesn't have us there watching over the shoulder, how we make sure it's going to work for someone who doesn't basically, again, have direct access to the person who's like watching, making sure that it works and fixing when it breaks and explaining it and we have to make it work independently. We'll talk about how to do that at the end of that third section. That's going to also be helpful for if you want to position out of this. We'll talk here in a second about kind of the, the assignments and obviously very free to adapt those to skip those and not do them. One of the things that we do want to target by the end of this series is having kind of a showable best piece that you've produced. So if you think about these weekly projects you're doing, we're going to narrow down from those into a fewer that you're going to really kind of test and take a little bit further. And then out of those narrow down to even a single one, you're really going to take an extra run at really trying to polish up, finish better, test better, make the best version you can as a real showpiece for, I might have done 14, 15, even 16 prototypes. This was the yield, right? This was the the reason that made it all worth it, the very best of those 15 or 16. And we'll show you how to take that and then finish it. And so our final section, those last, I don't know, videos 13, 14, that final month, they're mostly going to be finishing that prototype. And so a lot of the time is going to go into work period for that, for if you're following this, going on kind of a weekly pace or whatever pace is fitting for your calendar. Then the other parts of that, I'm going to be covering some other angles on rapid prototyping so that you have a better lens for where you could take this further, right? I, this You're not going to learn everything there's no about rapid prototyping in the span of one video series or one informal self-guided course. But what we can do is give you a good foundation, some good amount of experience in it, and then point you towards ways that rapid prototyping doesn't just apply to the entire project, but within a project, how we can apply it to discern level design and what's possible in a certain engine or puzzle design for let's say you've got a game that has mechanics that you're unfamiliar with, you maybe can't find an example to draw from best practices, like some more established genres, how we can still use rapid prototyping to make sense of that space to make it coherent and usable to us. We're then also going to look in that section at how prototyping practices relate to audio and visual targets. So for most of this course, we're gonna be looking at very, very rough prototype, we're talking as soon as you can tell what that image is or tell what that sound is, spend no more effort on it because the whole goal of prototyping, right, is to minimize how much of your time you're wasting if you just throw this whole thing in the trash. So we're not focusing that for most of it. But that said, part of how we navigate those complex, tricky decisions about how something should look, how something should sound come from a type of prototyping, a type of experimentation 
And though I'm not primarily an artist, not primarily an audio person, I will talk about how on game teams I've seen that interface to how the effort gets spent, how we can how you can evaluate and explore those, and some just high level notes about things to look out for, things to be aware of in your practice and process. And then the final thing we're going to talk about, again, it's not the main focus of this course, but we'll be talking a bit about how the prototyping mentality connects to potentially marketing or business concerns, how it fits into a bigger picture of trying to commercialize something. And a lot of people have an interest in part of why they're prototyping is to try to find their very best idea that's got the best potential to really put more oomph into. And so we're going to take a look at how the same mentalities of prototyping, the same ideas of testing and developing strategies to figure out learning by building and learning by testing and listening to our audience's reaction to it can be applied in the marketing and business worlds. And again, we're not mainly a marketing business class, but that is why those sections are tail loaded to the end of the class in terms of the last few sections, figuring that most of that time you're going to be working on finishing, polishing, cleaning up your favorite of your earlier prototypes. Now, I want to mention too, even though structurally, I've got these kind of quarters divided within the span of again, I don't know, 14 weeks, we'll see how many videos I make for this. And even though each of those is covering a different thing, analog, verbal, turn based, digital, real time, rapid, whatever. I want to stress, you do not need to make the weekly prototype based on what technique or topic we talked about that week. So if out of the, you know, let's just pick a number now, 15, if I do 15 of these videos in the series, you're following along. If after each one, let's say after the third or fourth time we talk, you figure out like, gosh, you really like card games. Like that speaks to you. There's something about it. That's more how your brain works. You like playing card games. That's where you're your happiest. I would encourage then you're more than welcome to make several card games. And if you hit, you know, hit the section where it's about verbal games, you're just like, well, that's just not, not your jam, not for you. That's okay. You can be selective. I trust you as adults or as self-managing independent individuals to be able to choose between your options for what you feel like experimenting with. And perhaps then maybe a few weeks later, you decide, you know what, now I do feel like doing a verbal game because that sounds more fun to me than some other topic Chris is talking about further in the series. It is up to you. I want to mention too. Now let's go back to the kind of a class overview or course overview structure. And obviously a couple notes, right? Uh, I am probably not your main instructor for doing this. This is kind of a general textbook. I'm encouraging other educators to deploy, fit into their, their situations. So anything I say can be completely overridden by your actual instructor in the classroom this is just a video, right? Uh, and then likewise, if I say something, it turns out your school policy is different about how something works. Well, I can't shield you from that. I'm just some dude on the internet talking. Now, in terms of production quality, I want to set an expectation early on that this is, again, clearly totally free, totally out there. So don't expect high production values. I'm not probably gonna be having animations on the screen like my courses that are, you know, out there or out there for sale. Uh, it's mostly gonna be me talking to the camera. Now, that said, if you do this correctly and if you participate, there's going to be a lot of variety of what you're going to see in this course, but the variety is going to be the things that you build, the custom projects that you're going to make between every single one of these videos that I cannot encourage you enough to do, right? If you just sit there and listen to these, sit there and watch these, you're not going to come away from it any different. And that is the objective. The objective is to get you from where you're at to where you could be after 15 or so of these videos, having built a series of things yourself, having then seen and tested them against the different lenses we're talking about. That's what I want to emphasize. Now, when you're making those prototypes, and this is going to be, again, certainly be true if you're doing this somehow in connection to me through home team or some other group that I'm involved with, but hopefully too for your instructors or teachers, but you know what they say overrides, document the heck out of everything, right? Document your process, make notes to yourself, take pictures of things at different stages of it. If you try a thing and then pivot from it, make a note of what you pivoted from and why. And a way to think about this is that really prototyping is exploration. Think of a big old design space, a big broad map with huge territories of unexplored domain that either no one has seen or certainly you haven't seen. And you want to go venturing out there with your prototype. And each prototype you make is a random dart thrown at the map to say, I'm going to explore over here. And that is where part of your work is almost cartography or, you know, an explorer again to be taking pictures, to making notes of how you got there. Let's say when you're prototyping, you discover a landmark that you would like to show other people. All right. I'm out in the jungle. I see this incredible waterfall. I feel inspired. I know that, you know, sometimes the jungle is just a jungle, but here there's this place if people could see it, it would just, oh man, they would love it, right? If I didn't take good notes on how I got there, if I didn't take clear documentation on how others can get there, it's useless. It doesn't enable other people to follow in my footsteps. It doesn't enable me to even backtrack to find it again, to keep working on it. So you got to make that sort of notation to yourself, whether it's a Google doc, whether it's just some other way you want to manage your notes, Trello's. Uh, workflowy, whatever system works well for you. Make sure you're keeping notes with the expectation of to be perfect. You might clean them up later. They don't have to be like perfect lab notes, 
but taking those notes, taking those pictures and contemporaneously. This is one of those things where right, when you're exploring, it's much harder to sit down and concentrate and figure out, shoot, what steps did I take? How did I get there? That if you do it while you're having those thoughts, all you have to do is just put down your honest current mental state. Here's what I'm doing. Here's the decision that I made. Here's why I made it. That can then help you connect the dots afterwards to figure out, oh, you know what? There might be a shorter way there. And another no, reason why it's so important, right, is let's say part of your goal for this, part of your result is, you know, we talked about we're going to have a final project that's going to take, narrow down your prototypes and then narrow down those to test and then narrow down one of those to be your best piece from the whole course as a showable. Here's a thing that's kind of public ready, unlike some of my other crude graveyard of unfinished prototypes. But part of your also deliverable is going to be to the outside world, if not to me, then on your portfolio, if not to your instructor, then for future teams you want to collaborate with, being able to show and articulate your process. This is what separates a good designer from a bad designer. So they can talk about their ideas, they can articulate their ideas. That's what enables them to involve others rather than just kind of disappear and then show up with an answer. This is also so critical to the fact that the ideas we have in here are transitory, they're temporary, they're a means to the end of getting practice at it. Your real goal out of this, right, isn't to get one tremendous idea that can really be the tent pole of your future. It's to become that much better at being a fountain of good ideas. It's that if you're dropped into a new situation, a new team, a new technology, a new interface, a new situation, a new market opportunity, whatever, and you go into it with the right mentality, the right strategy, then you're going to be much more successful if you're not stuck to, well, I had one good idea once. Let me keep trying to do something with that. And instead, look at it from, I have a set of strategies to adapt. I know how to understand my context, know how to design, know how to rapid prototype. That is the purpose of rapid prototyping, right? Not the end result. It's that ability to, you can throw me into a new situation and I have a process that's going to give me an informed way of thinking by building to get to a better result than I could otherwise. That's going to spare us all time and regret and doing the wrong thing for too long. Now, with the documentation of process, I'm going to encourage where possible, right? It's good to try to call your shots. It's good to try to articulate why you're doing something. Is there a principle to it? Is there a certain thing that reminds you of a certain thing that inspired you to try it? And this is, again, helpful as a communication tool. It's also just helpful to try to make sure you're not just totally spaghettiing at the wall. Every now and then, I will acknowledge uh, there are things that can happen, especially in real time design, that I, I've taken a few leaps of faith and just kind of tried a thing and it, thankfully it worked out. That should be the exception, though. And I think of it a bit like, you know, if you had to write down every single before you could strum on a guitar or try singing, you had to write down a justification for the song you're about to prepare. A lot of music I don't think comes out of that process. We're not necessarily that verbal articulate about what is going on in that kind of inexperience as an artist, as a creator. And part of the nice thing about digital tools, especially or even physical tools, is how much we can kind of experiment a little But That really should be fine tuning. That should be experiments at kind of a finer level of better like this, better like that right? Like we're trying to do electronic music composition, like we're trying to get a glasses prescription match, better like A, better like B, better like C, better like D. That again, occasionally leads you an interesting kind of wiggle. But what we're going to talk about is one of the dangers of that kind of process. If we are not cognizant of what's going on, if we're not strategic about our breath, is it can lock us into a local maxima, where what's happening there is that we basically are getting a better version of a thing that still wasn't worth doing. And we have to be careful about that because it's really it's counter to our principles of rapid prototyping that our goal should be to really test wildly different directions first before we narrow down which one's even worth experimenting on. And that's where if we're not careful, we can kind of wind up just burning a ton of our time, our energy, our life, company resources, team, energy, time, morale up on something that we were doing a better job of a thing that frankly wasn't the better thing to be doing. So we want to be careful of that. And part of that becomes when we articulate, what are we doing next? Why are we doing it? Trying to be intentional about that. And that can include in our notes, admitting to ourselves you know, A, was I wrong? Was the reason why I thought this would work different than it worked? That's part of how we can learn that chance to reflect on it. But we can't do that if we didn't make a note of it because we don't have a reference point to compare it to to figure out, oh, shoot, I just realized that, yeah, this uh, this doesn't really connect to that idea at all. I saw it the wrong way. Going forward, you have that much better clarity on being able to predict your own personal future as a designer. It's additionally a case where it might be that you create something you articulate why it worked, and that leads to a new direction when you've articulated and you see that it points in a new direction. But again, that's going to require a bit of documentation. It's going to require getting out of our heads. And the end result isn't just those products. It is the documentation that associates with them. And this is also important because for so many things that are prototypes, but honestly, for all projects, a lot of prototypes will not be playable forever. Heck, in physical interfaces, often there's one in the entire world. And the second that that device, that setup, that wiring, that Arduino or something is gone, it's unplayable forever. Even in digital prototypes, there's lots of things. I don't know people who made, I made a whole bunch of prototypes in Flash. They don't run anymore. 
I made DOS games that some will work in DOSBox, some won't even emulate in a modern machine because of some weird assembly tricks they use for video RAM. There's things that will not be playable forever, and your documentation may be all you have in the future. Not the least of which, for someone who's looking at it, whether a potential collaborator, potential recruiter, just your friends or family are curious, a lot of them are more likely to parse your documentation about it, watch a video about it, look at some screenshots of it, see some photos of it, then they actually take the time to play it, which they probably won't do unless they first understand it anyway. Now, as a note about this, it also means I'm going to encourage you, and I'm sure all teachers encourage this, to start early. So let's say you're pacing these, I don't know, once every other week, once a month, once a week, whatever you're pacing this series through for you or the class that you're distributing this through. As soon as, again, the video stops, you want to try to do some stuff to get some action going on your prototype, not just writing down some ideas, really trying to try to build something playable somehow. Do something. And it could be grab objects and reach and make a board game out of it. It could be just do something at all. Start talking with others, trying something. And the reason why this is so important to take immediately is that that's what's going to give you the chance to then get away from it, to get some distance, to go to bed for a night or two, to come back a few hours later with now some distance from it. And when it's at arm's reach, arm's distance, it's much easier to get a clear sense of, I see some flaws in that, or I see some other opportunity that shakes out of that, that if instead you wait until the night before, the morning of, 10 minutes before, it's not going to be as good. And I think some people get the wrong idea because rapid prototyping is inherently rapid. It's inherently fast. It can be done quickly that because of that, they don't need to plan ahead. They don't need to give a lot of time. But really what's going to result in a good rapid prototyping practice is utilizing that speed to test a variety. And we'll talk about some of the strategies and techniques that, that can ways that integrates into our bigger picture of our work that we do. But again, it's not an excuse to save it till the final minute because you only need a minute. It's to say, okay, if I can do this in a minute, and then I could crank out five or 10 of these in five or 10 minutes and then pick the best of those, you're going to be better off, right? The best half of your work is going to be better than the worst half of your work. Now, this bridges very well to my next point, which is about the three kinds of assignments I'll be talking about, at least if I'm administering a course like this and again, home team or some other kind of context. But I encourage for instructors to consider. And again, obviously, up to you, you want to do things with your students. But even though we have a prototype every single class, so 15 ideas of what you'll decide your best, say, seven of those your best half of those. When I say if you pick your best half, it's going to be better than your worst half. I mean it. And part of prototyping is leaving behind and not publishing and not showing and not even stressing about giving any extra attention to stuff that belongs in the trash. And if we don't have the flexibility, the freedom to throw some things away, we can't really explore freely. There's too much pressure on us to, to keep hitting home runs if every single hit counts. So even though there will be, again, about 15 prototypes you'll do between each class period or between each video in this kind of series, depending how you're experiencing this, I'm only going to even look at your documentation for the half, the seven or so that you decide are your best ones you want me to evaluate. And I'm just going to make it clear. If you don't do half of the prototypes, if you skip every other week, if you do the first seven, then don't do any others. If you don't do any for the first half and then do them for the remainder. Honestly, I will not hold it against you that you did that because I will be oblivious to what other eight I suggest you should have done. Now, what I think is more likely to happen, just having spent my entire life as a rapid prototyping expert, is that your remaining seven, if you only had seven, are going to be worse than if you had 15 and were able to pick your best seven. And I think there you're cheating yourself out of the learning experience of being able to take more swings, take more tries, try more wild experiments, knowing full well half don't have to work at all. Half will never be handed in any form. But that is where the good results come from. Rapid prototyping is the ability to try stuff, knowing most of these aren't going to keep. So that's part of how I want to structure this for you. And the way I'm most likely to evaluate those prototypes isn't just the prototypes themselves, although I certainly I will play it if I'm your instructor. I would encourage your instructor to check it out if they can for context, but probably more so through your documentation. So again, it's even more emphasis on in your documentation. It's not just enough to have notes to yourself, scraps like that, but to make clear how was it played what changed? What was your initial idea? How did your final idea deviate from it? These kind of reflections on how your prototype evolved or changed, how it works, what it is, what you liked about it, what you thought didn't work about it. Those are the things I'm mostly going to be evaluating for the prototypes. Again, especially because the ones outside of the one we really kind of final polish for strangers to understand. I know a bunch of the prototypes are going to be weird, just totally off the rails, bizarre, difficult. And so the easiest way for me or any other instructor to navigate and make sense of that or your peers classmates, group people online is going to be to look at, okay, let's look at each other's documentation. Let's talk about, tell me about the thing you did based on your documentation. Show me some of the pictures you took and we'll discuss it from that angle rather than all take the time to play this thing that honestly, 
is broken and it's supposed to be broken. And if it's not broken, you might have kind of done the assignment wrong in terms of prototyping. Now, one exception to that note about you could just not do them for the first half of the class or something is that at the end of each one of these quarters, once it's every three weeks or so in the kind of current pace of what I've got in mind here, then it's something where we would like to take a chance to pause and you can pick, okay, let's say so at the end of week four, you'll have done two or three prototypes by that point. I'd like you to pick which one of your current prototypes you've done so far you'd like to discuss with your peers for peer critique to practice that peer critique experience. Again, it's one of these areas where it's going to really behoove you if you can find some teammates, some collaborators, a partner, even two or three people. You don't need a whole class size. can go a long way to help you do this. Or again, if you're connected to a home team, obviously I'll help you do it or something. But this is something where talking about the project, receiving feedback, learning to digest that feedback, adapting that into your instructions, finding ways to not be defensive about it are so core to the skills of a designer. I really want to build that in. So at the end of each one of these quarters, after another several weeks, we'll have another chance that we try to build in another few weeks, actually. Now you're trying to build in peer critique to get practice at how we talk about our ideas, how we listen to others about our ideas, how we provide critique to our peers about their ideas as designers. It's going to be good practice for all of us. If you do in the first three and you feel like those are just somehow your best, A, keep doing more because that's going to help reassure you through due diligence that, yeah, those really are the best. It's not just for lack of trying. It's because, gosh, you just kind of came out swinging and had some beginner's luck. But if those are the three you want to use for the critiques at the end of week four, week eight, week 12, whatever they work out to be, no, I'm not going to stop you. I don't care. That's fine. I trust you with it. Uh, again, I'd be surprised if you didn't then make six more prototypes and decide you still those are the best you had. But I cannot stress enough if you want to again stick to mostly card prototyping, digital prototyping, Unity prototyping, VR prototyping, mobile prototyping. I won't stop you. Obviously, if an instructor is running this course, it's not me. They're using this like a textbook. You know, they might have their own parameters for what they're comfortable grading, running, teaching you, etc. Speaking of things happening throughout this course, there are a few times throughout this course where I might suggest some things that will be easier if you can spend a little bit of money. And I'm talking like 20, 40 bucks, maybe. You could probably get away with 10. And honestly, if you want to spend zero dollars, you could certainly do this stuff in ways that are either using stuff you already own and can find or can borrow from somebody and won't damage. But certain things that we do in rapid prototyping might involve, just as some examples, a uh, chess or checkerboard, uh, buying something that has some dice in it, buying a pack of cards, stuff like that. Because if you can design a game that leverages those pieces, maybe different than how they were intended, right? You might buy a Monopoly board and use them differently than what it was intended for. Then A, you immediately have something to test with, something to play with, something to work with and experiment with, test your ideas on in a way that didn't take any building, assembly, construction, that kind of stuff. The other nice part of that is if you can find a game that's playable with a deck of cards or playable with a standard checkerboard, you then can tell anyone in the world to go buy a checkerboard and the rules to play your game and it's available to them, which is pretty rad in terms of digital game design has that benefit, right? You can make a game, distribute to millions of people overnight. Analog usually has this pipeline problem. You've got to go through printing cardboard and printing cards and molding plastic or metal pieces. But if you can design your game around, here's a way to play with chessboard pieces. Here's a way to play it with standard set of dice. Suddenly, you can likewise distribute it to as many people overnight as the people on the internet care to check it out. So that's where I'm going to encourage again, if you can afford some small budget for things that might also include, for example, in our hardware interface, alt control design area, there are ways to make that work, right? Where we might position a Bluetooth mouse. So when you sit on something, it causes a button to click and you can connect an application. There are ways you can connect. I think we'll show an example from, I think it was Tim Garbos from the, what the bat, what the golf game developers over in uh, Europe somewhere that they slide a mouse along a pole as part of an input mechanism for a prototype that they did in Indicate Europe several years ago. There's ways you can utilize hardware pieces that don't damage them. That said, some of the other interesting things I've been able to do through hardware alt control design involved breaking open, unscrewing a joystick, a gamepad or something to rewire those button contacts to a picture frame or to a chair's rotation on a throttle twist or something for a joystick. So there's all kinds of other ways we might be able to leverage them if, again, you're comfortable buying a few things to try it out. And the reason why that's so helpful to us in the game design space is that some of the most exciting low hanging fruits for design are when we have a new interface. So I, I had the great privilege of my career. I got to work on launch titles for iPhone. I worked on motion controls for Wii when that was still a novel thing. I worked on a connect project and the research labs. And in each case, the fact that there wasn't already decades of people using it in the same way that they've been using, you know, video game pads and uh, joysticks and keyboards and mice, those are such heavily explored conventions, established gates of entry, player expectation there that, man, when it was our first time experimenting with 
multi-touch on the screen and accelerometer interfaces and little IR cameras and the Wiimotes and stuff, it really opened up a lot of cool and exciting opportunities. And it's part of the nice thing about all control stuff is that when you make a different kind of controller or even a way to interface to an existing controller in an unusual way, some really interesting novel experiences are possible that in terms of rapid prototyping are great and very appealing to discover. That again, just becomes very different from how do I make a better platform or a better FPS game, a better board and card game. Those are all valid exercises. We're going to talk about things that can apply to that. But in the all control section, especially there's reasons why it's helpful to figure out if I can make a game that I don't know, involved playing with a plastic guitar controller, that would have a totally different reach audience and experience for the users. Now, some very broad notes about prototyping. Most of talking about the concepts of prototyping is going to happen in our next video or two. But the really at a high level, right, a way to think about this and why rapid is often our focus is that the goal is to minimize how much of your limited time or company's limited budget or finite resources of your teammates you spend working on the wrong thing. Too often, it's possible that people will spend years on a project and looking back on it, find out this wasn't the right thing to have done. And that is unfortunate. They'll never get that time back. All right, you can earn money back conceivably. You can never earn time back. And so it's a way if we can try to figure out sooner rather than later, what is worth spending more time on? So an example of this, just my, uh, we'll talk more in a second about my background, but one of the things I did with Electronic Arts was rapid prototyping internally for a game called Medal of Honor Airborne. And there were features they were experimenting with. And so if someone have an idea from the design team that say, okay, well, what if, what if while they were doing the airdrops or the parachutes, what if this maneuver was possible? And my challenge was to get it working as fast as possible on the Xbox 360 or whatever device we were on at the time, running on just an SDK in the hackiest, ugliest, sloppiest, unshippable, no one should look at this code directly approach so that by noon, a producer, a game designer, an engineer could come try it and feel on device, on screen, the gist of the experience to figure out, is this worth taking weeks to do correctly? Because to do it correctly is going to require new animations, new sounds, new interface elements. And so I would just rush it, get it working. They could size it up and say, yeah, this is worth doing. Or they also could size it up and say, you know what? Let's not do it right? And that's still a valid outcome for rapid prototyping because what it does, it informed this shouldn't be more time spent on it. One way to think about rapid prototyping, again, we're talking at the very end of this course, the whole series of these videos, talking about the marketing business lens. Another thing to think about, right, is when people kickstart a project, some people look at the kickstarter project and they failed because they didn't meet their kickstarter goal. I think that's the wrong framing. And because there's a relevant lens here for prototyping that if the feedback they get was this was not something that was worth spending that amount of money and time on, you're free to go put your energy and time on something that is. And that is still a successful result, right? Like a scientist can go through an experiment and accept that they are equally happy and equally still doing science if the discovery is this chemical didn't do it, this light bulb didn't work, this wasn't the way forward. Now we know that, we add that to our notes, we keep exploring, that's the work. And so not expecting every single prototype to turn out good is a part of being a good rapid prototyper. Now, another reason why rapid prototyping has been so important to me is most of my career after Electronic Arts years was as an indie game developer, doing web games, doing casual games, doing some mobile games, doing all kinds of other little things and bits and bobs here and there. And something to recognize, right, is that there are great projects in the world. I love them too, that take six years of energy and hundreds of millions of dollars and teams of just hundreds of professionals. Those are valid. Those are good. Those are great. As a solo indie, as a small team indie, I was never going to produce those things. And certainly if I did, it wasn't going to compete at that kind of scale. So in the market of opportunities of things that can be done in the world that people are hungry for and will enjoy, there are things that you can pretty well paint a target on and say, this is going to be worth a lot, right? If we can make a great third person space horror shooter game, a lot of people are going to want that if we can really polish the heck out of it and deliver on a 15 hour experience with a multiplayer component, and all that. Yeah, you're not wrong. That's also why you're going to have to invest heavily to really win that fight toe to toe with giants who are out there with massive funding, massive success of track records, massive franchises that keep funny money coming into their operations for decades at a time. On the other side of the spectrum of trying to make your best of things when you're small, when you're solo, when you're independent, when you're a team, when you're students, agility is your strength. It's that you have the chance to try some stuff that frankly would be a waste of time for those giants. Does that make sense? You like it's not a good use. And I literally since it was early iPhone era it was around the time I sort of overlapped a bit of my time at EA. EA temporarily, and this is all public information, not giving anything away, had a little division internally trying to make some iPhone games kind of the same way that indies were. And what they very quickly figured out was it just it was dead in the water. It was not ever going to make sense at their scale. And this is where when we experiment, we prototype, we might find something that was a need unmet because it wasn't going to speak to people like the kind of projects that make sense on billboards and TV commercials and movie reveals because those were kind of findable big target audiences with established expectations. 
But with the power of the internet, right, whether it's an analog game you can distribute, kickstart, gain a following for a digital game that you can get players for on itch.io or somewhere else online, on Steam, on Unreal, on GOG, you name it. What you can find is you might find a target that is actually a pretty sizable, good, unmet need for a type of experience that might be adequate to fulfill one, two, three, five people's earnings pretty substantially, pretty decently in a way that is never going to justify hundreds or thousands of salaries and a full-time company that's used to cranking out successful racing games and sport games and so on. And so this is where if you're thinking about doing this stuff professionally, it is a helpful lens to understand. Again, I've done it within big companies, but a lot of my rapid prototyping was really what enabled me to also exist as a solo indie, a small person, scrappily doing things on my own. That's how you can recognize opportunities that otherwise people don't see because there's no way to see until, again, we start throwing some darts at that territory to explore and finding out when we build stuff, what makes sense, what's fun, what feels good on device, what's worth iterating on, how do these 10 different ideas I tried compare to each other, how do we move forward with those? That's the kind of practice we're talking about in this course. Now, I've dropped in a few notes before coming up to this, but I want to kind of take a moment here to really set aside a few reasons why I'm particularly thrilled and set up here to be teaching rapid digital prototyping. And this is partly because in 2007, 2008, for seven months in a row, at 219 days or so, I made a playable digital prototype every single night online. It was called the Interaction Artist Series. They're offline now. They were in Flash. They were hosted through an outdated PHP form. But I'll throw a link in the description somewhere or the course description with resources or wherever, depending how you're seeing this video. That's something, though, that at the time I had very little audience. I had very little traction. I think a few people looked at them, right? We had a blogger in Scotland who was a kind of became an online friend of mine. We had my roommate at the time. He talked to me. He would post on the blog and comment and interact with me. No one else cared or looked at him. But here's where it worked, right? So I took those 219 prototypes. And because of the internet, I could do some basic data tracking. Who clicked on which ones? And identify which ones, what were the five that people really resonated with, were sharing on at the time stumble upon, or kind of a predecessor to Reddit, or where people were posting on the early Facebook and so on. These are things where I went back to those. I then doubled down my energy on them. So I didn't just make it a one light prototype. I took that as a foundation, made some much more polished iPhone experiences as part of the early launch of that platform. And because I was building on, I tested hundreds of ideas to find the five that really resonated with people at that time that there was no way to have predicted or have told through just a focus group survey what people would connect with and want to share because those are the five that I mined. Those respectively got me involved with the Indicate Festival as a finalist. One of those helped get me into graduate school for my master's and where I started my PhD. One of those helped me earn my living in downtown San Francisco for a year and a half. One of those helped connect me to a publisher deal in the six figures from New York City. And all of these different projects were only possible because of these weird little ludicrous experiments that I went into it knowing full well, most of these are going to have no traction, no value. I'm not paying to promote them. Just an experiment to build, 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 build and try stuff. And so that's part of why I'm so excited about rapid prototyping. There's a lot I can share from that. Again, there's a video presentation I've given about that many years ago, probably when I was still a PhD student. I'll link to that somewhere uh, around this area. Now, another side effect of that rapid, rapid prototyping background is when you're building something playable every single night and it's digital, you start to find all these little tricks where basically you can cut a lot of corners if you know that you're keeping it all in your head, it's not supposed to be reused, re it's not supposed to be robust, well-engineered, well-architected. And so actually where my little silver YouTube play button come for, comes from here for 100,000 subscribers, I think 10 million views by this point or whatever, is basically some viral videos where I was just essentially doing a speed coding demonstration, cutting all the corners possible to show in as few lines of code as possible how to get a result on screen for some classic looking retro games. But it's a case where it excites people. It's a kind of a spectacle component to it. It's not really, I think, the best angle for doing. It's why I've moved away from this video on my channel. But it's a thing where I've been able to gain a bunch of my online students came from. I put on that kind of thing as a performance. I got 100,000 students out of there who went and took my online courses. And so even though my objective is not primarily to show off, it's to help educate and teach and train people. It helped me then access a bunch of audience without having to pay for it. I didn't pay for any ad or promotion on that. That was purely from that skill in rapid prototyping has other skills and uses in the market besides even just the internal experimentation, even if that's the usual form that it takes. Now, as mentioned earlier on Medal of Honor Airborne team, I did lots of internal rapid prototyping that include also for the weapons upgrade system authoring that includes some things about the map design, our quest design, how we were doing those different things. Uh, and that was a team where I was involved in the pre-production, middle production, then post-release that was skipping between school years there before I came in full time. But I also was on the Boom Blocks team. That's a game that wound up at the Smithsonian. Uh, Steven Spielberg worked on it. And that was a Wii game that sort of picture like a 3D Angry Birds. But for that, I was also a technical game designer and did lots of rapid prototyping internally. In that case, for mechanics, for how our AI worked, for our development of our internal level design tool, different from the version that shipped on the Wii, 
for involvement a bit indirectly with, I was not mainly a writer, but a bit with how our narrative framing makes sense to contextualize affordances for player and stuff. And that was a great use case where unlike Metal Honor Airborne, which was a deeply established FPS game genre with lots of kind of other examples to competitively analysis look at how are other World War II FPS games doing things. In the case of Boombox, we were in a lot of weird territory of different style, different conventions, different mechanics, different possibilities. How do we not overwhelm the players, but how do we still identify within that grammars we could use as a design team to coordinate, to create patterns that make sense, to chunk that information. So I've got more on that I'll be sharing as well. But that's another reason why, again, in my AAA space, there's still room for this stuff. It's not just for small teams, scrappy indies or solo small entrepreneurs or whatever. It very much has a place in bigger team structures where when we did those kind of decisions about, okay, Chris, get this working by lunch so we can figure out if this is worth spending time on correctly. Think about, just imagine how much money gets wasted if instead of having someone rapid prototype internally in a throwaway way, let's get this working on device to see if this is worth doing. They instead sink those three weeks into it, doing it in a really robust, well-architected, correct at scale performant on target hardware way, and then realize, you know what, we don't really like this feature, we're going to scrap it. And that happens all the time, and it's a huge cost to the companies, they'd rather save that money. And when you have an argument to save a company money, it appeals to companies. Another story from my rapid prototyping background is that my launch title for iPhone, a game called Topple, published through a company called NG Moco. That was a byproduct of sort of a branching approach to rapid prototyping. That was where the way I built that system was we had sort of a really rough core idea to start from. It was basically balancing stuff with the accelerometers. But at each stage of it, I took my design that I had and I forked it two or three different ways with, okay, here's some very different ways we might try doing things. I then put it in front of, in this case, the publisher, my collaborator on the team, John Nesky, to figure out, okay, out of these, which one do we want to branch off of next? They'd look at A, B, and C. They'd say B. And then from B, I would fork it two or three more times in wildly different ways and say, okay, well, here's two different, or three different, wildly different ways to score it, mechanically tune it. Which of these are you feeling better? And this is a space where, again, we were in new hardware with new affordances. People had not yet been using multi-touch and accelerometers. Smartphone games were still a relatively new phenomenon. The app store was new. But what it enabled us to do was we didn't yet have, again, competitive analysis, the ability to scrape a bunch of other, how are other games like this doing this? There weren't other games like this yet, or certainly not many aside from maybe like isolated, kind of sort of one mini game puzzle in a WarioWare game for, anyway, you got the idea, right? Not a big pattern of things established like in MOBAs or like in extraction shooters or something. And so it was a case we were able to design in a new novel domain. And why this is so important to us is that often these opportunities that are most ripe in the market. It's why it helped me to be the early iPhone launch title. If it's new to a VR platform, if it's new on a handheld console, if it's new on some new format for mixed reality or something, you can get an advantage. But one of the things you have to compensate for is you don't have a lot of other prior art to be basing it on. And again, rapid prototyping can equip you in a much better aggressive timeline than anybody else to get to a better result faster through things you can't possibly predict until you try it. And this also goes back to one of the philosophies of prototyping is that while it's worth having a theory about what we're trying to test and we're trying to get out of it, what we expect from it, recognizing that in many cases, our heads are bad emulators. We can't truly predict how it's going to come out until we try it on device, on controller, on target hardware, or even in a multiplayer game on paper with card and dice and other people, there's psychological factors, there's perceptual factors, there's cognitive things going on that are so squishy and fast and at a different scale than how we typically interpret reality around us. You just got to get it working to find out. And again, so rapid prototyping, another way you can have it work at a high level for end results isn't just on the core idea to start from. It's not just to justify where time energy is well spent in a big company. It can also be on within an idea, an experimental emergent way of developing it that in some ways is a little bit like not exactly but a little bit like the way early Minecraft emerged from its response to subreddit community where the creator would try some stuff and then uh, get immediate feedback listening to the players in that subreddit about where to kind of fork and branch it in next. And then lastly, for my prototyping background, this is something I'm proud of, but literally can't say a lot about. I also did a summer of rapid prototyping for Will Wright, creator best known for things like The Sims and SimCity. Uh, in that case, it is the most strict NDA I am associated with. So I really can never really say anything about what I worked on, how those projects worked or looked. That said, that was also a key part in what ended up getting me on the very first Forbes 30 under 30 list back in 2011 or so, maybe early 2012, whatever it was. Rapid prototyping, there was an additional lens that I even kind of further went down the rabbit hole of. And so I'm trying to distill as best I can some principles from that kind of practice. And again, we'll talk about the concrete examples from those projects. But it is things where working with other rapid prototypers was a real treat. Uh, there's a lot of things to enjoy about that. And I want to kind of pass along some of that here through this course experience.
Now, all this said, my main source for a lot of what I'm teaching is me and my career and things I've built and projects I've done. And this is not because I think I am the only or the best source of this information in the world. It's because those are the ones I'm best able to speak to. Those are the ones I best clarify, understand, not misinterpret or get wrong. There are absolutely many other exceptional sources out there for about prototyping practices from a whole different lens, a whole different angle. I am just not as well equipped to speak to those as other people are, but I want to acknowledge Again, it's not that I'm somehow denying the validity of other approaches or saying mine's the only way. It's to say my way is the way I know how to equip you with. So that's what I'm going to focus my time and energy on here. And I'll include there as a note about, again, my own biases, my own findings, is I tend to be a little bit lighter on design documentation than some other game designers are. Some are all about writing a big des game design document. There's pros and cons to that, especially if you're in a team structure and you want to be at a big AAA company. Certainly, and again, just going back to now as enough years ago, I can think I can safely say this. Before we would prototype something internally, we still have to kind of write a document to make a case to the other designers, to the lead designer, to the producer, this is worth even prototyping, right? We don't just want to try stuff. That's not a response to use of company resources. So a bit of design documents helpful, but again, I'm going to keep that pretty minimal. Got to keep it pretty form, uh, really orienting towards the main work of discovery isn't in how we talk about it. It is our building and experience and testing of it. And that's because I've seen too many cases where there's a really clever seeming document, a really clever seeming idea when it's talked about that when it's actually on device, falls on its face. And it might be its execution. It might be because of the particular way that the person doing it was doing it. But what we're really evaluating, right, isn't some abstract philosophical idea of something that's possible. We're evaluating what's the version of this I'm capable of making? What's the version of this that me and my team can actually pull off from our strengths, backgrounds, tools, and so on? And so it becomes essential to figure out where does it rubber meet the road? How does this actually work on device? So again, we're going to still have a bit of articulation up front. That's an important part, I think, of the process of a designer's work of our documentation, but the emphasis is going to be less on proving it out with a big doc than a doc basically being to establish a basic theory to then prove it out by doing something with it. Just two more quick notes about me as the instructor or the class general kind of philosophy here, and then we'll get to our first suggested assignment. Now, first of all, I'm extremely anti-crunch, uh, and I, I want to put this forefront in part because rapid prototyping could sound like crunch could sound like rush, right? It could sound like stay up late. It could sound like just get it done immediately. And it super isn't the idea. And like I mentioned earlier, it's you're supposed to pace yourself. You're supposed to try a thing in a lightweight, non-heavy, non-time intensive way. Take some distance from it. Reevaluate it a couple days later. You have to pace yourself for this to work well. If you burn yourself up too fast, trying to go at full throttle, sprint, 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 sprint all the time, you're going to tear yourself up. And on a longer arc of a career, and I've seen this happen to too many people in the game industry, and it's why I'm giving a genuine heartfelt plea. I've known a lot of people who seemed like they were kind of thriving or on fire and then burned out so quickly. I'm talking years later, I never saw them again. And meanwhile, me and some other people have been around for 25 years making games or something. If you want people to have the version of work you do after you have a lot of experience, you have to figure out it's a marathon, not a sprint. You got to pace yourself. You got to understand a mature way to manage your own time. And so just a disclaimer there, I'm very anti-crunch. Again, this is not meant to suggest you should work fast or if you're ever a produ producer working with digital uh, or other kind of rapid prototypers to expect them to be able to crunch, you know, fast, 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 fast. It's very much a selective, it's clever, it's being resourceful. It's about what corners can I cut so I'm not pushing myself too hard. If you're pushing yourself too hard, you're doing it wrong, ease up on it. Or, you know, the screw's gonna shake loose. Anyway, that's, that's my appeal there. Very anti-crunch. This is not a pro stay up with Red Bull kind of suggested class. This is very much a design course, articulate your ideas, document your process, be able to talk about them, build something as part of our thinking process, but recognize you're not shipping a polished product for the end customer or anything. You're not trying to meet any demands aside from informing where's energy best spent. And when you see it from that lens, you realize the amount of work you have to do may be less, right? It isn't necessarily more. There's ways to do it minimizing the energy you're exerting to test out the ideas to make sure you're not misusing your time or energy and resources. And the last note again about me as an instructor, and this is, I alluded to this earlier, but uh, I'm not a strong proponent of for the kinds of things that I teach. I don't think that lecture is the best way that they come across. I don't think it's as if you have a bucket and I can just talk into it and say things, and then you'll know what you need to know to go do things. Again, like I mentioned, I'm looking at it like a woodshop class where I'm going to try to point you in the right direction. I'm going to try to give you some values. The foundation is going to try to give you a useful tool or filter or concept, but most of the time really should be spent on do stuff. 
And if you have an instructor, if you're in home team, if you're in some situation where you can talk to me, I'll work with you. But I can't again offer it to everybody following this course. If you're going through a course with this, if you're going through a gr this with a group of kind of like a, a reading club, but instead you're going through this course sequence together, take that time to talk about your ideas together. But it is something that it's talking about it with your peers more so than what I'm saying to you. It's your experience that you're guiding based on your interest. And again, it might be more card games, might be more real time interactive, digital might be on a phone. It might be, I don't know, however, it might be more verbal games or sports games or something. It's open to what you want to do with it. But this is something that also I find is heavily backed up by old quotes by Bertrand Russell, by Henry David Thoreau, and a belief that the main power of a lecture is getting people together and giving them a thing to talk about, right? Getting a whole generation of new chemists or writers or something together in a room virtually, as the case may be, if you have collaborators elsewhere, and a thing to talk about. And that's why, again, I want to encourage, even if you are doing this from home, self-paced, consider reaching out to somebody you can connect with on Zoom, on Discord, on, on whatever service you have other links to, LinkedIn, to figure out, hey, would you be up for doing this? When it gives them an excuse, a pass to say, here's a cool thing, let's do it together. Be a fun chance to interact. And you know, I think you're going to get more out of it. Another version, again, that people talk about is that the really the, the experience you're getting is as much learning from your peers. And that's not just because of what they're telling you. It's also because of what you're telling them. Right. And this is one of the downsides to if part of your interactions are so heavily if for specific to my field. I can't speak to how this applies to math and other kinds of learning and history and so on. But that if you're primarily talking to someone much more experienced about it, say me, as an example, part of what can wind up happening is that you may hold back on speaking about your realizations and discoveries from feeling like, well, Chris doesn't need to hear that. Chris probably already knows this or, you know, I'm not going to feel like I'm teaching Chris about it. When you have peers, it is absolutely an essential part of what's going on is that information is going both directions. It's something where you're able to speak to what you're doing. They're able to speak to what they're doing. You're able to see it kind of as peers. And some benefits that happen there is that we start to figure out we can see flaws or imperfections or wincing about decisions someone else made that are at our level much easier than we can if someone is much more experienced than us and that our ability to see it in someone else helps us reduce doing it in our own way we just don't see it in our own work we're too close to it and then lastly again when we make a point to somebody else we internalize it much differently for ourselves and i think it's going to happen much more from your peer communication so even if you're in a situation where you have access to a world-class one-on-one mentor who wants to teach you about digital game prototyping i would still encourage there's value in find at least one peer if you can if you can't you're still going to find this worthwhile. You're still going to learn things from it. You can apply to rapid prototyping. But I think peers can be a helpful part. There's my other plea. Now, with some optional viewing I want to throw in here before we get to the exercise. Interaction Artist Series, again, was my binge daily of nightly prototypes. And that was outside of I worked overtime at a startup. This was not like the only thing I was doing. But I was just cranking those out, putting those online. I gave a presentation for research many years ago where I kind of grouped and chunked those into findings. And I think it's a good example or illustration of what kind of level of fidelity were those? Because I think it's going to help you lower your bar for when you're picturing a prototype. Some people that picture like the alpha version of a AAA game, or they might picture something that still looks like a finished product, but is much simpler or more basic. I think it's going to help establish a baseline. So again, it's just recommended reading type of thing, but it's a video that I've already prepared from years ago about rapid prototyping. If you check it out, I think it's going to give you some useful ideas going forward about the scale of work, which is suitable. When we say we're trying to have one prototype a week, we're talking about the kind of things that I was doing in Interaction Artist, whether they're digital or non-digital. They do not need to be a complete holistic game or product. They can be kind of a piece, as long as that piece is enough to be testable about, is this worth spending more time and energy on? The prototype exercise for today is that uh, what I want you to do today, and this is not, you know, kind of partly as an exercise to realize that this is hard, and this is not always an obvious given that it's possible. But I want you to think backwards about a product a game, an experience that you like. It could be a physical board game. It could be a digital game, whatever you choose. It could be a physical run around the recess kind of game. And to think backwards, what's a kind of prototype that you could build that could have led to it? Does that make sense? So like, let's say you just to pick a popular canon example, Monopoly. You like Monopoly. And there's some interesting history about Monopoly, and it's actually supposed to be critical of landlords and the mechanics that the game is actually kind of celebrated for taken from the original owner. Anyway, it's a whole story for another day. I'm not here to teach history. But let's say you just figured out, okay, well, there's something about the board size, the dimensions, how many tiles, what are the probabilities of landing on things? I could test that. What about how much should certain buildings be worth when they're upgraded? Well, it's a little harder to figure out how to test that sort of an isolation, but I could do it. So again, that's your fallback. Better than that, though, don't pick Monopoly. Pick another game you can work backwards from, digital, analog, whatever. 
a way you can prototype it. And again, the assignment between now and next time, which ultimately I'm going to be looking at in the sense of your documentation, your process. So take photos, make notes about your thought process, how you pivot and change, how you get to your results and why. But is to actually build the thing, right? So let's say if instead of a non-digital game, you look at, I don't know, you probably starting with a low hanging fruit, you like some retro game, Space Invaders? And you're trying to feel out how many ships should there be at the top of the screen. Well, it would be nice for you to make a little cheap, simple prototype, knowing full well it's a prototype, copy a tutorial off YouTube, find example code on the internet. You just need a starting point. Do it in, in whatever tool as fast as easy as you do something that's kind of like Space Invaders, but set it up in a way you can very easily change perhaps one variable in the code or one thing in the interface to adjust how many rows there are. So you could try playing the game with one row, five rows, two rows, 10 rows. So you could test it with someone else or with yourself, a teammate to say, is this too many? Is this not enough? Why do we like and dislike these different ones? Right? You got the idea. So anyway, that's the exercise I will suggest now next time. Uh, and I even want to encourage if you want to go, no, you know, I'm going to hold off on some of these others. Um, the others will save for later exercises to suggest. And again, I want to stress that another thing you're kind of prototyping today is just kind of wading into this is feeling out. How are you documenting it? How, what are you taking photos of? What are you making notes of? And if you have peers who are doing this with you, discuss it with each other of like, how are you documenting this? What are you making notes of? What did you write down? What was helpful to you? Because I think that their answers are going to be more insightful than what I can tell you about how to document it. So thinking about that in a way that might be, if nothing else for your internal documentation, you're comfortable with someday, perhaps finding its way online as a public portfolio site or a public document, but at minimum, just for your own internal sense of 15 weeks from now, looking back on this project, how or why did you make this prototype the way that you did? Anyway, that's it for video one. Thanks for following along. I hope it's been helpful. I would encourage you, hopefully, to check out video two. Uh, again, notwithstanding, if you have an instructor who is using this like a textbook and telling you skip to three, four, five, seven, whatever, that's it for now. Thanks for following along. I uh, hope this has been helpful to you as a start. And again, most of the videos are not going to be this long because most of the videos are probably just kind of try to set you up, point in the direction, and then the emphasis is going to be on the work, the building of it, and discussing it with your peers. But I hope this is helpful to you, and I'll see you next time. Welcome to the first video after the introduction for my online rapid prototyping course here being suggested, obviously a free series of videos. Now, because it's the start of a new section, I want to make a couple notes. One, again, most of these videos are going to be shorter than that first introduction. That was very much kind of a setup. I figure out, are you in the right place? Because if you're not, obviously you're free to do other things. But I want to make that clear up front with that first video was a little more lecture. Increasingly, we're going to try to move towards shifting the ratio of me talking to what you are doing on your side. We're going to provide some setup, some ideas, but ultimately it's going to be more so kind of work time between periods, between videos, and that up front just had a lot of things to explain. That's also going to affect today a little bit because today is a general practices for prototyping course. Uh, we're trying to really cover at a high level some ideas that will, I think, behoove you throughout the rest of this for all the other sections. So whether we're talking about real-time digital, we're talking about analog, whether we're talking about digital hardware, alt control hacking, whatever, all these kind of things are still going to be applicable to the kind of concepts we're talking about today. So I want to try to lay a foundation. So again, there might be more talking today. But I want to be clear about that as an expectation. So as a quick overview, what's going to be covered in this kind of introductory quarter or section, right? Just videos two, three, and four in my sequence here. Uh, prototyping general practices is what I'm talking about today in this video, whether you watch the next one tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now, whatever makes sense for you and or hopefully your peers pace at doing this. Uh, as well as then we'll be talking next about digital hardware alt control interface prototyping. It's a fun, exciting kind of workshoppy activity. And that's one where it might involve finding, acquiring, customizing some hardware, or if not, then just repurposing, reusing in a different way, hardware you already have, which could include a smartphone, could include a laptop, could include controllers, mice, keyboards, VR gear, you name it. There's ways to adapt what we have. So we'll talk about next time. And then real-time rapid design of mechanical rules will be the discussion at the end of this section. And that really, it's a big way of saying real-time interactive stuff. Video games cover a lot of this, the kind of games I work on that are real-time arcadey. Uh, it comes from my pinball background, but it also applies to physical games that are non-digital, such as Hungry Hungry Hippos, Crossfire, some other classics, pinball again. And uh, that's really kind of setting up here a bit of a digital upfront before we then going to move heavily into analog in the section after this in what I might call quarter two, section two or so on. So without further ado, let's peek here into our prototyping general practices. So one of the things I want to lead with here is talking about the Cerny method and Mark Cerny uh, long ago in the industry making games like Marble Madness when he was way younger and then I think may have worked in Japan on possibly on some Sonic games. I could be getting wrong with that. Maybe Spyro. He's bounced around a lot anymore. He's now a pretty big deal at Sony on the PlayStation team. 
Mark Cerny has been around for a long time. And part of what kind of helped the whole industry move forward was he's also a person who worked in Japan, in the U.S., and in Europe. And was able to cross-pollinate some ideas of what was working in different teams, different studios, different corporate cultures, different national cultures. There was attitudes about work. And he embodied those in a talk that he, thankfully, kind of gave away to the public in back in 2002. I think it was GDC DICE. There might have also been a GDC Europe. But there's a great, thankfully, there's a video of that and the slides are online. So that's going to be a recommended watch after today, recommended reading, if you will, is to check out the video. If nothing else, read those slides. You will find some absolute gold nuggets in there. Now, some things about the Cerny Method at a high level I want to focus on is that it would basically came along at a time in 2002, development was still way more expensive and complicated than it is today. And so if we look at a gradient in the modern day, you can very much you know, game jams are possible now in a way that they were just starting to be possible around the year 2000. Because if we go further back, right, instead of 20 years behind, if we go back 40 years behind. I mean, when they made an arcade cabinet, you know, somebody had to figure out a whole lot to even start to prototype it before they figured out that this is worth spending our energy and time and resources on because it would take a team, not just of Toru Rutani as the lead, but a whole team of maybe a dozen engineers a year to produce Pac-Man because of how bad the hardware was. So this came from a context where even for big companies, it was not a good way to prototype. And so you'll see in there in that context, part of the methodology that Mark Cerny talks about, and he just calls it the method. We call it Cerny method for short because it designates this one for Mark Cerny. But he talks about the importance of getting it working as fast and as cheaply as you possibly can to test, is this worth moving? So you can see why I'm bringing this up in a rapid prototyping case because he's figuring out what tools do we have at our disposal? This might be building on last year's engine. This might be building on an old version of the hardware. It might be modifying your previous project to test some ideas. It's something where you can figure out that this next day is worth exploring because I tried it with a base that I may not use at all. And you'll literally see in there, one of the things he recommends in his approach as part of what we call Cerny method is develop it on a tool or platform entirely different from your final result right? That your final result is going to need to be performant on perhaps console hardware, on a mobile phone and VR headset or something. Well, first, can you prototype it in a way that is just unshippably inefficient, hacky, bad? Now, increasingly, one of the things that's happened, and this is going to be a distinction of the past two decades, some things have changed, is tools like Unity, Godot or Godot, Unreal, Game Maker, C++ and SDL, other kind of environments and platforms you might find out there, have been used digitally to both prototype things or you'd be used in game jams and produce commercial viable products. In those cases, there's sort of a certain maneuver going on that I'm acknowledge is a little different than what Mark Cerny is talking about. Since again, he was looking at a case where you could prototype in kind of early crude flash. And then that was not how you were going to ship your game on at the time, PlayStation two or something. And so instead what ends up happening is that our approach is very different. The same tool has the granularity for you can work in it in a very slapdash, simple, bare bones, minimum work, minimum clicks, minimum effort, minimum custom scripts to get your result. But recognizing that between that prototype, which is first playable on the screen and a later someday shippable project will be significant amount of rework and redoing it. And so we kind of wind up having these kind of projects. That I th- it's all like the ship of Theseus, right? If you're familiar with that parable from old philosophy or old to old uh, oral history, where if you replace every single piece of the boat, it's the same boat. Often what you end up happening happen is that someone does a game jam, a student prototype, a hacky thing to demonstrate to the team. And then eventually a version of the game ships. But along the way, the version that that became shippable, the reason why it took a weekend to get kind of working and then took maybe another two years to get shipped on platform as a commercial product was that they had to replace everything. Had to rewrite the audio code, the sound code, the performance, the mechanics, everything about it. The systems had to be better generalized to expand, to be more robust against testing and all kinds of other stuff had to happen for faster loading and you name it. All that work is valid and real, but the reason I like that distinction is because it becomes clear that even when you have one of these tools like Unity or one of these other platforms, modern engines, in which you can prototype, but you can also make shipped projects, that there is a correct way to use that engine to make a commercially shipped project. And there's a correct way to use it to rapid prototype. And they are very different. They are wildly different. You cannot rapid prototype with practices that are appropriate for a huge team on a long timeline with a big budget and full time. Not going to work and vice versa, right? If your strategies come from rapid prototyping domain to recognize the limits of I knew when I was doing rapid prototyping for a big company, I was clear about none of this code I'm writing can ship. None of this, right? That's not that's not pretending like, oh, this is okay or this is fine. This is too messy. It's too fast. It's too undocumented. It's too gnarly. No one else may be able to look at it and make sense out of it but it works. 
just for us to size up as a work, making it work better. And knowing that distinction, knowing that's a different thing happening to recognize that there's a three week answer and there's a three hour answer is helpful to really unblock you to realize you don't even need to be fiddling around pretending like when I'm prototyping, I'm also going to make the version that's going to ship on PlayStation. You don't need to fool yourself into thinking that I need to spend time to really architect and engineer or do my art pipeline in a good way that I can build on. Because again, slow down. The function of prototyping, as Mark Sherry talks about in the method, is partly to realize, is this worth taking forward? Is this worth green lighting? And if it's not, then don't. And this is where when they talk about the, some people talk about a vertical slice, what he's really talking about in this kind of context for the Cerny method is figuring out until I can get one piece and it might be maybe the middle level of a game, might not even be the whole level, might be a chunk of a middle level as a good representation. It's not the tutorial. It's not your final boss climax. It's just kind of somewhere else in the middle. Until I can get that right, then it's a waste of time to do what's called go wide on produce the whole rest of it in parallel or to just accelerate forward on what it is. It's to keep tweaking and experimenting it while it's in that prototype form. Does that make sense? Because you want to try to test your ideas. That's the whole function thing. It's not just a test. Is this idea good? It's to be able to work on it like clay, to thrash on it, to tear on it, to rip out pieces, to clobber it and Frankenstein it back together to figure out, okay, well, now we found a direction that people are actually responding well to. People actually like when we test it with them. It makes sense. People can understand it. That's got legs. We need to move forward on it because what used to happen right before this point, companies would just go straight into production. They would just go, they'd figure out, okay, we got this approved. We got a budget for it. We got a publisher to fund it or something. They would spend years on a product and they would make the best version of the product they could before they found out it was the wrong product to make. And that's the pain we are trying to avoid for ourselves, for our teammates when we are rapid prototyping. So the Cerny method, it's got, you know, you don't, you don't need me to repeat his entire talk to you again. That's my recommended reading. I'll put a link to it in the probably description or wherever else makes sense for a platform this video is on. Go watch that. Go look at those slides. Learn from Mark. He is smarter about these things, certainly than I am. And uh, it is just so essential to not misuse our time. But he's got so many great nuggets in there, including, again, more than I'm going to try to fit into today. I can point you to it. You don't need to repeat it to you. Now, I alluded to it in there, but one of the things that also makes prototyping so helpful is this ability to kind of externalize our thinking process to figure out how other people are responding to it. And this is a tough one for some people to get over. And it was tough for me to get over where I thought, you know, I'm I'm the game designer. I've spent a lot of years figuring out how to build this stuff and figure out the design strategies and principles and studying and reading about it and analyzing examples in the competitive market and so on. Well, and it just didn't make sense to me. If I'm going to test it with people who they haven't gone through that work, what are they going to tell me about it? And I misunderstood the point of that kind of testing and feedback. It's a form of what they can offer. And this is, by the way, to be clear, this is not about like full-time QA, professional rigorous testing. That is also a valid, substantial career, track, job, and so on. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just purely a finding a friend who hasn't seen it yet to see if they're willing to try it. Maybe in exchange for you, get them a drink or a Coke or something. It's a case where they can give it fresh eyes in a way you can't. You are incapable from having worked on the thing to be able to tell, can they understand this? Does it make sense to them? Right? Because what happens is we're picturing how it's supposed to work. We're picturing what effect it's supposed to have. We picture what's happening under the hood if we're doing programming. Even if we're doing non-digital stuff, we still have a sense for how we think it's going to be played, which may not be how actual other people immediately realize there's a different way to play this that might be advantageous or more fun for them. And so it's an activity of listening and it's not inauthentic. It's not handing over the keys to your design. You can still, we'll talk a bit about a little today, uh, critique as this important staple. Every few weeks, are going to build in peer critique of one of your prototypes you want to forefront and talk to your classmates about the process, your result of, and how you got there, which changed. Part of that critique process is realizing you can listen to feedback, you can gather feedback, you can hear them out, you can respect, you can be not defensive of it, and not act on it, right? You're still in control. It's still up to you. They're still not your boss. They're still not telling you exactly what to do. They're saying, hey, you know, this this bugged me. You can decide what you want to do with that. But prototyping enables us to iteratively get that kind of feedback sooner rather than later. And this is one of these deals where part of why it's the rap prototyping is so helpful, either internally and in not just validating which branches are worth going forward, but also trying to identify within a bigger process, sooner rather than later, where are the pain points so we can address them? This is the thing where you'll often hear people who are strong advocates for human computer interaction, HCI research, or or testing, and especially if you've got a whole studio with real QA, full-time actual workers who are rigorously testing stuff, et cetera. 
they'll try to encourage the sooner we get into the testing pipeline, the better. And this can be tough because sometimes from an engineering standpoint or from an even board game designer standpoint, we feel like, well, the art's not there. It's not showable yet. I can't get it there. You know, it's not showable until most of the way through. And all that means is we don't have as much lead time to try some things to head off sooner rather than later. What's going to get us into trouble? And so we want to try to build things in a way that you can test them sooner rather than later. And we talk about prototypes. It's the reason why last time I talked about really kind of isolating a single particular example of a piece of some end product that you like that could be prototyped. Prototype often isn't the entire thing necessarily. Now, at some point, you might string them all together into a prototype of an entire game, but you can meaningfully prototype the dialogue system. You can meaningfully prototype how there's a relationship between the cards and dice. You can meaningfully prototype the dimensions of space in a block falling game different from many of the other systems, separate from most of the other systems. And so when we're prototyping, part of what we're trying to figure out is what is it we're trying to answer? What is it that this project is trying to answer? And if it's not what it's trying to answer, then we want to spend as little time as possible on that side to it to ensure our energy is efficiently spent on this thing which only exists to help us ensure our energy is efficiently spent. So in that Cerny Method example, he talks about camera control, camera character and control, right? It's like, how is the camera interacting to the space, the pan, the movement? How is our character moving? How do we, how's our input mapped to the movement? He talks about these being core to game feel in a digital 3D real-time spatial kind of game. I guess also 2D as well. But you're going to have different things that we're testing it in an analog space. Figure out what is the thing we're testing and not even just think about what system I'm testing, but what about that system am I trying to get an answer for? And this is an example of the kind of things we want to help make sure we're capturing our documentation. I'm not just testing my prototype. There's a question I'm trying to answer. And there's a reason why I built this prototype the way that I did, thinking that this was a pretty efficient way that I would get good information to base an outcome on. And that's also so valuable internally too. When you have a team of other talented, smart people, collaborators, teammates, a whole company, a whole studio, somebody else who's maybe an investor kind of offsite, has control of the strings, but also uh, you know writes the checks, but also isn't a designer or whatever, is that sort of testing, that feedback, that iteration internally enables you to help build a stronger case for, okay, well, you know, we tested this with several people and someone told us that uh, this one made more sense to them. So we tried it more. We figured out that this is overwhelmingly the winning result when we tested it. That's great material to take with you to make a case to teammates. So again, they have their own opinions. That might be different than yours. But it says, well, we did some testing. We found this is what people are responding well to who are actual kind of people we're trying to test it with. That goes a long way. And again, especially if you've got investors, they're trying to figure out why are you doing one thing or another? They want a case made. It's not enough to have a good idea. It's not enough to be smart or even have sound principles you can explain to another designer. If you need to build a case to someone who is not shares your hat in the workplace, it's going to be essential to be able to show, well, we've checked it with actual players. And this is obviously where at a bigger company they were about NDAs and stuff in a small company, indie, solo, whatever. You're often just classmates in a school program, friends in an online discord, people that you trust to not go make a big thing about this looked ugly because they know it's early, but helping me explain this is ugly. Testing a specific thing. Can I get a few minutes of your attention? I would really appreciate it. Help me out. Now, two things that I also think about when it comes to rapid prototyping and kind of testing with people, which could again just be internally. We think sometimes about a concentric circle of testing in a way that is equally applicable for rapid prototyping is there's first there's ourselves. Inevitably, if we're working on something, we're testing it ourselves. And then take that kind of onion layer out. Then there's kind of maybe teammates who are also working on it. They also have some context, some expectation, but they are not you. They're not inside your head. A layer out that might be something where, so in the case of home team, uh, my online groups that I train, I have three different communities and there might be people who are on a different team, but they can still kind of offer insights as people who also share a developer lens, but are not truly the general public either. And then somewhere in there for some people else becomes their friends and family testing. That's where, okay, you're not a teammate. You didn't work on this project, but I respect you. You trust me. You can say something frank to me that I will understand is you having my best interest at heart. I won't be offended. I won't feel alienated. I won't feel attacked. But also you'll surface it to me because you know you can say that and know that I'll respect your opinion and input. And that's where again friends and family. And that's where you start to then build out. You, you don't go straight to testing with strangers in part because the kind of feedback you might get is so far from useful to you. You don't trust it. You don't have the basis. You don't have that established rapport for them to see something so ugly, so crude to give you helpful feedback. So we're talking more about testing stuff, but when we build this concentric circle, part of that also does in a way that I think is worth respecting in its own right is so, so much of what I've loved about making games in my life is how much when you build something with other people, you get to know them better, right? And you're collaborating, you have each other's backs, you're helping each other together create something that individually, if you're off isolated, would not have been as good. 
And even if you're a solo developer off kind of mostly doing the solopreneur stuff somehow sometime, if you were engaging others in testing, you clearly are again benefiting from perspectives and insights beyond even if you're the one who's making models or writing code or designing board game decisions and choices, it becomes bigger than yourself. It helps you understand your players better, the people you're trying to serve. It helps you be able to listen to what they're providing for input. It helps them understand you better. It makes them more likely to be advocates. If they test something, gosh, the people who are sometimes the loudest advocates are the people who got to test it and they are proud to be have been a part of it happening the way that it did. And again, to distinguish, I'm not talking about QA, which is full-time paid work, whole career. This is just purely a people who are willing to like check it out for you'll get pizza together after. The kind of stuff you tend to see when it's very much rough prototype, rapid prototype, internal, and then those concentric circles we start thinking about. If they're outsiders, and if it's a substantial ask of their time beyond, can I get your thoughts? You might need to pay for the time and stuff. That's a different thing than the kind of testing I'm talking about in these kind of cases for a prototype. It also helps ensure that we're getting practice out of humility, which is an important challenge for designers because, again, we're here because we care. We have a lens on how things ought to be. We have certain philosophies for the things that we're doing or we wouldn't be doing it. But recognizing that there needs to be a Venn diagram overlap between the things that we see as right to do that also makes sense to our audience we're trying to serve, which is ultimately going to be people who aren't exactly us. And this is where, again, prototyping helps us inform that process so that we can recognize the limitations of our own imagination to figure out what's going to happen ahead of time, how are people going to respond to it, what will they understand, what will confuse them. And rather than try to sit there and just think harder about it, we're getting some real actionable data about why one path forward as opposed to another, or that this is the right thing to be doubling down our energy and attention on. A lot of what it's going to be applicable across all your prototyping craft, whether it is digital or analog, is building it worse, getting hacky, getting comfortable with bad code, now, obviously up to a point. And this is where part of what I kind of find part of the thrill of rapid prototyping is really finding where the practical line is between hacky enough to get a speed benefit, but not so hacky it's a speed detriment. I think it's an old Mario Andretti quote, right? If you if you're in full control of the car, you're not going fast enough. Rapid prototyping can feel a little bit like that. What can I get away with? And where is that line where, gosh, it comes back to bite me? You know, it was so rigid, it was so hard coded, that was an okay way to make it work technically. But the moment someone has an idea for how to change it, it's going to take a bunch of other work to refactor or change something or rethink my entire strategy or to reprint some cards or something. Okay, maybe it wasn't the best way for me to have done it. But we learn from that experience. We test, we touch the stove to burn our hands a little bit to figure out how rough can I make the art? How unorganized can I do my prototype? And there's more ways beyond the obvious of it saves you time on doing it that we'll talk a little more about one of the analog prototyping sections ahead that when you make something rougher, you're more likely to get honest critique because people don't see it and say, oh, it looks like you've already finished this. You put a lot of work into this. I don't want to give you too much feedback because it seems like you're already kind of done. They're much more comfortable ideating if it looks early, if it looks rough, if it looks kind of still like there's plenty of potential ahead that's undefined. It also avoids them reading too much into concrete details. And so here's the thing where, just as an example, some people, they'll be tempted to go out and grab a kit of pre-made models or resources or sounds or music or something. And I'll caution against that. And that's going to come up again, too, because this is an important point. And when I'm training people, I avoid us doing that because I would rather have you make your own really crummy looking visuals, your own really crummy looking filler text, your own really crummy looking whatever it is that you've got to do. It's better to make your own version for a couple of reasons. But one of those is because if it looks too good, if your model of your player looks really impressive and high fidelity, your lighting looks top notch atmospherics and fog effects and volumetric and all this kind of stuff. People won't give you as good a feedback because they feel like you're done with it. And or another way that this goes wrong is that they will focus too much on the visual and your assumption that, well, I don't know if I would make it this kind of alien. That was supposed to be a placeholder alien. They assumed it was done because you had a good model of it. And if it looked rough, if it was a box that says alien on it, then they're not going to critique the style of alien that you're representing. And not to put an unreasonable amount of pressure on it, but even just strategically, realistically, every minute, every hour, every day that you're spending on something that's the wrong thing to do, if you're doing it too well, you are putting more work into that box that's going to go straight into the trash. And so you want to be mindful of that's opportunity cost that you're not spending and putting towards a better choice of the project to be doing. We want to minimize how little can I do to be able to test this idea. And if I use markers, if I use pieces of paper I cut up with scissors, 
if I'm reusing action figures or something where it's obvious that these aren't custom action figures, it's going to help us get to our goal faster and easier, a clearer answer on where is energy best spent before we wind up hyper fixating on doing a really good job of the wrong thing. An example I still think about that is going to be a pretty dated example, but I think makes this more memorable is an old show I used to enjoy, Adventures of Pete and Pete. It's an episode called Inspector 34. And just at a high level, there's this perfectionist person who his job is to find imperfections and do everything perfectly. And so his family, the Pete's, challenge him to eat barbecue wings at a barbecue. And he does it without getting any barbecue sauce on himself because he's perfect, he's clean, he manages to get no barbecue anywhere. And the Pete's point out that that's doing it wrong, that it's supposed to be messy, right? You're supposed to get it on yourself and on your fingers and on your face. And if you don't, you're doing it wrong. And that same idea applies here of if your code is elegant, if your models look great, if your board game graphics are impressive, you are not doing it better, you are doing it worse, and you are doing it wrong. When I'm evaluating at the end of this time, if you're working with me, or if your instructor's evaluating, or if your peers are evaluating critique, look out for higher polish in the documentation, more better planning in the architecture is not better. It is a defect in energy not being well spent in a way of if I'm on someone else's time or budget, it's not a good use of those resources. If I'm on a team or even alone, it's taking away from better projects for me to spend the energy and time on to make sure we're doing it in the most efficient way possible. And so it's also why I have one of our general principles. We want to be applying the things that we can already do pretty well. When we look at a game jam, it's something that say is a distinct category from rapid prototyping. Some people use a game jam mostly to learn a new engine, mostly to try out. They've never used Love 2D. They've never used, you know, Construct or something. They're going to try it out there just to see. That's really not a great place for rapid prototyping. Now, you're by all means, learn new engines, try new stuff. That is separate, though, from the exercise of when you are rapid prototyping. Part of the efficiency isn't that you're also adding the overhead of learning how to do a new thing. That should be happening in some other very more intentional way. Then rapid prototype is going to be telling you, right, to use it messily, badly, scrappily, as we just discussed. And so I think more about it, it's almost like out of your skill sets. And again, if you've never done programming stuff, I've got a programming course, uh, introductory, it's free, codeyourfirstgame.com, that can cover some basics of JavaScript prototyping and web browser. They have plenty of resources in there to learn Unity or anything else you want to learn. But when you're starting a project to rapid prototype it, what I really encourage you to do is think about, and again, it's kind of another outdated media reference here, in Apollo 13, I think the CO2 filter, something broke in the craft, and so you got your NASA ground control people dumping out a bunch of trash on the table to say, here's what they have up in there. They have to work with these hoses and these parts to try to build a filtration system before they run out of air that they can breathe. And your rapid prototyping very much is, okay, well, out of me or my teammates, what strengths do we have? What tools are we familiar with? And if that's the one we're familiar with, then that's the right one for the rapid prototype. That's how we're going to do it. And it's also where a studio might look at what tools and tech do we already have internally. Then we're going to try to leverage those to the best of our ability because it's going to increase what's in striking range of testability and verifiability rather than being off in a theoretical space. If that may be a good project to do, but if we can't test it, then it's not a safe assumption because even though we're going to have theories about what we're trying to do, why we're trying to do it, those are going to be theories to test, not something we put a lot of faith in until we can really figure out this is working, this does feel good on device or when it's actually being played. I talk about using ugly custom placeholder where it's better to have your own pictures rather than a piece of kits. It also reminds me too of this Apollo 13 story in that when your kids building with Legos, and this probably seems a little more timeless in my, my shows that I choose to reference. If you dump out a bunch of Legos from a box and there's a, let's say a whole front of a pirate ship in the Legos, it's pre-molded and you use it, you're probably going to wind up making a pirate ship. Right. If there's a whole thing in there that's very obviously a car shell and you use it, you're going to wind up building stuff attached to that car. And it doesn't have the same original inflexibility as a worse looking model built out of Lego that's very boxy, but could be anything. Does that make sense? And so this is why the downside of I remember years ago, I helped a person make a dinosaur hunting time travel kind of experience. And. He had a certain kind of dinosaur he wanted to have. I think it was maybe a stegosaurus. He bought a pack of 3D models. This is before I was trying to knew better than to encourage people to not do that. He bought a 3D model pack. And it had some good, I don't know, Brontosaurus, Diplodonicus, uh, Velociraptor, T-Rex, whatever were in there. It did not have a stegosaurus. had a triceratops. 
And so we decided, well, I guess he's not going to have a stegosaurus after all. And to me, this feels like bad design or no cookie, right? If you have an idea that in your world, there should be a certain thing to interact with, a certain thing in the environment, a certain item power up feature, you do not want it to be a side effect of this happens to be what I had in my pile of resources. Another guy I worked with and I'm not going to name him because it was always a little more embarrassing, but I'm sure he laughed about it these days. We were just kind of reviewing projects he made before he worked on me. And there was a game he made where the objective was to save a bear trap. And I was like, buddy, friend, why are you saving a bear trap? And the answer was that was the one he had that matched like the camera perspective for the game he was doing, which once again, probably is not a great source of design principles or of practices. Instead, you want to figure out conceptually, what do you want to happen in this game? And to do that, it's going to be better if it looks rough, but it's recognizable. And recognizable is the goal. Can I tell that that's a switch? Does the affordance of that graphic tell me I can interact with it? Can I tell it that door can open? Can I tell that even as something as a board game, can I tell it those are the, the tiles I can land on? This is where the cards go. That's the level of fidelity we need. We don't want decoration beyond that unless, and we'll talk at the very end of all these video sections a bit about if you're literally testing the aesthetics, the visuals, the sound of something, of course you got to test that. That's a different axis than we don't want to tangle that up in the mess of someone has a visceral negative reaction to it because they find the colors are too dark. If they are getting that read on your prototype, then they're not seeing the thing you want them to see. And so you'd rather pick an art style that avoids them thinking about it from that angle. So instead they're looking at, is this something I enjoy doing? Does this make sense to me? Is what often you're trying to really test the rapid prototyping. Those other things have their different ways to test, different ways to prototype. You don't want to try to do both at once or it's going to conflate your results. Then old Thomas Edison quote, he says, there's a way to do it better, find it. And while there's things for it, that is the right lens for in rapid prototyping, I encourage to rearrange that a little bit to instead make there is a way better it to do, find it. Where our exercise becomes not in how to do a certain thing better in most cases, or again, unless we're kind of late stage of internal prototyping for branching iterations. And instead it becomes a broad search. And so this is also where when we are working on a new project, we don't want to wind up fine tuning on the wrong thing, making a better version of what's the wrong thing to be tuning at all. So when your first layer of prototyping, and this is part of why out of my different sections, what I'm trying to encourage, here's a different lens, here's a different lens, here's a different win, kind of window into what you might want to prototype or build next. They're kind of all over the place is intentional because I want you to try ideally recognizing, and respecting, you may pick, you, know, you mostly want to focus on card games or unity projects or something. I'd like you to look at a broad range of, even if you're doing card games, some wildly different card games, even if you're doing digital games, some wildly different digital games, to not assume you know what the right thing is to do too much. And again, you can have principles, you can have a reason why you're trying one thing or the other, but part of the reason can be because it's so far from that area. To go back to, I think an intro metaphor, I mentioned in the previous video, this big design space of potential things that can be built, you're throwing a dart at it with a rapid prototype and exploring what's over here, what's over there. And if it maybe helps to contextualize this in video game metaphor, for those of you who are thinking about this way, or pretty literal too, if you're looking for where there's resources, where there's Tiberium, where there's gold, where there's something worth mining, you don't want to scatter all your darts in one tight area. You want to start spreading them as far as you can. One over here, one way down there, one way down there, one way down there to start feeling out, okay, if I start to explore, this is a better place to explore. I have more reason to believe out of my broad search that there is more likely to be some activity picked up over here that's relevant to what I'm looking for. And so when your earliest prototyping phases, we're going to narrow down later to figure out some narrower bunches and then branching on those to test on those, to iterate on those. I want to encourage as much as you can scatter shot as wide as you can. And again, part of the reason for why I chose to do this approach is because it's so different from this other. I did a puzzle game. So that's why I'm also prototyping an action approach to it. I did something in VR. So I'm also trying something on a small screen. And one of the other things that can happen is that as we start doing more of these pieces, they become tools in our tool belt. They become kits on our table, we can still borrow pieces and parts from. We may find that when we have a broader spread of range of ideas, in one prototype, there's a thing about how the inventory was displayed. In one prototype, there's a thing about how turns were taken that I can then borrow a bit of this and a bit of that. And even if I mostly go with option C, which is neither of those, that they were not also close, increased what is on, quick on hand of recently fresh in my mind of an example we can reference collectively as a team or individually have recently worked on it. And so into those 219 daily prototypes, part of what was happening was a lot of momentum of the ones that wound up being good stake points for good traction and people responding well to it, were in many cases not the first version or the only idea that fed into it, but 
I kind of borrowed a piece of one and another idea from another and a third piece, kind of the look of that and smush those and Frankenstein those together. That can be part of this process, realizing that again, broad search is a great way to start and then to increasingly narrow down your search. You want to start broad intentionally and then increasingly narrow down that search. Now we're going to talk in more specifics when we get to actually doing it in terms of giving each other critique about ways to do that, best practices, things to try and knowing we might make some mistakes as we work our way through that. It's just the nature of learning is having room to make those kind of mistakes like prototyping. But I do want to acknowledge as part of talking general principles for prototyping, when we're giving and receiving it, remember it's part of our process as designers. And this is something that I remember seeing early in my career. I came from a software engineering background with a computer science major in undergrad before I went off to grad school and liberal arts in a design field. But it was something where I recognized in undergrad that the art students were getting more peer critique. That was part of their experience. And sometimes it'd be pretty harsh. And I'm not saying that it should be taken to that level or that extreme. But we had so little of that kind of critique happening in the engineering department and comp sci that when a lot of people went off to their first jobs and started getting code review, which is just a common programming practice where I, as a, if not even more senior, different programmer on the team offer some notes or suggestions or ideas about why is this done this way and have you considered doing it that way raises the quality of what we all do together from our shared perspective because we all have different experiences we're drawing upon. We all have different things that we see. And so even just articulating that the answer was, oh, here's why there was a reason for that. Okay, great. That's cool. But it was such a struggle for him to get through. And so again, this is even more the case in design where so often you're having to involve others. If you are primarily a designer, if you're having to integrate your work into what other people are doing, you're going to have to explain and justify a little bit why we're doing one thing or another. And so Critique is partly practice at hearing, interpreting, internalizing, processing, finding ways to distill it into what is actionable to address those concerns that may be different than the the suggestions people actually make on the moment, but realizing that that's a part of design work as much as designing the artifact itself or building a thing or documenting it is that critique. And so I think when I allude to there's kind of a few different categories of things that if I'm the one leading a group piece, and this is like a virtual textbook in home team or otherwise, one of the things I'm sort of grading or trying to keep an eye out for is In critique, are you being involved with it? Are you speaking up earnestly to try to help others? Are you not being overly defensive about your response? Are you receptive to listening to the viewpoints of others about your project? Do you seem to be growing from it in some way? Which could, again, doesn't mean that they're right and you're wrong. Doesn't mean you have to change or should change all the stuff that they say. But sometimes it's something as simple as realizing that when they say that there's a problem, it's because they perceive that there's a problem. And why do they perceive that there's a problem? It might be a clue about how you can communicate a little bit differently next time, how you can frame a little differently, how... Maybe actually it is a matter of a functional visual affordance of they didn't know you could collect that anywhere supposed to do that. And this is where we're getting back to when we figure out what is the minimum we can do that is testable. So we can start figuring out in the case of critiquing, just like we can from our playtesting feedback, as we start doing more of that, is the sort of thing we're realizing that, okay, well, just as much as there are certain corners I shouldn't cut in terms of naming my variables, or I shouldn't cut in terms of how I connect my art into my project in a way that I can do easily enough to adapt and change it is also recognizing that there's a functional lens for placeholder art is good and it should be ugly and you shouldn't spend any more time on it than you need to. But there is a certain level you do need to where if they can't tell that that's a switch, if they can't tell that that's a power up to collect, if they can't tell it's a bad guy to avoid, then the art hasn't served its functional need, not even its aesthetic need, its functional need. So in prototyping things, digital or analog, being cognizant of, can people tell this is a bad card? Is, Is there a clue here that this is a a negative thing about to happen. And that can be a functional consideration that again, critique can help surface for us where we realize, okay, what's well, a clue about where to best spend my energy going ahead and going forward. And that's so often we do testing, we do peer critique. It may sometimes be telling us what we already know, what we already were planning to do next. And that can get under our skin. It's happened to me when I was certainly when I was younger, especially. And having to realize that that's not a bad thing. That's not them annoying or disrespecting or thinking that you didn't know any better. It's confirming what you believed already. It's saying that, yeah, you're on track. Keep doing exactly what you had in mind. They're on the same, that people agree with you. You got alignment and it's encouraging us to say, okay, good, 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 right? I double checked. Am I going the direction? I, I heard yes, right? You can check on the map. Am I going the right direction and figure out I am? It's still good to check the map. That peace of mind is part of the process that we get out of critique. So now as we near the reaching, I'm going to throw in a uh, recommended viewing, which I'm not going to do all the time, but again, Cerny method, I mentioned it earlier. I'll put the link somewhere. Uh, to the video, to the slides, hopefully they're both still up, but incredibly valuable presentation, full of just rich with ideas that have been really central, truly central to every job I've done, directly referencing things from Cerny Method's approach, 
borrowing a bit this, that, and the other. There's points he makes that are very clear. And again, I want to stress too a couple other points about that presentation. Like I said, Mark Cerny, even by that point 20 years ago, had already worked in Japanese game development and European game development and American game development. Different work cultures, different traditions have different ways of doing things. He was able to pull together notes from all of those, which is also to say, I'm you know, he's clearly an incredibly smart guy. He's been doing this so long. He, he knows so much, but it's also not as if it's all just straight out of Mark Cerny's brain, right? He's, he's giving us access to some of the things that he's learned from his different positions, careers, coworkers, collaborators, mentors, people around him. He's giving that away in a way that has very much structurally changed how AAA, how indie, how hobbyist, how every kind of project works. Sometimes so much, so severely that it's almost it's in the air where you might see some of this anymore and be like, well, that seems obvious. It was not obvious 20 years ago and it's still not obvious to certain people, but he articulates it so clearly. It has stood the test of time. It has changed the industry for the better. It avoids us spending as much time and energy on things that weren't the right thing to do at all. Give that talk a listen. I encourage it strongly. And then in terms of a uh, prototype here to encourage a different approach for next time. Remember last time we talked about can we distill what would have been a helpful prototype for a kind of game that I liked the end result of? Commercial game, hobbyist game, free game, whatever game you picked. This time, we're still going to base it on something outside of ourselves because I find that can be an easier lens sometimes in kind of working from whole cloth. And we'll have plenty of time in the rest of the course for other ideas which includes to remember for your exercises, I'm giving you thoughts here. Here's a way you could do it. If you want to prototype something else, I'm at the end of this course going to look at your seven or eight you pick or whatever it is we decide at the end out of the 15. If I'm the one looking at it and if it's somebody else, well, then, you know, it's up to that instructor. But that's my general suggestion so you can safely throw some stuff away. But I'm going to encourage this time to base it on something that you severely don't understand. And let me make my point here. So, I was reading this fun share the other day, remind me a story from my background, and the share was about somebody who, he got kind of bored of his job, they blocked a bunch of the websites he wanted to kind of fool around and be distracted on, so instead he was reading about Board Game Geek or something, and he learned about a game that he could read about at work, but he couldn't play, and he tried to remake part of it, and uh, he completely misunderstood it. What he built wasn't at all what that game was. He is now an award-winning game designer. Turned out he liked his version of what he thought it was supposed to be better. And the reason that resonated with me was my first project that got me into the Indicade stuff, uh, which over the years I became an organizer for five years, 85 speakers and helped start Indicade Europe and now part of the alumni lead. What got my finalist in there was there was another game on smartphone that I had seen winning awards that was really interesting to me. And I misunderstood how the control worked. I thought it worked in a kind of spatial way, manipulating the phone, right? Like, rolling it around like this before I figured out that's not how that works. And because the phones didn't have to accomplish yet, they couldn't. But that's what led to feel for it as my project that at the time was again, a finalist for Indicate and helped connect and become my first time speaking industry and then led to all these other great opportunities for me came from a misunderstanding of I see a thing. I haven't played a thing. I don't know a lot about it. And, and this is going to weird some people out who come from more traditional research background. I did not look it up. I did not research it to get a better understanding. So here's the gist here, right? Let's say there's a thing that you know people like that has just never been your deal. Maybe you've never played a Pokemon game. Maybe you've never played the game Sorry or Boggle. And the exercise here for prototyping is to figure out, prototype how you think that works. And whether you want to use paper, whether you use digital, whatever you want to use between now and next time, it's a chance to figure out, I mean, it, and let's say there's even something more narrative than that. Let's say you want to work, for example, in Twine doing interactive narrative instead of real-time mechanics, instead of board game, dice, human, player, multi multiplayer, solo, solitaire kind of experience. Let's say you want to use Twine to author an interactive fiction experience. You could even think about what's a movie you've heard a lot about, like The Godfather, for example, right? You've heard so many things, people rave about it. You just never got around to watching it. You don't have anything against it. It's just never done it. Don't look it up. Don't read a summary. Make an interactive fiction prototype about what you think it is. And it almost reminds me, too, of one of the ways that uh, I heard voice actors discussed coming up with new characters is that they would at first just try to do someone else's voice that they know they can't impersonate and in the process discover another thing that they can do with their voice. That wouldn't have happened if they hadn't just thrown a marker at the horizon and said, I'm going that way. I'm going that way. So again, sometimes it's easier for us to browse our mental lexicon. What's a movie? What's a game? What's a board game? You've heard a lot about. You've seen, people seem to like. And part of what's interesting about this is, again, your end result may be unrecognizable. My finals for Indicate looked nothing like in any way, shape, or form the thing that I was thinking I was trying to re-implement the mechanics of when I built it. 
it wound up a very different function. It might also be a case where it could wind up speaking to there's a way that, for example, MOBAs or before that things like Command and Conquer Soul Survivor, they kind of sputtered off the RTS game type things. There's things where those types of experiences in some ways speak to a much broader audience than the history of them, which is more complex in a different way. And it's not to say the new stuff isn't complex, but to say that it speaks to a different audience because it's a different lens of people who the old thing didn't appeal to them, but this other thing does. And it may be that if there's a thing that seems intuitive to you of how it ought to have been, how you think it is, how you assume it is, there may be something interesting there that's different than the thing itself. Not to say that thing is bad or worse in any way, but it might actually speak to other people who have a similar confusion about that's how they've always kind of thought about, I don't know, what Ninja Gaiden was like or what happens in Bejeweled or something. And you can almost take this to a comic degree, know you're messing it up, embrace it as a prototype. Again, that's part of the nature of what we're doing here. We're trying to take chances, experiment. Part of creativity is being safe knowing you can throw away some stuff that you didn't like. So if you just don't like how it comes out, trash it at the end of the quarter or end of our uh, video series or end of your section with the teacher, whatever, just don't show it for your final results. But that's the idea for today. A wild mismatch, wild card, severe misunderstanding. Pick one, build a prototype of a piece of that that you think helps show how you think that part of it works. And if it helps to, again, do it in a analog fashion because you're maybe not fluent in certain creative, practical technical sides of doing it. So let's say you want to test a battle system for Pokemon as a turn-based thing. You could still do it with paper, with pencil, with some rules written down, with calculator. That's totally okay for our prototype. Just to express, how do you think that works? What's in those menus? You've got some vague awareness. Final Fantasy, you name it. Anyway, you got the idea. So that's our end of video today on the introductions of prototyping concepts. Hope it's been helpful for you. Get a lot of these patterns you're going to see happen throughout, whether we are in hardware, whether we are in analog, whether we're in verbal games, board games, whatever. These are just generic principles of rapid prototyping. So this is, again, one of our longer. I know these intro videos are both a little more of a slog of lectures. You know, I said we wouldn't do a lot of it. We really are getting quickly towards where it's going to be shorter bits from me talking at you and more just you. Got some direction. You got a point. Work on stuff. And at that point, if you have questions, bounce them by your peers. If you've got peers you've brought together, if you have an instructor, talk to your instructor about it. If you're in home team, talk to me about it, etc. That's the gist for today. Thanks for following along. I'll catch you next time. The next video coming up is going to be about digital hardware alt control interface prototyping. It's going to be a way shorter talk, but a fun one to work on. I'll catch you then. Welcome to video three of my rapid prototyping video series. And as I've been warning for the previous two videos, which I know are darn well an hour long or so, we're about to get way shorter and you can check the time run of this one shorter already just like I promised because now our focus is going to be on you being more self-guided but me pointing you in a different direction each time including so for this one we want to talk about alt control digital hardware interface prototyping and what's cool about this one is it might be even if it involves unity or something it can be an incredibly incredibly lightweight way of doing it in terms of the actual project itself it could be as simple as raising or lowering a ball on the screen it doesn't have to be much. It could actually be a simple prototype in anything because the way that this works is that it's not like you're mass producing a controller where you need to ship a blueprint to establish a deal with a factory, produce mass produce this stuff overseas and case it in plastic. The way that this kind of works at the prototype scale, when you're just trying to try it out, what would this be like? How would this be any good? Is to take existing devices around you. And so this is where when I alluded to earlier on that you might wind up spending 10, 20, 40 bucks ish uh, in this kind of situation is there are certain kind of things you could do if what you buy is a cheap USB controller and I've done this before buy a cheap USB controller unscrew the back and uh, obviously make sure it's not plugged in when you're doing this stuff just so you don't damage the controller and or shock yourself or anything figure out if you can mount those buttons those clicky connects contacts between behind something else that makes them look different uh, a plush character a uh, picture frame I've done it before for um a rotating joystick. If you can connect that to spin when a chair spins, I've used that before to turn a computer monitor on a chair mounted as if it was like a turret from the Millennium Falcon in Star Wars. But these are all things where you can be leveraging existing hardware, including something as simple as a Bluetooth mouse you might already own. There's such an enormous number of variations and variety and cool examples of. I worry if I focus too much on me bringing up examples, you're gonna gonna see too many echoes of those and the things that come back to me if I'm looking at prototypes, so that your teacher might not see as much variety. So one example, though, is something called Hell Couch, and it's an enormously awesome project. They, they, they have a couch, a sofa that's set up, and you can find videos of it online where 
there's a monster that growls and there's smoke getting fired out and there's red LED lights that are firing on and off and all this kind of stuff. But partly the basic mechanic is it detects when you sit on the couch and when you stand from a couch and realize that that could be as simple as put a mouse under the cushion and detect when that mouse button is held down. Right. You didn't do any tricky wiring. You didn't cut anything open. You didn't even destroy the mouse. You just reused it in a weird way that's different than the usual ways people use it. And like I mentioned in the kind of earlier section thing about when we get to doing analog prototyping stuff in the next sections, there's cases where if you can base a game to work on using an off the shelf, any chessboard, any checkerboard, any common set of die or dice or poker cards or whatever, then more people can use it. If you can make a game that the way to play it involves using a standard keyboard, a standard gamepad, you don't have to take apart a standard mouse. You can have more people around the world immediately able to play it without having to actually hit a pipeline of, well, until we can mass produce this controller, other people aren't going to be able to experience it. Another example I want to share, uh, again, we're trying to minimize how many concrete examples I give. Tim Garbos, who's any more best known for, I think, primary lead creator for What the Golf, What the Bat, variety of uh, really whimsical, curious gameplay experiences at Indicate Europe now must have been, I think, 2016 or so out in Paris. He led a prototyping workshop with hardware, and he had this awesome example. I think I saved a 14-second video clip. I want to show that here in the video. <laughs> I mean, what's happening here, right, is pretty much speaking for itself. It's literally just using the mouse input. You could play this without using a broomstick, but by combining, uh, combining a broomstick with a mouse... He's able to roll it, to move it up and down, and slide it up and down to play a violin in a totally different interface than it would be if you just used a mouse normally. And so I love the kind of example. Again, I didn't have to destroy anything, didn't have to change anything, didn't have to rewire anything. Still worked. And so in thinking about this, it's also where out of his games that he's been a lead of for that same studio, doing things like using the keyboard in directional ways. So instead of having the letters that type, treating it as a whole series of buttons and directions or ways to interact with a space, is another way that people have been able to experiment with unusual control interface prototyping. And this is where we're getting a prototype level. We don't have to worry about maybe it might be kind of finicky. It might depend on having a very particular kind of mouse that has a very certain set of buttons on it. But if you can leverage that, then you're in good shape. And another nice thing to think about when designing for alt control type experiences, again, it might be something that makes it more visible when someone's doing it. So one of the reasons why at half generation or so in games, Rock Band and so on partly thrived the way that they did it was very obvious when you're at a house party and people were playing that. It looks different. It sounds different. It's very different in the present space in a way that obviously it took a whole different measure of mass production to produce those plastic custom controllers. But mechanically, they weren't necessarily wildly complex compared to even a standard dual analog. And there's sort of things that when people see someone using it, it stands out to them. What are you doing? What is that? And that can make your game potentially easier to talk about or just as another kind of social currency thing to discuss a fun novelty to show others that's different than the usual. So in that kind of vein, it might also be something where if you're not even doing something, say, programming wise, but maybe interacting with an existing experience, uh, there could be something where you are facing the screen in a different direction when you're trying to interact with it. It could be a you're having to use the keyboard upside down in some sense for some reason, finding a situation where that becomes appropriate to what you're trying to design with a prototype is part of the exercise. And it's a, it's a case where, again, you might take an existing piece of software as a prototype idea of, is this worth exploring? And the answer could be you find no from your testing, from trying it out. In which case, if you've still got time, try some others, figure out, can you inform a better direction to go in? What is it working about it? What is not working about it? But it's going to come from this custom control interface stuff. And when I keep bringing up alt control, it's a very specific name, A-L-T-C-T-R-L. So like the key on the keyboard abbreviation, typically alt control short for alternative controllers or alt control. There's a whole section of GDC dedicated to it. Game Developers Conference every single year. There's been a lot of years of the alt control conference with some great games highlighted. And the reason why, even though I've, gosh, there's some really cool ones. I've got a friend who worked on a thing called Morse, Alex Johansson over in uh, Scandinavia. There's these cool projects that I don't want to overly focus on the specific examples because there's so, so, so many from different years, from different creators, of wildly different styles. That even if, you know, they, they took their whole thing to a next level because they're bringing a project to a conference to show. But you can still see ways to prototype things that they did or might inspire ideas in you. And that's where I'm hoping that you individually or you perhaps with your peers will browse some of those archives. 
Go find some examples. They're not hard to find. Search alt control A L T C T R L G D C on the internet. Find some examples that are your favorites that interest you. Think about other pieces that they can inspire, which you could prototype out of existing hardware that you're having to invent. You're not having to construct or manufacture. Potentially could buy cheaply if you realize that, gosh, if I just had a single button or a single thing I could twist, or if there was a certain kind of other mouse, if there was more than one mouse connected to a computer, who knows? Is that a way we can make the experience work different than typical games are played? And it's a chance to, again, break into a novel design space where the low-hanging fruits haven't all been picked for here's what a keyboard or a gamepad is good for. It's a case where you don't have deeply entrenched conventions of, well, if you're making a kind of a platformer, an FPS game or an RTS game, there's a lot of expectations about the buried entry to how that's supposed to feel and turn and how the jump button's supposed to behave. When you have a new affordance, a new, I mean, a new interface to interact with that space, it's another way to engage with it. And so you might even think too, let's say you want to do some VR prototyping. And again, we're talking prototype, which might mean that I'll give an example here for VR, right? Let's say I want to test in VR strapping the controllers to my ankles instead of holding them with my hands. Come with an experience for that. This is where in prototyping, keep in mind that it doesn't have to actually do the things. And what I mean by this is that because they're just there to test the idea, we can tell the player or enforce for ourselves the rules. And this is a version of what people call Wizard of Ozing, which is where Let's say I'm testing a UI, which we've got another section talking about this as part of analog prototyping later. You can have drawings or PowerPoint slides or whatever where someone touches it or clicks on it. And then you, as the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain, flips to slide 17 or replaces that piece of paper with now you're on the inventory screen. You can be the reason that it works. Or you can simply, so let's say, again, I put these controllers on my ankles. I'm doing VR stuff. And I want to see, would it be fun or interesting to try to walk through a maze how thick would the walls be would that space be like the only things needed to make that work right are a baseline get quest or whatever vr headset you have running in unity ability to import either a model or use pro builder to smash up some walls in a maze type structure or whatever thing you're envisioning and then just the ability to visualize where your feet are to put spheres where your controllers are the game doesn't have to know that they're not on your hands for that to still work You'll figure out, of course, you have to keep your eyes pointing at your feet for the detectors to be able to work the way they're supposed to. You might certainly have to mount it. But in terms of the behavior in the game, you do not need for a prototype to actually detect, did my sphere go through a wall? Did I run out of hearts? Did I run out of time? You don't have to do any of that because the prototype is just figuring out, is this worth spending more time on? Or is this terrible? (laughs) Knowing full it might be. And so that's what we're talking about again. It's different ways to use existing controllers to modify them. If you want to, if you want to be brave and risk damaging a controller, you don't mind potentially destroy or can't put back together. Exploring, could you take something out of a mouse? Could you take something out of a joystick? Could you mount something to a joystick? Or this is also a case I've done a, we had a physical game where you had a simulating a push bar for a relay race at Carnegie Mellon. There's a thing called buggy. The way we simulated that was we literally, we just mounted a mouse to two pieces of sliding wood with a push bar handle attached to it. So when you pushed it, I could detect that in the game. And the, the way that this works, right, is that you don't have to be super, I don't know, gearhead about knowing exactly what the range is. You set it up, you mount it, you tape it, you strap it, whatever you're doing with Velcro. You then test and see what range of values are coming back and you tune against those in your engine to say, okay, that's our normalized range. That's the value that we need. But it shouldn't take a whole bunch of engineering marvel. It shouldn't take a bunch of building. And again, because it's a prototype, You don't actually need the things to work. You need to be able to tell, how is this experience? Is this interesting? Is is there something, does this have legs? Is this worth taking further? Is this worth talking about with others? Trying a bit of that is what we're talking about here today for our digital all control interface. That's it. That's our exercise. Again, I told you this video is going to be shorter. That's our exercise. Build some sort of alt control thing. That's my encouraged prototype. Again, if you want to stick to other kind of prototypes, methods we talked about, knock yourself out. If you don't do alt control, knock yourself out. But... My recommended watching is to go watch some videos, some trailers of some alt control projects. Ideally, a different set than your other classmates or your peers might. Check some different years. Pick at least maybe a couple from different years, kind of at random, to just inspire your brain with a different set of examples that other people are asking about. That's part of why, again, I don't want to spend too much time today. I could give you my favorites of, my best of, ones I think are particularly cool. I think you're going to be too much not exploring the full space versus... So much is out there about it. And not just the GDC either, right? I think uh, Indicade celebrated some alt control games. 
Lots of festivals have different kind of alt control things that have happened. It's become a common term of art you can find to navigate this space. But that's it for today. Thank you for following along for video three. In the next part, we'll be revisiting our uh, last part for this section. It's going to be about mechanical rapid design, real-time gameplay stuff. That interests me a lot as a pinball researcher and real-time game designer. So it might be a little longer of a talk, but I'll see you next time. Hopefully it's been a good break from our hour-long videos. Welcome to video four in my rapid prototyping sort of informal class series here. Whether you're self-guided or you're going through a classroom, however you're going through this content, whether you're in home team, perhaps working with me directly, we are now on to a section about real-time rapid design for what I'm calling mechanical rules. Now, this area interests me a lot, so I'm trying to sort of hold back a little bit here. And one of the reasons is because in my graduate school days, I was a pinball researcher. And so basically our, you know, most of these days, I'm trying to offer some video if you want to elaborate, add to your understanding outside of our current main prototyping discussions. The one I'm adding here is actually a USC presentation I did based on one I gave in Montreal, as well as maybe Degra, one of the game game journal conference kind of things uh, about pinball history, pinball's design, pinball industry relationship to digital games. Anywho, because I have that video up there, I'm trying to not put too much of that on you today. I know you're probably not here because pinball interests you. But the reason why this to me is a relevant lens and why it's so important is because the same design processes for rapid prototyping from the pinball industry are incredibly practical, incredibly useful in digital games as well, or even other kinds of physical games where there might be too much happening too fast for us to really plan it all in our heads. And the roots of this really have their traditions, not just in non-digital games like pinball, mechanical kind of experiences. But also, even in the early game industry, there's a great book by Chris Crawford about computer game design. It's kind of hard to find. It's probably free if you can, because it's been long out of print. It's not he's in a newer book he's written about it. This is an 83 edition, I believe. But he mentions that one of the quirks of design for a computer, as opposed to design for sports or design for an, you know, a purely card-based board game kind of experience, is that there may be so many things happening so quickly. And this is even in 83, right? 40, 40 years ago. So many things happening so quickly that we just can't really anticipate until it's working how it's happening, how it's going to play out. And this is one of the quirks of digital game design that differentiates it in some ways from rapid prototyping in non-digital space. And this is where, again, pinball interests me because it's this nice intersection of actually these design principles work there too, but it's not unique to pinball. It's the same thing we would see in a game like Hungry Hungry Hippos and a game like Crossfire. These physical games where there's lots of marbles flying around, physical chaotic things happening are where these practices are relevant. Now, the main practice I want to talk about here is a thing called white wood prototyping. And white wooding is a thing that comes again from the pinball industry where basically you picture a pinball table and it's got this beautiful art about Elvis or ACDC or a movie from the 80s or whatever. Before they paint all the stuff on the table, they need to figure out where are the ramps, where are the pop bumpers, where are the drop targets going to be so that we can fit it around the other elements going to be attached. Now, one of the things that winds up happening is that when mechanical engineers are designing pinball tables, they are still using CAD or classically they were drafting on paper to figure out plans for it to put things. But the reality of when that ball is going so fast and it's so heavy and things are moving around so quickly, what winds up happening is what they think is going to work. The moment they start flipping at it with a table built in front of them, it becomes real clear. This should be a little bit that way. This should be a little bit back this way. We should remove this part entirely. This is getting stuck over here. We've got to change something until it's not getting stuck over here. And that white wooding is called because it's white wood. They haven't painted it yet. They haven't decided where the art's going to go. Instead, it is in a condition where they are able to kind of drill, reattach, move, rearrange pieces again, try a different configuration to figure out, okay, well, it plays a little bit better like this. It plays a little bit better like that. Let's, let's try it over this. Let's try this next. It's spending too much time getting hit up that angle, or it keeps not quite making up that ramp. What do we have to adjust? Make it longer, etc. All those little tweaks which again, to me, are a major part of my design practice in digital games, has for a long time been making a thing as a starting point, knowing full well, it's going to take a lot of tweaking and not putting too much trust or belief in until I have it working on real time, on machine, inexperienced. Again, you got to, the people, because you have to be flipping those ball in the real table in order to get a sense for, is this working or not? You can't simulate it in your head. You can't just imagine. You can't talk to somebody else about it. You have to try it in front of you. And so that same practice is where a lot of our arcade mechanisms and mechanics come from. Now, the one exception to this, and this is where we kind of get outside of prototyping domain in the kind of broad spectrum sense into narrower 
like the level design type of prototyping. We'll talk about that. We have a section for that much later in this course series. But the thing that I would like about this is that if you're exploring mostly new domain, say you have your alt control, your physical arrangement, you came up with the last time you came up with a really clever way that you can, I don't know, attach an analog stick to something or you can uh, use a string attached to a mouse or I don't know. Right. I don't know yet what you're going to do. And it's going to be different for everybody. That's probably love with this. But now you're trying to design what's a good game experience to go with that controller. Because it was kind of satisfying or fun to play with. But this is where, again, it's part of the fun thing about a physical interface that's new or different. You don't have a bunch of other examples, dozens of bestsellers over the generations about what people have done with this. And what that gives you is really free reign to figure out, we have to figure out what's any good for it. That's going to involve trying some stuff and iterating and tweaking, being like, well, this wasn't quite it. What if it's a little more like that? What if we try this? And so... This is where it's an invitation this time for the prototyping to engage in your digital prototyping in a way that is a little less strategic. It'd still be nice to state why you're trying something like an all of our documentation. It'd still be good to try to figure out what are you trying to achieve? What are you testing for? But this one, a little more so than some of the other things I'm talking about, could be a bit more like, again, you're strumming on a guitar, you're banging on a drum. You're just trying to see, does this have legs? Is this going to work? Is, this, is there something here? Now, some other artifacts that come from that rapid design and, and real-time mechanical rules. And let me actually, let me take a step back here and talk about what I mean by mechanical rules. Like I alluded to from the Chris Crawford text, rules enforced by the machine are a very different experience for the player, right? They can be far more of them. They can be far finer fidelity. It might have to do with, heck, even the old Space War PDP-1 game from MIT. Uh, you know, I'm out in the Boston area now. From MIT was PDP-1, and it had gravity simulated. That's not a thing you can easily just write down in rules for a board game or card game and have people enforce in real time. Did I turn on time? Did I get my angles right? It's a fundamentally deeply different experience for us. And there's some differences I want to talk about for those rules because, again, this is a case for there's situations where white wooding prototyping is a better fit and cases where it is totally the wrong fit. In the same way as you can analog prototype some things that are a great match for a turn-based digital game or an interface, it may not be a good match for what should have been a white wood prototype. And so some differences here have to do partly with that mechanical adjudication of rules. That's a term I got from Celia Pierce, who was my grad advisor and did a bunch of this research uh, back when we were at Georgia Tech. Now she's actually at Northeastern. But she wrote a paper with some other researchers about machine adjudicated rules and its relationship to players, where what it meant was that it removed from it the social component of navigating our shared understanding of the rules. That for some people, what they like about board games, what they like about card games, what they enjoy about sports is that we have to explain the rules to each other, that we internalize those rules, that we have to mentally abide by them. But also because it's enforced by a machine in this case, there's not the same discrepancies that in children on the sandlot play baseball field or even adults, umpires yelling at each other, disagree about was this in, was it out, was that count, was this a foul? That sort of discrepancy is part of the social experience of navigating when there are so few rules human beings have to make calls about. Now, there's more about this. And in that, like I say, I'm going to attach, I don't want to go too far into my own research stuff. So I'm going to attach a video at the end of all of this or in the description or whatever that goes to one of my research talks. The second part of that talks more about these rules and the distinction. There's some really bizarre, fundamentally structurally different things about what we mean by rules in a digital game than a traditional turn-based or strategic or sport kind of game. And so that talk better spells those out. But it's again, figure out when is a whitewood more appropriate. And it's partly when there's too much happening too fast with too high of fidelity and precision for the human brain to keep up with it. So we just have to try it a little bit as a starting point, still for basis for why we started one way or the other, and then adapt quickly and rapidly and experiment explore. We're doing that space. But some of the other patterns that emerge from this, because often it's a matter of a subtle difference in timing, a sub subtle difference in angle might make the distinction between success and failure. It's different, right, than if you are playing chess and, oops, I moved a piece 0.1 seconds too early or I didn't quite land on the tile I meant to land on. In these kind of cases, whether you're playing pinball, whether you're playing Space Invaders or, or some other kind of more traditional modern FPS experiences, the same things apply. It's because you missed by a couple degrees. And so one of the patterns that emerged from pinball design that becomes applicable to the other spaces is something that they've referred to as the near miss effect or I meant to do that. And this is when, when an experience starts for the player, making sure there's a big field of ways they can get it right. So almost whatever they do, they're, they're likely to feel like I'm being successful. I'm, I must be figuring this out because I'm doing things that I'm being rewarded. I'm getting points. Stuff is happening. So examples of this in the pinball sphere, we have these old drop target banks. There's a whole series of seven, five, 12 targets, whatever it is. 
each time you hit one, it pops down. And so at first, if you hit any part of it, it looks like you're doing it right. And then it gets harder and harder to miss by a little by a little until there's one left and it's really hard. And that same pattern we saw in games like Space Invaders and games like Breakout and games like Asteroids, where when it starts, there's targets everywhere. You can basically fire into the target field and you'll hit an alien. You'll hit a brick. You can't miss them. And as it gets fewer and fewer and fewer, it gets more and more progressively challenging in this very nice natural curve that allows us to kind of begin by exploring and learning how to play it by playing it. And then progressively becomes more challenging to us until we feel like, oh, we almost got there. But it's that what they're calling a near miss effect of or that I meant to do that. First, I meant to do that where anything I do is successful, received somehow, more likely to be a success. And then the more I do it, the more emergently, systematically challenging it gets to get just the last piece. You think of it a bit like if I'm to borrow an old mini game from Super Nintendo Zelda games where he would be digging up trying to find rupees underground that were buried in the dirt with his shovel. And when it starts, there's plenty of things that are buried. You're finding them. But the more the closer the time runs out, the harder it is to find the last ones you haven't found yet because you kind of at first proportionally there were a bunch you hadn't found yet and you're hitting them all over the place and then narrower and narrower and narrower it gets. It's this really nice natural emergent curve you can do spatially, you can do with angles, you can do in timing, you can do in search scan grid spaces like that digging area. So it's a nice affordance that, or a nice mechanic that we can leverage for real time games. Rollover lanes is also a thing that evolved from pinball space that again has found its way into Mario, into Pac-Man, into Sonic, into modern games as well through how they distribute power ups around it. And all this really comes down to is that in a play field for a pinball machine, the designer wants to give the player a reason to have the ball go up each ramp and to go around the back and to take the different angles and directions. And a rollover lane is nothing more than a wire the ball rolls over that tells the machine you crossed this, you crossed. And of course, if you do enough of those, you can figure out that cross this direction or that direction. But the same mechanism is used where in a platformer, even an early Mario, and I think I use an example in my same lectures that I'll link to the video of, you know, why does Mario getting coins? It's not because the princess is being held ransom. It's not because he needs to buy things for the kingdom. Yes, he gets an extra life from 100 of us, but is he buying it from a store in the kingdom where all the good guys got turned into bricks and piranha plants? It doesn't make any sense. It's simply a rollover lane. It's given Mario a reason to explore the whole space, to jump up here, to bother going down there, to figure out if he can make this jump. And the same thing happens in a lot of our real-time spaces where if it's a space and we don't give the player a reason to explore, a reason to go over there, some sort of cookie for you looked behind this rock, you climbed up here, you got down there, then a bunch of the space becomes useless to us. We don't parse it, we don't experience it, we just beeline point A to point B. And so when we're in a real-time space, it's another way we can, easy pattern we can adapt into our experiments to figure out at least as a baseline Okay, I want to give the reason a, pl a player a reason to interact with this to move around the space to use the whole playfield. One of the things to think about when designing a real time prototype, again, digital, if you want to find some mechanical way to do it. And so, a mechanical way, right, might be, I don't know, like Hungry Hungry Hippos, lots of marbles, lots of action, players simultaneously doing things, where until you give them a chance to be flicking marbles at the same time, you just have a bad gauge for how it's going to play out. But this is a case where another version of what makes this nice for the digital experience that we can afford from real-time stuff is that before video games, which I know is now older than most people probably watching this course taking part in it, perhaps, not in all cases, it's something where they are in physical sports, which are games of reflex, games of speed, games of timing. It takes a certain body build. People will spend hours routinely in the gym, running, lifting weights. It helps them if they happen to be built like a fridge or they happen to be very tall have an advantage in certain kind of sports and athletic opportunities in a way that for digital games or even mechanically adjudicated non-digital games like pinball with a button, it allows us to remove out, to subtract out that accessibility barrier of who has a body type to partake in a time-based real-time experience, a something about coordination even to a degree. I mean, there might still be a timing component. But you think about when you click on a flipper for a pinball machine, it's completing a circuit. You're not actually pushing a bar. You're completing a circuit, which is firing it at full impulse. And now granted, you can time it a little more, a little less, but like you can hold the Mario button, jump a little more, a little less to get not quite as high to land on a platform. But it's not as if you need to practice throwing a punch or swinging a bat. It's a very different kind of skill. But you take the time to real-time experience and make it available to players who otherwise the other models for it historically weren't available to. And again, it's easy to take this for granted in the modern world. But it's a reminder about this lens into how different this medium may be in some ways than 
how we might in a later section, our analog section coming up, we might design something that's a little more of a sport, a run around tag type activity, may favor certain body types, fitness conditions, and so on, in a way we don't have that limitation here. And so some of the things that have made it for an interesting design space in real-time games have been helping players feel like, oh, if I was a basketball player, if I was a really athletic person, if I was a great fighter, if I, if I was, I don't know, trained in certain skills to be a ninja that I don't have, it's become a window into that. And it's one of the things we can accomplish through digital interfaces that are just different than what we're going to accomplish through sports design, board, card game design, etc. in the same kind of way. Now, when I talk about those examples of being a ninja or playing a sport, the other thing to keep in mind for those as well is that they are often a metaphor for what the player is trying to do. And this is going to be part of our affordance design for real-time experience, where a difference from the rules for a non-digital game is that we would have to read them, understand them, abide by them because we could accidentally not play it correctly. In the digital case, because we can often learn the rules by playing it to a large extent, we may still need some guides, some basic tutorial on what to even do to get started. But a lot of the rules we figure out by interacting with it, in many cases, what winds up happening is that the game's imagery becomes just really a hint for this is a good thing to get. This is a bad thing you're supposed to avoid. The goal is to get this piece over here. And then beyond that, the actual tuning of it, there's a great deal of give in how you can have something that looks like a basketball game, say NBA Jam, that isn't very literal about how basketball works. You can have something that looks like sort of tennis conceptually, Pong achieved this, and it's not how tennis works exactly, but it means you don't have to explain to the person because they see it and they get it. And so it's another case where in leveraging outside metaphors, we can have more sophisticated objectives, rule sets, reward systems in a real-time complex system that we don't have to teach the player. It's where, and again, this has got its origins in pinball history, there were games that would leverage how poker hands work, how bowling rules work, how jigsaw puzzles are solved to immediately make sure a player who looks at the machine isn't just recognizing, oh, I, this, this resonates with me thematically, but to know how to play because there's certain things we assume about you can't hit a pin more than once or that I'm only get two shots to do this are things that the bowling game implies. And so it's to recognize when you are making a digital real-time prototype, it's not just a matter of what would be a neat thing to represent on the screen. You can be starting from a mechanically abstract experiment with mechanics, trying out something that you're not even clear what it is, but then to work backwards from that to figure out thematically is there something that if we could skin it the right way in terms of how we represent the pieces that can give players clues about how to engage with this so they understand their objectives. And this is where, again, going back to old digital game spaces and still to this day, there's some symbols to figure out about how to make something look like I'm supposed to get that. I'm supposed to protect this one. I'm supposed to harm that one. I'm supposed to get over there. I'm supposed to avoid this. Those visual affordances are part of what, at a mechanical level, we still have to pay attention to for the practical trade-offs we're making in cutting corners for prototyping because they are communicative. They have to do with the affordance of players know what to do with it before they even interact with it. Two more tools that come to us from the space of historical real-time game design we can still use in prototyping are, first of all, the reward structure that's built into a lot of old games, starting with pinball, but still into digital games as well, is essentially a light show. It's spectacle. It's the sounds are going off. It's the lights are blaring. It's where on a machine, it was quite literally flashing lights at you or playing a little strobe across the playfield to show you got an extra ball or it's a loud crack of a sound. It's just this payoff that is less sophisticated than if we were not prototyping, we might figure, ah, oh, gosh, I have a whole, I got a whole, whole cutscene. I'm going to need voice acting. I need to tell this story here. And that may be where your prototype is going to go eventually. It may be. It may also not need to be. One of the early casual games that helped kick off the space of modern casual back in, I think, the Big Fish era, uh, is a game called Peggle. And it actually not coincidentally looks like Bagatelle or old classic pin based pinball with just a grid of pins and the ball bouncing down them. But when you succeeded at that, it just becomes triumphant with just music blaring and there's particles doing fireworks. It's a big celebration. But it's very different from a reward cookie of here's the next part of the plot. There's still an element of that. In the same kind of way as for that matter too, in pinball machines, there were some little puppets on the play field that would sometimes the reward it's giving you is these little boxes are punching each other or your old digital match, your dot matrix displays showing a little clip of the Terminator doing something. But those kind of cookies are tools in your tool belt of ways to reward the player to show them you did something interesting. I'm trying to show you do more of that. And this is where we're trying to guide the player towards understanding, okay, there's a system where lots of things are possible. 
I believe as the pinball designer, you're going to have more fun if I can get you to keep trying to alternate these loops as an example. So then how do I reward the player to show them engage with it in this way? And you're going to have more fun than if you just kind of don't pay attention to what you're doing. One of these other design mechanisms that comes to us from old arcade design is the essentially the reuse of the play field in a reusable way of the, you know, Donkey Kong levels cycle after a few uh, Pac-Man cycles on the same field. Pinball quite obviously uses the same field in most cases, a couple little weird special tricky exceptions that go on. But it's also that narratively, thematically, there's no progress in the plot, right? There's not a thing where I've now solved, I've fixed the day, I've reached the end of the story as we might in a more linear experience. This is something we've seen a lot of indie games, old classic indie early iPhone game called Cannibalt. It's about this moment, Adam Saltz and the creator said, of just running in an action movie across rooftops as they're collapsing behind you. And if you lose, you didn't really lose because you're supposed to play it again. And this lens even applies back to I'm a believer and not all academics agree about this perspective on it. Then they will get Missile Command. It, you, know, you play Missile Command until eventually the Soviets win. But I don't believe it's a game about the Soviets winning. I believe it's a game about never giving up because you're supposed to keep putting in another quarter to play it again. But it's a thing that rids us of the assumption from so many of our linear modern gameplay experiences around us that in order to prototype it, I need to put it on this long rail. In order to get the mechanics working, I need to come up with a progression. And so let's just focus on a moment of gameplay or a moment of narrative and say, can I really nail that? And I like that as well because, again, it speaks back to this kind of certainty method notion of vertical slice or of a target example. Can I make that moment feel crisp and great? And what's cool about this as a design lens as well for your prototyping is realizing that perhaps just because you could doesn't necessarily even imply you have to go wide or add cut scenes or do this other kind of layer of work on top of it. It's something where you might be able to find a way to continue to polish that. And so as we see later in our course progression here, if you decide to take your rapid digital prototype and turn that into your polished result, you may not be adding more content to it. You may be adding polish to what's already happening in a really tight, high quality, just spectacle delivery feels right when you're playing it. That's what these kind of games can be about. And it's, again, different than if you nail the jump in a platform and feel right, you still then have to nail level design for a bunch of spaces in a way that doesn't apply to all games that use these models for design. So I know I said this would be a longer one, and so we're going to wrap it up. Again, my recommended viewing or watching optionally, but I think it covers a things that I, you know, if I didn't put them in that video, I would have said a bunch more about today. It's about my pinball research followed by my rules research. It's a USC video. I'm going to link somewhere in the description and so on of just that talk from years ago. And it's something where the way it talks about rules and especially in that second half, I think becomes a helpful lens for you in identifying what kind of project would be a white wood approach to design as opposed to other lenses that we bring into prototyping. Probably implied from what we've been talking about, but your goal or my recommended exercise for the next prototype take on once again, choose what you want, is to make something real time that's too fast or has too much happening for you to predict ahead of time how it's going to feel until you get it working on device. And this is not as hard as it seems because it might mean you take something that seems like a basic pattern of gameplay with one enemy and one player and you put a for loop or some other kind of spawn trickery into there to start with 50 of them. And you might find there's a whole different emergent mechanic of how when you circle strafe them, certain things happen of how when you're trying to dodge them, a whole different experience kind of starts to emerge. And can you find a way to lean into that and take that further? Can you, can you iterate and explore within that space of a little like this, a little like that? This is something where it might be a good example for physics-based gameplay. So, and again, if you want to do a non-digital game, you still can of this kind where I uh, used the example before. I don't want to give too many examples because I'm going to uh, limit the kind of things you do for design for this. But if we just took a cheap pack of marbles and instead of having it be turn-based, let you take turn, let you play at the same time, it's hard to predict how it's going to play out. And it's going to depend on what are the rules you put in place. There's games, variations, right? Where people will take a game like chess and somehow take the restriction off that you have to take turns and you let them go real time. What happens? There's also games where I think Button was a classic celebrated by Indicade of part of the emergent mechanic becomes, well, you know, if I was playing chess real time, would I try to stop you? Would I try to get in your way? Would that be part of the mechanic? In a game like Button, the experience was that you are allowed to, short of hurting each other, try to stop others from getting to the button. You could be going outside of the space of the control of the controller of the digital interface of whatever box you're putting together of items in an analog sense to instead look at are there ways I can get people to interact with each other, which starts to tip into we'll talk more about sports in a later section as another variant of things we can design. But it's fine to overlap there. It's a prototype. You're finding out you're testing. You're trying to go outside some assumptions you've been making before about what games are, what kind of games you're able to build.
And so the reason I say physics-based gameplay can be a good candidate for it is it's also an example where it's, you know, if you're using something like Unity, a checkbox in some sense to add a rigid body, get it to behave physically. And this is where you start to get these really chaotic systems that are satisfying but unpredictable about how certain things behave. And you start to explore rules about what if certain objects come in contact, what happens? What if objects touch the ground, what happens? What if objects can be kept above ground and enemies try to knock them down or something? And really, this is where part of the mechanics of something like Boombox emerged from was precisely this kind of physics-based gameplay. Or it's where, again, Angry Birds and its variability in level design and patterns that have held up for as long as they did in the mobile market came out of. And so physics-based gameplay is also a great place to explore that where it might be harder to put your finger on ahead of time. I can see clearly exactly why this is going to work a certain way, why it's a good idea. And it becomes, I, I, I know there's reasons why it's not the best design lens in all cases to just kind of try to mess with a box of toys and see what happens. This is the kind of environment or exercise to do it and start whitewooding, drill a hole, move your piece, drill a hole, move your piece, drill a piece, adjust the ramp. You got the idea. And then lastly is one other lens for how to think about doing these type of exercises for rapid prototyping. If you just sort of take things to their extremes, how many units could I involve? How fast could objects be moving? You might find how short can a gameplay round be? You might find that, again, it's hard to predict until you are up in front of trying to do it. How lack of contrast can pieces be in the game still be playable? And can I use that somehow? But starting to mess with these limits of cognition, of perception, of reaction time, of angles, of sheer number of things happening is where this stuff gets really interesting really quickly and divergent in different directions. So I don't give you too much more. Look forward to seeing what you're going to build if you decide to build one of these kind of things. Otherwise, hope you will build another kind of product, prototype of another kind that we've discussed or you've already seen on the calendar. Comes up in the weeks ahead. Speaking of which, next time, remember it's a reminder for at the end of each quarter of this chunk of videos, we'll be talking about encouraging critique between you and classmates. So whether it's this kind that I'm talking about today, if you choose to do a real-time prototype of some kind, the digital alt control, the uh, picking an example that was based on sort of misunderstanding or even one from the intro that was based on a piece of a product that you like. If you pick any one of those, it's up to you which one you discuss with the class. Show, but you'll be ready to show your peers, your group, your instructor, if you have an instructor, what was your process? How'd you get there? Documentation about the evidence of how it changed over time, how the end result was different than what you started with. Talk to us about your process, being ready for that. The start of either next time, if you're meeting with a group, if you have a weekly Zoom or something, or otherwise to do it between periods if you're just kind of on your own reflection time. But I'm excited to see you in the next video where we'll be picking up on the next few videos about non-digital games, social and verbal games, games with words, analog, prototyping, turn-based, which again, those are not my forte as much as pinball in real time. So once again, they'll probably be short, shorter videos in which a lot of this is going to become exploration and prototyping on your own. Welcome to video five of my prototyping course, start of quarter two or chunk section two, are you going to think about it, which we'll be talking mostly about non-digital games. Now, hopefully, if you are somehow meeting in person or on Zoom with other people who you're learning with, you've had a chance to now critique each other a little bit, knowing full well we haven't said a lot about practice for critique beyond. Again, don't get defensive. Try to distill into actionable for later. Take notes on what they're telling you. Uh, but for the most part, we're letting you just kind of try it out to see what comes naturally, because I think that's where part of learning is going to come from. And again, being patient with each other is we are all learning how to be on both sides of that interaction. It's practice. It's how we get better at it. And I hope you've found a, 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 someone else to learn this stuff with. If you haven't, again, there's only so much you can do. I understand it's hard sometimes to find a connection to somebody else to do it. But when it occurs, that's valuable if you can make it work. And that could include, once again, tell someone else about this video course. It's available out there because I want more people to do it. After these next few sections of non-digital games, just kind of zoom out here again, kind of our, our plan. At the end of quarter two, we'll be looking at, once again, picking another example that you want to share for critique with your classmates to gather thoughts about your group or if you're on reflection time about reflecting on which one do you want to kind of really zero in and think more about and the goal isn't to go make those changes the goal is just to accumulate what would those changes be if you did decide to bring this forward or keep taking it further but at the end of this next quarter it may be one of the ones i talk about over this next few videos it could also be another one from your first set of three or four you've already done and my once again, I'll keep saying because I'm worried somebody else get the wrong idea and get confused about this, which obviously it's an open, open format. Do what you want with it, whether you're alone, whether you're with a group, whether you're using this for a course, do what you want with it. But when I am leading this sort of thing in home team or something, I'm encouraging, even if I spend all day today talking about social, verbal games with words and so on, your prototype doesn't have to be that. I want to add this to your toolkit of things you can think about, things you can use. You might do it two weeks from now. You might do it never. You might decide you want to do another alt control thing because you enjoyed that. 
you might have looked ahead in the schedule and saw there's another kind that interests you. That's okay too. You want to do another real time digital high speed analog prototype or something? Knock yourself out. Prototyping, I want you to have the space to mess around. That's again why I, certainly if I'm ever the one looking at the output and home team or something else where I'm the one administering this, part of my plan, right, is to disregard, to let you disregard which seven out of the 15 do you want me to look at so you can take chances, try stuff, knowing full well if those entire kinds you haven't done, I won't know. And what's important to me is that you're making things that interest you, that align to your strengths and interest in rapid prototyping can be so many different things, so many different people. It's probably a bit of a survey here of different ways to do it. So without further ado, let's z- drill in here on our next topic, which is social and verbal games or games with words. There's a rich history of these as well. So just like there was for alt control, there's a term for this, which is called parlor games. If you look that up, uh, it's a long history of before television and other kind of ways we entertain ourselves, video games. Parlor games were a common way people would entertain themselves in the parlor, in the foyer, in around with people. And you can think, too, if you've ever done these sort of games where you're bored standing in line at a theme park, you're you're just kind of, I don't know, you're sitting there, you're sweating, you're at college orientation, you're onboarding for a job, you just got time to kill, and you've got a buddy to talk to. Some games you can play with your words. Sometimes it's people doing 20 questions or some version of it, and occasionally they'll take it off the rails and say, oh, we're not limiting how many questions you have. Some people add additional rules. It's only yes, no questions only, or you have to answer, you know, multiple choice or however you want to do it. You can come up with rules for this sort of thing. And now you don't see a lot of them anymore because they're basically hard to monetize, right? It's not something where occasionally there's one that designs around and you get a pack of cards as ideas. But if you just have an idea for a game, one thing about it is it's very hard to protect other people from just doing that with their words. But the exciting part is if what interests you anyway is people playing your game, people having access to your game, people around the world tomorrow. I mean, we talk about, again, how nice it is with digital distribution. If I make a freeware prototype project and I put it on the internet, there is so little stopping, at least in concept, in principle, visibility as a challenge notwithstanding, millions of people trying and enjoying it tomorrow. It's even more true for social or verbal games where it's no longer an issue of they're on a Chromebook and it can't run that kind of spec. They're they're on a Mac and only have a PC build. That's still a restriction. That's still a limitation on the digital. As soon as it's verbal, there's people who honestly, and whether it's age demographic or it's part of the world they're living in, whether it's economic class, but there's situations where they just don't have computers that they can still learn and play these kind of games with their classmates, in their classes, in their jobs, in their personal and their social lives, in their dating lives. And all these are interesting cases where, again, if you can come up with a cool game that's easy to explain, easy to grasp, appealing to people that is simply played by, we build a list together. We navigate a conversation together. We're trying to get something where uh, some close friends of mine used to this thing where they would repeat, they would say a word and they're trying to get to saying the same word in as few steps as possible. And so you can do this thing, right? We kind of uh, both will start kind of random and they're trying to converge on where I think you're going with that. And you might compete with someone else or not. This is where also, and I know again, games can get kind of a, a weird definition to explore about. Is it a game? If there's no win condition, if it's a game, there's no winners, a game is no, uh, criteria for success or no score. If you want to make those things for it, cause it feels like it helps to be a game to you, you easily can in the verbal case. It's also okay not to. And I've got an old friend who, who works on an initiative long ago called Not Games. And it's basically just this lens of things that don't have those rule constrictions are valid too, experientially, socially, and especially in this kind of space of social or verbal games. It's often less about who's the winner, who's the best at it. If anything, that becomes a kind of a souring feel to the moment. And it's just something to do to entertain ourselves, to engage with each other. So as with alt control, I don't want to give you too many examples because I'm worried about already the ones that I've cited, I worry, may be inclined to pollute the design space in your head. So my hope is that when you're searching for parlor games, searching for games you can play with your words, you will discover that there's a rich variety out there. Again, you probably haven't heard of them, in part because they're really hard to monetize, because they're hard to protect. No one has invested heavily in their promotion, right? No one ran ads for a certain game that you could use your words to navigate with a friend. But it's such a low barrier to entry. It's not like some of these other things where, okay, well, this prototype kind of sort of works, but in order to really give it scale, to give it reach, well, I got to pay a real artist. I got to pay a real voice actor. I got to, I got to figure out a supplier to print all this cardboard and distribute it for my Kickstarter or something. None of that applies here at all, right? You could come up with in one sitting, a thing that you can do with your words as a game or as a not game, as an activity to play with others. And it can be as done as it's ever going to get. 
How rad is that? How different is that from these other spaces? Which also means, as with throughout the rapid prototyping emphasis we've been discussing, that to let that rapidity of how little you have to spend on it, uh, to let the rapidity of how quickly you can assemble it, mean you don't restrict yourself to, I had one idea and that's it. Right? Why, why limit yourself to that? Have three, have five, have 10, have 20. It's up to you. Depends how far you want to take it. But it's a thing where if you just try several, you might find some patterns. And I like it. We mentioned earlier, I want to borrow a bit from this piece. I like something about that. This one's a little too hard to understand, but I could simplify it by mixing it part of this other thing. And it may be that it's not just really seven equivalent ideas. It's each one building on the ones before it reassembled till you get this kind of Voltron. I've got so many outdated references of uh, Power Ranger, still outdated, of you've just got this assembly of past ideas that you've prototyped. And another thing to also look for for inspiration in this, I, some of my work back in, again, Georgia Tech era under Dr. Brian McGurko was in the improv lab. Now, my side of that was the, using the Connect controller as an interface to engage with virtual actors. He's actually a cognitive scientist. His work was in using AI to simulate the way improv actors think. But the reason I go back to that is because improv actors also have a lot of games that they play. And improv games are a great case in the kinds of things you can do that are purely verbal. Now, sometimes they're a little more of a stretch for not everyone's there socially at the same comfort level. So a thing you might consider there, uh, this came up when I was doing my old uh, the college counselor for a number of years. And one of the things we figured out was that there's sort of a gradient between the types of social games people play when they're new to each other. And that might be your kind of your icebreakers. Okay, say your name and then uh, adjective the same, so the same first letter. Say yourself in a memory. And it can sound like, well, is that a game? But again, it doesn't have to be. You can prototype. It's a verbal interaction you can build on. But there's a gradient from that up towards games that are more, uh, for lack of a better word, intimate or personal in the sense of share a memory that's, you know, meaningful to you. Share something you learned from someone in your family. Share share something that you have a hope about. It's really a vulnerable thing. You probably don't want to lead with that. But being aware of that spectrum can allow you to either say that this is a better match for a certain kind of audience. Or to recognize and challenge yourself to, what if I took this game, could I make a version of it that's a little more intense or a little less intense? Brian Handy was a USC researcher and game student I knew years ago. He made this really, I thought it was a clever, it was a very simple app in terms of the software development side. But again, it's not the measure of importance, is the complexity of it. Where it was basically, if I recall, me and another say person sitting across the table would tell me to challenge me to make a moose sound. The other person has to guess that I'm a moose. And then the other person makes a eagle sound. I got to guess it's an eagle. And then it would just drop some like heavy questions inspired from spiritual insights of 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 just trying to create a conversation after we kind of got some goofiness out of our system, building up to an interesting conversation or tough conversation. So these are all possibilities. And I mentioned earlier, right, they could apply to people who are specifically students, could apply to people who are coworkers, could be meant for, like I mentioned too, it could be a, a dating game. That's a valid thing for if you can come up with a great idea that helps people connect, learn about each other, recognize something in a playful way that they're comfortable, being a little more themselves, speaking up about things that are important to them, that's awesome. And your production costs are zero. Now again, your profit point's probably gonna be zero too. These are remarkably hard to monetize or control as I cannot keep, uh, you know, keep reiterating, but it's a lens on it. And it's also a valuable part, I think, to practice where even if, you know, if all these prototypes I mentioned, you don't have to use the one I'm talking about that day. You could do another digital real time. You could do as another alt control, whatever. I will encourage out of all of them. And this is going to be weird because it's not my main professional background or strength. I would strongly encourage try one of these, even if it's not in your final set you want to keep, even if it's not when you decide to take forward to get feedback on, try it. And one reason why I think it's so valuable is for the same reason why in the graduate games program at Carnegie Mellon Entertainment Technology Center, part of that program's design required their design students, their game developers, to take an improv class, partly to kind of get over and get out of their shell some things that frankly make them better collaborators, better coworkers, better better just people on teams, better leads, more comfortable presenting, helps us get out of our shell. And I know for a lot of us who we have interest in games, myself included, perhaps at some point we're a little more introverted, figure out where in our own spectrum of social comfort would there be something that might help us to an easier way to engage in a conversation with whether it's someone who's a stranger, a first time date, a new friend, a new classmate. If we can come up with an answer, an answer that we can reuse, that we can teach, that we can share, 
incredible potential and it's worth at least trying. This is the value of prototyping. You don't have to succeed at it. You don't have to give yourself a big promise that I'm going to make the thing that's going to fix everyone's social hangups or challenges or quirks or make it easier to meet people. It's a tough bar to beat. But if you can come up with something that's simple and simple is better so I can learn it so I can pass it around so it's more mimetic, it's too complicated. No one's going to repeat it. No one's going to learn it. They're not going to play it correctly anyway. But if you can come up with something, gosh, isn't it worth taking that chance at no cost that you can find a better way to attack those kind of problems? Oh, and I also want to throw out because I a bunch of my teaching and work online is through Zoom, right? I do Zoom breakouts and Zoom networking events and Zoom talks and uh, record my podcast with the live Zoom audience and so on. A lot of the world now knows how to use Zoom or other platforms. But the reason I mentioned Zoom in particular is that you very well could design games like this in a way that is playable in what we call the Brady Bunch view, right? We got your grid of faces, whether it's four people, nine people, 16, 25, depending on the platform that you're on. One reason why I find Zoom is nice for this is that it is a platform that, at least the current version of it, allows you to rearrange screens. So not everybody realizes this, but everyone's in a different order on each other's screens, which means if you try to point to the person to your right, everyone sees a different person. That makes sense? But you can use Zoom to click and rearrange screens, which means that you can canonically have someone declare themselves the master screen and then rearrange themselves. So you can read out in order. She can read out in order. They can read out in order to position yourself so you're in the same arrangement. So now you can actually sort of play a game of pass something up, pass something to the right. And again, it could involve a bit of a spatial component. It could involve a verbal component of who's next. It could involve next note in a song, next lyric, and trying to do some sort of exquisite corpse type zigzag of I'm going to try to complete a sentence off the person before me. But you can do those sort of things in this kind of platforms digitally, which makes them accessible to your friends who live elsewhere in the world, to people who may not be able to get out into physical spaces, or could easily just as well be adapted, perhaps, to physical spaces as well. In addition, carried online, just like people who play the werewolf game as another example these kind of social verbal games that's a more complex one so that's an interesting one okay so if you don't know the werewolf game again you can look up the details and maybe spell it out to you all but the uh just being you've got a crowd of people who are playing together and there are people who are secretly certain roles and they're trying to kind of deduce who keeps picking off the villagers and so on so there's there's potential for some depth there that's a good probably upper end of depth to explore to read about and then go prototype hopefully i hope one of these social verbal games with words and it ended on a bit of a wild card for, let's say that these games where you're just talking to people still feel a little too intense. You'd feel more comfortable, something a little more action oriented. I respect that. I'm a little bit the same way. Some people also find it easier to play a sport together, shoot paintballs at each other than just to talk to each other. I get it. So if you're finding that when you're just talking about it, it doesn't quite kind of resonate with you and you want to start to kind of branch a little bit more into, all right, what if I was also, what if we we're throwing something at each other? There's a surprising amount of board games that now increasingly ship with some sort of soft thing to throw at each other as part of how the rules work, how someone gets tagged out, what happens when a certain card combination happens. And as long as it's playful, harmless, not going to damage or destroy anything or hurt anybody. So I want to show you there's another lens or option here in the social verbal parlor games. But if it helps, browse for examples of parlor games, read up about improv actor games, see if it inspires some ideas of something you might want to experiment, start prototyping, ideally more than one to pick out out of those remember to document your process what did you disregard how'd you get to the one you feel best about see what you can come up with I look forward to seeing what you have whether it's this or another kind of prototype but anyway look forward to catching you on the next video where i'll be discussing analog prototyping which is going to be a combination of both some things that we can do for mock-ups in physical space on a whiteboard very efficiently before we spend time energy on a computer it's an advantage to why we do things that way as well as also for turn-based games which is a very popular topic for a lot of people it's not my core strength as designer so i don't have as much to say about it Lots of new things we'll talk about next time for analog prototyping. So I'll see you then. Not sure if you caught it in my previous video at the end of it. I was having a little kind of doubts creep in about which section I was doing combined. So basically before and when I was giving an overview of this course, I probably had turn based board games as separate from the other analog prototyping. I've decided to merge those together on the fly here. That's how we're doing it. Uh, but I'll still be keeping another section here in this quarter. It's going to be more about sports design. And it's going to be a fun one where they're going to have so little to say, but I think it's going to speak for itself largely. It'll be a fun activity as well. So anyway, on to analog prototyping, which again, I got a disclaimer, is not my strength. There are some exceptional workshops, books, speakers about analog prototyping. Uh, you might check out the work by Katie Sather and Eric Zimmerman. They have a great classic textbook about this. You might look at some of the resources by Tracy Fullerton and Ian Schreiber uh, and Brenda or uh, Brenda Romero, formerly Brenda Braithwaite, depending on what year the books were published from. 
There's a lot of great details out there about analog prototyping. It is not my core strength, but I want to try to, is it can add to your tool set some overview things that you can be aware of in your ways to do rapid prototyping are an equally valid part of our practice. So one of these, and I alluded to it many videos ago, is an interface flow. There's a common thing where people are trying to figure out how to even get into the game, how to go when they're stuck on a certain question, when they're trying to change a certain setting. And it's possible to wire all that up with a computer to have someone test it. But before you do, it's often much easier if you literally just get a pack of index cards or a ream of paper and you draw on it with a marker what you have in mind. You can do the thing that is again called Wizard of Ozing, where you put a page in front of somebody, you say, okay, well, go here, go there. You know, what would you do? Okay, let me see how you navigate it. Oh, you're stuck in this menu. And the fact that we're doing it manually, part of what's nice about that is let's say I'm even testing three, four, five different people with it. If I immediately have an idea of another way to arrange those menus, I don't have to even change anything on a computer. I can just make a note to myself that now a different connection is made and I Wizard of Oz it a little differently. Next time when they touch this, I just jump them straight to this other screen. How does that feel? It's also something where I'm reminded of a buddy who worked on physical hardware design for a while. And what he would talk about was how when they were doing washers and dryers, when they were doing microwaves, and you know, they all have got a confusing grid of buttons. One of the processes that are recommended to identify where should certain be buttons be on that interface is to give people the interface with no buttons labeled and then ask them, heat up popcorn or ask them, wash something delicate. And which buttons do most people's fingers seem to gravitate towards to feel like, yeah, top right or bottom of this list? And it's another interesting way to involve in a rapid prototyping scenario, listening to the users, because whatever makes sense to your mind is less important than what makes sense to theirs. And it doesn't even, there might not be any rational rhyme, reason, or sense to why they feel like confirm is on this side. It might be a side effect of how many of them that happen to be your customers or users use Windows versus PC since they swap those OK and cancel buttons. Who knows? But it's an example of where you can utilize an interface even before you've put the words on it to ask people how they feel like it should be navigated to see what they do and to inform as long as they have an expectation. So a little bit of setup about this is what's going on here. You might surprise yourself with some findings that, again, give you a basis for I don't know why, but two thirds of people thought that quitting should be in this corner, not that corner. We'll put it up there. And it's a way to make sure you're listening to and reflective in a way that feels intuitive to people in a way that I can know can be like a wishy-washy in a design to say, oh, it's intuitive. That's why I'm doing it. I have a grad advisor who always warned against this as a practice. But there are things that people currently at this moment in time in this cultural snapshot of who is using and doing certain things for whatever reason have maybe certain unspoken, hard to articulate, hard to explain biases. Systems like this can help us identify those to figure out what comes naturally to them or what conventions make sense to them from other menus that they've been using and which other games they play, which you could try to ask and analyze those games, or you can do this exercise, giving them blank buttons, Wizard of Ozing, and figure out making some notes on which ones are people gravitating towards for which kind of operations that they're trying to do in our menus, whether it's for inventory management, whether it's for starting the game, whether it is for navigating how a rule book works, different ways you can kind of structure it and figure out what makes sense to people. So I know I said this would be a shorter video because I am less of a specialist in it. And again, wasn't kidding. So a few things, right? For recommended viewing, I don't even know board game design well enough to recommend to you which videos are a great thing to go check out. I don't have anything my own research point to. I'm familiar with some other great talks. It's hard for me to even gauge. So what I'm going to suggest is go search for a free internet talk. It could be in the GDC vault, the one some of those are free right on YouTube or so on about board game design. Browse for one that really speaks to your interest with designers or the games they worked on perhaps speak to your interest learn a lens there into board game design. Again, it's part of what's nice about even if you find your way back into doing this stuff on digital games, be another lens for you to bring to it. Now, we mostly talked here about analog implementation for prototypes related to digital space, because again, that's where most of our work is. But I do want to suggest two immediately usable ways of doing game design for board game prototyping that you can act on pretty much immediately. And so the first of these, like I hinted at from the very introduction, you can basically get an existing set of something, existing poker hand, deck of cards, existing chessboard, existing game of boggle, which has its little shaky letters in there, and then try to find another way to reuse those pieces. And in the case of obviously a boggle, it'd be much harder to get away with 
you probably can't resell that if you're using there's a very probably patented thing going on there. In the case of cards, in the case of an 8x8 board, there's a lot of ways where people can obtain that. And if you can come up with rules that leverage it, then you've got a game which can be massively distributed, even as a prototype, for testing. So let's say it's something where I have an idea for a game I want to test. And this is, again, you might be following this online, I assume, perhaps with peers who live in other countries. And so it's also where digital might be easier for you to interact with each other. But if you can come up with it, it's okay. I figured out a thing where I buy a checkerboard. And then I add a third kind of piece. Maybe I get a cheap pack of earplugs and I put those on the board like pieces. And now there's some sort of rule about how our pieces can interact with those earplugs. Those don't have to be the final piece design, but you now have a prototype that you then can distribute to anybody anywhere else in the world. Your friend who's in Scandinavia, your peer group who's on the Discord somewhere else in the world to say, hey, all it takes is a standard board. They're not, they don't have to be expensive or fancy. And then anything you can put on those, they don't have to even be little earpieces. It could be just miscellaneous, anything, scraps of torn paper, they can still play and you can test out getting their feedback and their experience from it in a very straightforward way. That's harder if you have custom boards. Now, if you do want to go for custom boards, they're still very affordable, simple ways to Now, obviously, in case you go with saying, you could draw anything on your computer in a program like Photoshop or Photopia, print it out. That could be a board. It's also very easily distributed. But another thing I've also found kind of as a fun exercise was I went to a Home Depot a hardware store and just browsed. They have these little samples of tiles. They're maybe like half a foot by maybe a foot or so of different patterns of long and short squares of hexagons of colors and patterns. And so what we did for an assignment was actually for class led by Celia Pierce, who again is uh, these days an instructor at Northeastern. I bought one of those and I used that for my board game and I came up with rules based on lightness or darkness of the color blue on the tiles or about adjacency on the tiles or about the black tiles had a certain they were impassable or something. And it's just a way to kind of get you out of your head about thinking about symmetry or about working from things you've seen before. It's a nice way to go kind of browse. If you start looking at those little, they're not very expensive because you're not buying to cover your entire floor, right? It's just a little sample like you might buy to take home and hold up to something. But they give you a lot of options and it might be harder again to reproduce than playing on a chessboard or checkerboard but they might lead you to new ideas about emergent ways your mechanics can interact with that play field. It might be more dynamic, more varied, have a more of an interesting asymmetry to it of it's easier for players starting on one side. Maybe they have a different set of pieces or different set of rules that they're operating from. And it's also where you can repurpose other things. So just as much as we did for the alt control where we use an existing mouse, potentially or existing controller, or existing keyboard in a different way than usual, a different screen or iPhone or VR controller in a different way than usual. Another one of the projects that I worked on, we took a magic eight ball sawed it in half, carefully drained the ink and got the uh, 20-sided icosahedron. Is that the right word for what's in there? 20-sided die from it that you could roll. And it turns out there's an interesting pattern on that. There's 10 positives, 5 negatives, and 5 neutrals. We're able to leverage that in part of our games. Now, of course, I realized afterwards there was a neat novelty to having that custom piece that I happened to know was a 20-sided, 10 yes, 5 no, 5 so-so. But realistically, there was no reason to have sewn, sewn across the uh, eight ball and got the thing out of there because it could have been used exactly the same if we had just played with an eight ball and turned it upside down, right? Which, in fact, is actually easier to read because of the ink fits on it. But this all goes back to say you can adapt pieces. You can customize things. You can look for ways to use something in a non-obvious way if it's part of your prototyping kit to work from whatever's in arm's reach. And if you don't have the same things to reach to somebody else, all the better. And then one last note I want to mention about this space where part of what led me early on into digital was again it appealed to me that's why i keep echoing this thought i love the idea that i make a digital thing i've had digital games played by seven million people around the world and i just couldn't conceive of reaching a whole bunch of players with something where i had to have printing costs and distribution and are they being warehoused somewhere and are they getting shipped to all the different addresses and the logistics to me just seemed mind-boggling but one of the people who worked on a pretty popular pretty successful board game, card game, called Secret Hitler. Uh, I think Mike Boxleiter is the guy's name. He used to be an indie game developer, and some other people worked on the project as well who had also some digital indie game experience as well. Partly what they realized was that when you are printing paper and boxes and shipping those, that can also be pretty affordable. The cost per unit is also surprisingly low, especially at scale. And so he still was able to make a business opportunity out of it. It's also a case where even though, again, business isn't our main point in prototyping and thinking about what to even start down, where might it lead? It has certainly been the case that for many crowdfunding platforms, 
digital games have gotten harder and harder to successfully crowdfund. Board games have continued to, that's still a stronger space for them. And part that's been so nice about that as a model for board games in particular is realizing there's going to be certain upfront costs to print, to distribute, to so on, that if we can't justify a certain number of people to go check it out and try it, to pay for it, then we're not going to bother to produce it past the prototype that we tried locally. And again, this is a successful use of those kind of platforms in which, just like we talked about, the function of the prototype is that, is this worth moving forward? And the answer may be no. That could still be time energy well spent. If you organize a Kickstarter to say, well, this board game is only worth mass producing if we can sell X number of copies. Do we have that many buyers waiting for us? If they say no, you didn't fail. You succeeded. That's part of rapid prototyping. It's part of prototyping is to size up. Did we have the audience for us? We don't. Perfect. We didn't waste three or four years on this. We can go spend our energy and time on something else. So again, I know commercial isn't our main point here. We're often talking much earlier in the pipeline, but I do want to encourage when thinking about board games and board game prototyping, it doesn't just have to be a local one-off or a custom thing. And then you kind of accept that there are surprisingly interesting ways it can scale, including I've also known, I think you're indicated we've had some finalists in that festival who they sell a board game on itch.io as a PDF that you print out and follow the rules for. There are so many interesting ways to distribute board games that are not as obvious as I go to the store, there's a shelf of them. So even though it's not my world, I want to encourage, check those out. And again, my encouraged watch, I literally can't even point to the right direction for a single one. Uh, but I wanted you to go explore, find yourself a board game design talk online, free, ideally to watch. There's probably some really quality ones in the GDC vault that are on YouTube or elsewhere. There's some awesome voices out there doing this stuff. I can't even help you navigate it, but I'm sure you'll go find something interesting. Bring it back to your mental tool set, ways you can apply it to other kinds of design patterns, things you're doing. And also, uh, yeah, so we talked about the prototype for next time. Oh, and the next time, like I say, it's going to be the shortest probably video in the whole set because it's very much kind of an ad hoc and improv like, oh, we should include this too. But as part of our analog, our non-digital section, I want to touch on sports design. There's an interesting question that intrigues me about that. And it's going to be pretty, pretty short. You'll be impressed how short it is. I'll catch you next video. Welcome back. This is going to be our shortest session of me talking at you because this is so far outside my strengths, far even further than board games, card games, etc. But I want to touch upon it as another lens you can bring to your prototyping experience, to your game design thinking, and that is sports or athletics. And as with our examples of using board game pieces or reusing board game pieces in other ways or mixing and matching across different sets, recognizing that you can certainly leverage a soccer ball, a basketball, a football, a baseball, potentially a baseball glove, potentially a hockey stick. There are existing equipment and pieces. Again, it comes down to if you have a little bit of a budget to spend in the class, you could. You don't have to. You certainly don't have to. You might even actually have access to or could borrow one because you're not going to be destroying it. A way to try to work on a different way to play a sport. Now, part of my theory is so fascinating to me as a designer is in some ways less about there's a whole sports culture, which we know this is far from that, right? You're not going to have stadiums and fans. You're not going to have professional teams and sponsors and all that because it's just, it won't be a thing yet. But thinking about why and how, out of all the different things that we could design as people, why there aren't more kinds of sports. Those barriers that make it so that there's kind of a handful we can collectively wear. But no, mostly there's more esoteric ones. There's historical ones. There's regional variations. But... At a high level, there's such a handful that hasn't grown in proportion necessarily to the human population, that there's this bizarre critical mass happening in our attention about how many we can hold collectively before, well, we're at saturation that's as many as my brain is going to hold on to. And yet, kind of like earlier, and maybe it's the same reasoning, how easy, how seamless it is to distribute the idea of a verbal game. A thing you can play with your words, with someone else standing in line, someone else is waiting with you, a classmate waiting for an instructor to start show up or something. How easy it would seem that plenty of cultures in the world, you can give them a soccer ball, you can give them a football, a baseball, tennis ball. After what age, people stop doing unusual things with it. They start to only do the thing you're supposed to do with it. And so I'm going to kind of encourage here, if you want to try to do a sports type prototype, and not to be anything extreme or anything intense, right? You're not trying to be the world's best at it. This is a prototype. It's just a prototype. It's an invitation to start to try to put yourself back in that mindset of when you were a little kid and you have a ball and you didn't know what you're supposed to do with it, you did something else with it. Maybe you saw how high you could bounce it. Maybe you just tried to see who could keep the thing in the air longer in a ping pong table. 
taking something like that a little step further. If you're not in a situation where you're able to meet with others physically to play a sport like this, it's again okay to also design a solitary or solo experience, but it is something where to prototype, you can't just write down the rules and feel like you've done it. You need to actually play this with people. And so one of my friends, Andrew Quitmeyer, also he was a researcher. He finished his PhD and went on to do hacking in the wild type things. He created a game with some friends called Night Ball, where they went out to the park and we would play with a ball. And I don't remember what the rules were. It was a little almost like a Calvin Ball type situation. But the rules can emerge collaboratively in a way that's so much somehow more natural with a physical object between you. You don't even necessarily have to have, right? I was, I was a wrestler in high school and we had certainly no ball or equipment in that aside from a mat and some shoes and a singlet. But in many people's cases, it's going to help them have an object of their focus, whether it's a team activity, a one-on-one activity, a solo activity. This is your invitation to add to your repertoire of things you've at least tried, knowing full, this might wind up in your set of things you don't move forward, but maybe it will. And if you're not feeling very rough and tumble, it could also just be a different kind of physical activity about balancing, about stacking things. It's an invitation to go outside of our board game thinking, to go outside of our digital spaces, and to think bigger about our full use of bodies about full use of space potentially and obviously notwithstanding comfort level and what people find is appropriate and so on you know there's a range from twister like we talk about of uh in even a verbal game people's vulnerability being aware of that obviously in a sport kind of context but it doesn't have to be a high intensity get sweaty thing to still fit in this kind of mold of physical embodied activities for athletics so that's really the whole thought for the day is to go pro that one of those again no clear recommendations here of go video to watch um, aside from perhaps what I might suggest is, uh, I don't know if there's a sport in the world you've heard of, but you never played or knew how it worked, cricket or something else as an example that, say, outside call, you know groups I grew up with. Go watch a video of it to kind of inspire you some other ideas. Get yourself outside your mindset of the world, the handful of the activities that you haven't been most exposed to or play growing up. And then as a reminder, next time we'll be starting off or I'll be between periods encouraging you to either with peers or on your own, either critique to practice showing one of your projects you've done so far. It doesn't have to be from the last batch. It could be from any you've done so far. It's not one you already showed. To invite critique, to talk about your process, to seek some feedback, to listen to how other people are thinking about it. And hopefully it goes without saying, but I'll see if they can play it to give them a chance to play it and potentially observe them playing it. And by the way, when you're doing that, minimize how much you're telling them how to play it. Like you might have to give a little bit of setup because obviously it's a prototype. But the more you can let them try to figure it out, sometimes the better in terms of figuring out what they're actually going to do might be a better reflection than what someone who's also not being coached by you might do. The easy trap of falling to when doing testing. So that critique is encouraged between times. Again, if you don't have a group you're studying with, if you don't have a class you're studying with, then at least sort of engage in a moment of reflection here on picking what's your project so far, would you next pick for this? And to give it your own kind of second set of eyes and a little bit of time potentially has passed, even if it's this most recent example, of figuring out what might you change to it next if you decide to take this one forward. Not that you're expected to have to go and do that, but if you did decide to, what would that be? And next time I'll catch you for our next video in the series where we're talking about breaking into kind of some much moving things forward out of just prototype scrap test zone into thinking about curation and narrowing down what we've worked on so far to what to take forward, team collaboration, uh, what it means to work with other people, how that can really kind of raise the stakes. And again, kind of in a maybe a sampler platter here if you start to do sort of a collaborative sport creation, but a version of that for even the project we've worked on so far, what would it mean to involve someone else with it or vice versa? Developing a prototype into something more publicly releasable of a section on that in this next uh, quarter of videos. And so basically green lighting, collaborations, taking things forward, um, realizing too that again, each week you're still encouraged to have a prototype. So even if a section isn't specifically about a particular prototyping approach to draw upon one we've already had or one you found somewhere else to produce another prototype between every single week, out of which if I'm the one responsible to look at it in home team or something, I'm going to be looking at about half, say seven of the 15 that you produce. But again, general prototyping practice, make a bunch, keep the best, throw away and bury or hide the rest. I'll see you next time for the video on curation and narrowing down the things we've done so far at the start of this next quarter. And again, encourage, uh, be ready for critique with your group if you are meeting on Zoom or in person or something. Otherwise, if you're going solo, take a moment to reflect on what you've done, pick a best example so far, think about what you do next for it. See you next time. All right, so hopefully we've been having lots of fun here in our course, and this is now a good part. If you're catching this video, if you're first coming into this video, we're pretty far into the series. We're over halfway through. There's a playlist link in the description or somewhere else, depending on how you found this, that'll take you back to the high overview to figure out where you are here. Now, what we're talking here about in this video is going to be curation or narrowing things down. 
And this can be a bit challenging because this is something where we've been probably having a lot of fun, making a lot of stuff, creative, outpouring. And now we're starting to kind of strike some things off and figure out, well, that just wasn't it. This just wasn't the one to really spend more time on, which again is tough. It's uncomfortable. It's about like editing your writing. I put it there for a reason. I wanted that there. Okay, well, unfortunately, our best stuff is still going to overshadow our less good stuff. And if we can get things out of the way, it'll avoid distracting people from the better work on a forefront. Right. I think if you only show people your final drafts, you kind of can look more like a genius. It's a similar case here. If you don't show people the prototypes that were never that great, you're going to look like you're a better designer. This is something that I had actually learned from. I think it was a marketing guy at one of the studios who was ex my ex Nintendo. And apparently, at least he said from his vantage point of his projects and going to be anonymous here about who this person was. And it was long enough ago. But basically that they started a ton of projects for everyone that they released, that they have a massive count of just projects internally that never even get announced because they do a lot of stuff and then only release the cream of the crop. And so that curation is important. Now, one challenge of this, though, is that when you've been doing stuff, at least the way I've been kind of talking about these different strategies for rapid prototyping, they might be wildly different, wildly different. Maybe at this point, if you've been really kind of following my suggestions, you might have a sport, you might have a board game, you might have a digital game, you might have a marble game in real time. You could have an improv game. How do you even compare those to figure out what's your best thing? And fortunately, there's an answer for this, right? There's an answer for it. But first, I want to kind of get zero in our need for it. And that is that if in case we lose the thread on why this is so important to us, the reason you order sampler platters to figure out what to order for real next time, right? You don't want to be someone who just goes every single time, gets a sampler platter. You go to figure out, okay, well, I've tried them all out of which this is my favorite one. That's part of our curation work we're doing for our players. Part of our work is to figure out for them Okay, well, of all the things it could be, what would it be for them? And if we're, I've seen designers who kind of get a little bit lazy about it, and that what they'll do is that instead of making a decision, they'll leave it as open as an option where they're like, well, any of these could be good, so I'll let the player decide. And this becomes a little bit too much like if you go to order some fries and they're asking you, how long should the fries be? And you're like, I, I need you to worry about that, right? I'm here to enjoy some fries. And so we want to simplify for them. Unless you're genuinely making something that is a crafting experience, an authoring process, a level editing tool, or some pipeline like that, like Super Mario Maker, then as much as possible, it is on you to do the legwork and figure out which ones are better. And so we have to have a good process for doing that. Another lens that I've seen for this that's going to, I think, a helpful memorable way to picture just why this is so important is there's an old saying that what makes an art gallery is what they don't put on the walls. Right? It's all the other stuff. It's that white space between the paintings. If they put everything in there, anybody who just had an idea and wants to put it in the art gallery... No one's going to go. We'll not have that cultural weight that it does. So it's tough. And again, it's part of the nice thing about our documentation. Part of what's so important to me, documentation, is that most of these projects will probably never see the light of day. We'll never reach a wider audience. We'll never interest anybody else besides you. Maybe who else worked on it. Maybe your friends or family. But because you documented it so thoroughly, you took pictures, you took notes, you made observations about what would you do next with it. You wrote down the rules or otherwise. You didn't lose it. So you can safely... Leave it behind and know that it still exists. And if you want to go back and read about it later, you didn't, it's not totally forgotten. It still exists in the world, just in a different way. Okay, having established the need, now the solution for it, thankfully, is one I've done a couple videos on before. I'm going to grab one of those videos here. A bit like if I was giving you a PDF chunk of my own textbook is basically what this is. So here's inserted another video I've prepared in advance from another time. Give me a talk about how the matrix decision making process works. And again, the lens I want you watching this from is figuring out, okay, well, you've got a bunch of different prototypes of very different kinds. And you got to think about what are your criteria you're filtering them on. It'll make sense after you check out this video. The next thing we're going to plan is how to kick off a podcast based on interviews. But before we do that, we're going to do a little side exercise that's also a pretty universal skill. It's how we can make a decision in an informed, rational way, either alone or working closely with members of a team. And it's a really great technique. So we're going to use it for the podcast. We use the same thing to set decide what to make your YouTube channel about, which book to read, which game to make next. It's the same technique we use for all these things, including let's say you've got a small business, which project to pursue. All of these are techniques you can use. In fact, I've used the same thing to figure out which apartment to move to next. So it's going to involve a spreadsheet, which I, you may not love spreadsheets. We're going to do some pretty simple spreadsheeting. It'll evolve. I'll teach the basics as we go here. I'm going to be using Google Sheets. Honestly, obviously, you could use Excel. You could use whatever numbers or whatever Apple calls their version of this stuff. And we'll just say which podcast episode or podcast topic to do. Just titling here. 
And the gist of it is along the left side, we're going to have our options first. And so what are some different options we might do? And just thinking about kind of my own basis here for possible topics I might do. So I'm vegan. You may or may not care, but there's an audience of people out there who look for vegan related stuff. I've been vegan for 20 years. Game development, right? And maybe there's actually more than one kind of game dev, right? There's kind of game dev, I don't know, advanced topics. There's kind of game dev intro level. There, any you know, kind of angle it could take, but subcategories there. I might do when it's just kind of buddies having fun. And that's a whole genre of podcasts where it's just people who kind of talk and laugh and get along. And, you know, one of people listen to the stuff is it kind of, I don't know, gives a sense of some good energy around you. Or maybe when a bar elements their personality, whatever it is. It's another kind of podcast. And we could pick a whole other kind of kind if we wanted to. We could do one about small business. Or, uh, I don't know, I've got an interest in stoicism, right? One of my audio books is a modernization I did of Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. So there's a few different topics we might do. And you can have as many rows as you want. Along the top, we're going to figure out, okay, as we're looking at these, if I was to pick one over another, what are different factors I would base that decision in? So, for example... Something different to say about it. Now, by the way, by default, it's not going to wrap. Let's wrap it here. Going to our cell wrap. There we go. In fact, I'm going to select this whole row and apply wrap because any of these I want to wrap. So do I have something different to say about it? Would it be fun to do? And this is important because I want to be able to sustain it, especially I'm not doing these in particular looking for sponsors or commercial reach or something so if it's not fun, if I don't find something that I can enjoy doing, I'm not going to keep doing it. What, now, careful about this. Watch this. Is the niche not oversaturated? Now, I put not in there for a subtle reason. What it is is that the way we're going to do this is we're going to score them in a way that higher number should be better. It's going to make this simpler if positive, bigger number is always better. So what this means is that, say, on a one to five scale, five means it's very not saturated. So five is good. If we can make these so one is bad or zero is bad and five is good, that's going to be simpler because we're not going to have to reverse the effects when we tally them up. So if you think of something, okay, it's better to have the opposite of that. You can throw the not in there. So something different about it. Would it be fun for me to do? Is it not oversaturated? Do I have a way to easily reach potential audience or guests? And now this can be a bit careful because, I mean, this is a case where we can kind of wind up stuck in our niche. But, for example, I've got, as we'll see, a lot more game developer connections than I do other vegans in my network or stoic people in my network or even small business people to put us together with. So we can have as many columns as we want. We'll just pick four, be simpler to start with. And now as we're thinking through this, we're going to look at the intersection of each piece for this topic in that category. And again, I'm going to go one to five, but we could do zero to one. You could do one to 10. You could do zero to 100. It kind of doesn't matter as long as you're consistent. Eyeballing these, estimating. It's okay if they're imperfect. The whole reason we're doing this is so we can just have a starting point to narrow down our choices. So do I have something different to say about veganism? I've been doing it for, for 20 years, so that's pretty substantial. I don't know how unique that is among vegans, but uh, four game advanced topics. Uh, I did grad school in it, so I care a lot about it. Plenty of things to say. Intro. A lot of beginners, but he's having fun. I don't have a lot to add to that conversation. I don't say there's a bad shows. I'm saying I don't know what to do with that. Small business. Uh, I do a lot of weird, interesting online, different kinds of business. And stoicism, probably not. There's people who have a lot more basis in the history of philosophy and could comment on it more uh, sort of an academic level than what I do. Uh, would it be fun for me to do veganism? Uh, I got 20 years of talking about it was enough for me. Um, advanced topics. Yeah, it interests me. It excites me. Intro level. Uh, similar. Um, actually, you know what? Same. Buddies having fun. Yeah, that'd be fun. The whole idea being just, just catching up with friends or whatever. Small business. I do like talking about it. Stoicism. I don't know. Again, it interests me. I care about it, but not super fun. Is the intro saturated for veganism? Now, this is where I could base this on real data. I could go to some sort of survey, some Googling, some searching Spotify and Apple iTunes and whatever, but I'm just going to kind of guess. Um, this one, weirdly, so the interesting thing about this too is that many of these shows aren't going anymore they used to be but they have been cold for a while some didn't recover from covid some stopped away before that when people kind of go through a stage of their careers when they do a podcast and they kind of figure out they want to do other stuff so this is actually not as oversaturated as it seems and uh honestly similar to a lesser degree for intro level there's just kind of oh there's always more people who are listening for intro level stuff than more advanced stuff it's just it's a percentage of the population who's at that level 
but he's having fun. I think it is super oversaturated. There's plenty of shows that's just Jeff and Jane or whatever. Small business, I, I'll be honest. So much of my first intro, no, it's, it is oversaturated. Much of the first podcast I listened to were in a cross-country drive. A lot of it was small business. There were so many podcasts about small business. So that's just not a space of like being in stoicism. Uh, it's hard to say. I don't know. I'm going to put a three because I genuinely don't even have a guest. And right now, I don't want to sidetrack to research it. Do I easily have ways to reach potential audience or guests? So for this, right, I wrote an uh, audiobook, ebook about it, modernizing some old material so I could actually reach that list of people who have already picked that up. Uh, small business. Less so. I mean, I've got a Twitter following, but it's mostly more game dev following. Game dev being the following that I mostly reach. Uh, buddies having fun. I, I just don't know who I put it in front of, except other people like on my Facebook feed, which is uh, balance of three. And then vegan again. I, I, I used to be a part of some vegan networks and stuff. Not really anymore. Now, the reason why I put these numbers down is twofold. One, because we can now base a score on the sum of those. Equals sum. And now I can use shift and arrows or click and drag to fill in those numbers. And it's going to suggest we autofill. I'm going to not because I just show you also I can just drag it. And this is just the sum of those numbers. In a way, we can kind of get a clue from looking at our scores, what's higher, what's lower. And from that, narrow down to what are the top few. Now, we don't necessarily have to take the very top choice here, being the advanced topics. And of course, we could do filters, we could do sorting sheet by, but we're not even going to get that deep into it because we can, especially for this number of options, we just kind of eyeball and see what are our leaders, what are our lower ones. Now, another thing we'd also do, slightly more advanced technique, it may not even affect the results in this case, but we can also weight those factors. So I'm going to insert another row above. And let's say out of these factors, based on my priorities, which of these are more or less important than others? So I'm going to start with saying each one of these is one, just being default. And let's say that I really, my goal with this is to reach a bigger audience. That's something that's important to me. I want to reach a bigger audience. So that reason, it's going to be especially important if you do have something unique to add to that conversation. I'm not just doing it only for fun. It's important to me that it's fun also, but more important that I have something unique to say. Do I care if it's oversaturated? And maybe not half as important to me if it's oversaturated, just not as worried about it, especially if I feel like I've got something unique to add. Well, then this is half as important or again, proportionally I'm saying that this score will be four times as important as that one, right? Half goes into two, four times. And do I have a way to easily reach audience? Again, if I want to reach a big audience, again, I might say this is important. 1.5, sure. 50% more important than my default. It would be fun for me to do. Now, the way we take those numbers, there's different ways that we could write this out in a spreadsheet. There's the thing called some product we could use, but we're just going to actually instead manually do this because I want to show a little uh, trick as kind of an overstatement here a thing about using spreadsheets. So I'm going to say equals, and I'm going to click on this element, that intersection, times the score. So again, it's going to say that one's worth twice as many, plus that element times the score, plus next element times the score, so four times half, plus that element times the score. And now if this is all that I did, and I pressed enter, that works for that row, but if I drag it down, it's going to be a disaster. These aren't right because when it moved that row down, it also moved down. It's the reason it says no value is it can't get numbers from these. It's not keeping the multiplications on the top row. And the real simple, again, trick is an overstatement for this, but the real simple fix for this in a spreadsheet, you see the number one that corresponds to row run along the top. If I put a dollar sign in front of each one, and you could do the same thing in front of a letter if that's what you're going to hold. But by putting a dollar sign in front of each one, when I drag it down now, each one of these I click on will keep the top row at the top row. The dollar sign says when I drag the row, don't change that piece. Simple trick. And again, so it may not have actually majorly affected that these are still the top two winners. This one actually even slightly edges out the others. And then the others, I can then figure out, okay, well, which one's already worth considering? Buddy's having fun, small business. And so this is probably not the ones for me to even consider further. I can then look at other factors or this is part of where it's great, where if you're not necessarily the team lead or CEO or solo project, you have a whole team of people. What this does is it gets your reasoning externalized. It creates an opportunity to look at this information and say, do we disagree on how fun that would be? Do we disagree on how important this factor is related to the others? And because we've done it with a spreadsheet, we can change that. We can say, actually, you know what? It's, it's even more important to me. That it's not oversaturated. Let's make that one more important and see, does that skew our results? Does that change at the top or the bottom? And depending on how we ranked our tables and what factors we did, it may or may not. Even deciding which factors are we deciding on 
is itself a conversation. And we could even try testing out, okay, well, what if we took this entire factor and decided, you know what? I think this is a silly consideration. You've, you've, you've persuaded me after talking about it. I shouldn't be worried about this at all. Zero. I can now see the same results minus that factor because it's zeroed out these results in the sums. And this real simple tool is also what we've had where say we had a, for Indicate for a bunch of years, I helped organize speakers for about 85, 90 of those workshops and sessions and talks and things for industry, game industry events. We'd often have a panel of people, sometimes two of us, sometimes four, five, six, or seven of us, deciding which talk submissions or potential speakers to invite to bring in to build out that schedule. And so what we can do in these cases is for each one of these, a member of that committee having their own column, having read the bio description, talk presentation summary thesis of each person who'd submitted a talk or been being in consideration for those spots could score. Okay, well, to me, I say a five to them, you know, maybe a one or two out of these different options, which we can then still sum, we can then still sort on to look at what are the top choices, at the very least to narrow down the conversation to these few. And in the process, we can also then again externalize hey, I noticed you put a two on that one. I thought it was a five. What are you seeing that I'm not or vice versa? And enables us to have a concrete decision to say, okay, after we've talked about it, I want to update my score to a four. I'm on the same page. You're right. I totally missed that part of this. But this is the same way we can also use to have big committees making decisions, to have groups come to a unified decision as a team about what to do next. It's a way I commonly tackle when someone has different games they want to build which game to tackle next. It might be how prepared do I seem, how much we're going to learn from it, if there were about commercial potential or not, how much does that factor in? And in the process, we get really clear about why am I doing this project, how important are different factors to me. And I'll also say, occasionally I'll find people working on this kind of exercise and they realize as they're doing it, they kind of want to, okay, well, you know what? Advanced topics is showing up as higher. I really, the more I look at this, the more I want it to be that one. I want to do intro level instead. And that one's higher. And they'll start kind of fussing with the numbers a little bit. They'll start kind of changing. You know what? Now I think more about it. Maybe this is uh, not as oversaturated as I thought or something. Now, here's the deal, right? You don't have to convince this spreadsheet. It really doesn't matter. It's like there's this old thing. If you're trying to make a decision and you flip a coin, heads this, tails that. Midair before it even lands. If you can decide which way you hope it lands before it lands. Oh, I really hope this comes down tails. You've just made your decision and just ignore the coin. The point was to make a decision. And in the process of formulating this, if we start to realize is that oh, I'm really, the more I think about it, the more I'm just feeling this one, which coincidentally is why that's the podcast I've been running now for seven years is Home Team Game Dev Podcast. But if I'm really feeling that one again, I don't need to fuss with the numbers to make the case. I can say out of the top two or three, especially if it's kind of, you know, close enough. Well, then that's the one I want to go with. And again, especially if you are a lead, if you're solo or something, you can make those kind of moves. With the team though, too, you might still feel like, okay, well, when considered across all the different possibilities, you don't necessarily need to fight with a spreadsheet to wrangle it into the answer you want to prove. You can just have narrowed it down to, okay, well, we went from having 100 ideas, 50 ideas, 20 ideas. We did a sort on the data. We did a filter. And then from that, figured out that these are the ones that were worth discussing. We had a conversation. From the conversation, got to our result of this is the one to move forward on. Uh, it's going to also be a way to name shows, all kinds of other things. If you have a lot of different options to consider, a lot of different factors to consider it on, it's a great way to break down these kind of decisions. But I didn't invent this methodology. This is an old linear modeling trick. This is a thing that people have been using for many years to make big investment decisions that hospitals or scientists will use with more empirical data, not so loosey-goosey and guessing as we're doing. What we tend to find is that this is just a nice way to kind of take these multivariable decisions and factors and have a lot of other options to then feel good about, okay, well, having balanced out, if it's true to me that these are the factors important to me and how important those factors are in relation to each other, and in each case, how I looked at what's important to me about why I'm doing this and how I think that matches that option, I can feel good about going forward with confidence and not be second guessing, am I on the wrong track? Should I have done this other thing instead? All right, welcome back. I hope you found that helpful. And again, part of what's so cool to me about that as a tool is it's so general, it can be applied to all kinds of things in life. Well, I use it to figure out where I want to live, right? It's, it's not just for narrowing down prototypes, but it certainly can be. And it helps engage other people in a process in a team. It helps articulate to a potential funding source or an executive why we did one thing over another. But speaking of which, even though I'm encouraging for the most part, make a different prototype between every you know group that you feel like, between every single video that you feel like of whatever kind. In this case, I will suggest strongly, probably because I think it's going to be good for you, put in your documentation, do this exercise from the prototypes you've done so far. And in your documentation, put a copy of your table with the numbers in there 
you can find a way to print it as an image or export it as a PDF or something. You can put it in, however you can share it with if you've got an instructor or group to discuss it with for your critique times. But what you're really articulating there is which columns did you pick? What are the criteria you personally are filtering on? Why are you favoring one of these many kinds of interesting prototypes over the others? And then secondarily, did you find yourself feeling the need to override or how did you navigate when you narrowed down to the top, say, three out of the, I don't know, seven or so we have so far? How did you decide? Maybe it wasn't even the top scoring one. You looked at it and something about it made you pull back and say, no, 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 no. I like this other one. What's your favorite so far and why? Or recognizing too, as we start filtering down, we might as well go through some testing process here where it's often beneficial to go through a bit of a layered stage process. So before we go straight from seven to one, we go from seven to picking three. So now to get rid of all of them, you're just trying to eliminate about half so far. We could still take each of those at least another inch forward, at least some actionable feedback, maybe for the ones you've got curated uh, or you've got some um, critique on so far from your groups. If you're doing this with teammates or with an instructor or even taking time to get to reflect on your own notes, taking those forward, acting on the steps you had in mind for them to then decide from those as a next layer of the tournament bracket, which of those will be the survivor to be our final month of development of focus. But the Matrix Decision Spreadsheet is a helpful exercise. I encourage it. Do it so far, even if knowing, you know, it's not finished. We might still be doing more prototypes. We're about to do another one between now and next week. And this is where it's, I'm not laying out here what to do aside from the spreadsheet outside of that. Pick any other kind of prototype we've talked about before. Maybe challenge yourself to do a different kind of way you've done before or pick the one you've liked most and do a second one of those. It's up to you. But part of what's nice about what you set up this table, you can then add another project to it very easily. Your work is already there. And one cool thing that can start to happen, why we're introducing this before you're even done making the prototypes, is because what you may find is that once you've articulated to yourself what your columns are that you're ranking things on, that you're scoring, and what their perhaps even their weights, if you chose to do the weighted approach to doing it, is then you might look at which projects you pick can be mildly optimized around what you think is going to score well in that table with a row. It may still be different. It may not turn out as good as you thought it was as soon as you tried it, because of course, we all aim for the moon and we want good things and we wouldn't play the song if we didn't think it was going to sound good. But the nature of prototyping is we often don't know till we try it. But having seen our work through this filter, what are we narrowing on can be its own lens to bring back to what prototypes you choose to make next, including if there was a kind that like, well, that feels like it could have been good, but it really missed the mark so hard. I want to go back into one of those. Perhaps that's what you'll decide to be now next time. But I look forward to seeing and hearing about it. And next video, we'll be talking about team collaboration and testing, uh, what's worth involving somebody else on, what goes into that, and a little bit about doing that with groups. Catch you next time. Welcome back to video nine of our series here on rapid prototyping. If you lost your place or skipped ahead or something, and you want to see the whole list, again, there should be a playlist somewhere in the description. But Today's video is going to be discussing, we're moving towards narrowing it down as we accelerate into our final stretch of really polishing one of the prototypes that we have so far to a more publicly releasable, showable kind of a prototype level project. And this time we're talking about team collaboration and testing that out and what that means and how it's a little different from what we've been talking about so far. And I invited when we did kind of the, talked briefly about sports, collaboratively creating something with somebody. And that's obviously a way that teams can happen. But another way teams can happen is a pretty normal way to do in the world where you start something without a teammate and then you're trying to navigate how to work with a teammate on it, how to invite someone to the process and what they feel enough ownership for it to be meaningful to them and what you might feel still is in alignment with the reason why you're pursuing this particular project. But we're trying to figure out a way to navigate that. And part of what we're also testing isn't just how a project scales into involving another collaborator, but beyond that, prototyping interactions with collaborators. And this is a, a lens that I, again, I don't want to, I give a whole section to discussing this because this is so important. It's not like the world is full of people who are, some are good and some are bad. It's a lot of, it's about fit. Whether we're talking about a good coworker, a good employee, a good boss, perhaps a relationship or a good friend. It's often about fit. And that was that person a match the way that you think and they think and the way that you communicate and they communicate and the way that they navigate stress and the way that you navigate stress. And so part of why I'm referring to team collaboration isn't just about how to collaboratively make prototypes. And that happened with the sports thing. That's pretty much automatic. This is about encouraging you to prototype working with different teammates. 
out of the organizations that I've founded that produced games, and so Carnegie Mellon's Game Creation Society, co-founded with Kurt Barrington, and BJ Dev at Georgia Tech, so 2004-2010, and my current home team game dev groups, got three of those in operation at the time of this video recording. Those are things where part of what people are testing isn't just their ideas, or isn't just their approach to design, or isn't just even their aesthetic choices we're going to get to in our final section a little bit. It's partly, who do I get along well with? Who do I feel comfortable talking to about these ideas? Who am I enthusiastic and excited about when I'm working with that person? I find myself more jazzed about working on the project. I find myself wanting to do more, take it further, not to overdo it, but just that I wake up excited about another opportunity to work with this person. And that that trial, that test, part of why the prototype lens is so important for this is that if we don't have some way of prototyping that interaction, then we can wind up in a situation where many companies wind up in a tough spot or many even to small scale indies will try to team up and have a really hard time or bad time. If they pick an employee that's just not a good fit or they pick a business partner who's just a bad match. And gosh, it's hard to get out of that web once you're in it. It can be project destroying. It can be company destroying. It can be a very tough net to get out of. And so whenever possible, it's good to find a way to prototype an interaction with somebody that's lighter weight than let's do a project together. Let's do a whole project. together. Let's build a game together right? It's the difference between let's start a band together or let's just try jamming together once to see how that sounds. It's a lighter level of sort of involvement in it. It's a less serious way to test it out. And so this is part of where in just in my career, professional relationship to other people in my networks and and fields, part of the function that something like say my podcast has served, which I've announced doing consistently since summer of 2015, I think, is it's a way I can test interacting with people to figure out, might we have more potential to collaborate there? And it's not a bad thing if we don't. It's that every now and then I'll find someone who's like, this person, the things that they're saying, this resonates so deeply with the core of me, that is a potential. Let me see if they'd be open to collaborating too. And so part of what's nice about both prototyping, in our case, of you can work with something on something knowing that, just like any of our ideas before about verbal games, about sports games, about these different kinds of exercises, they don't have to be super time consuming. If all you're doing is reusing a mouse, it's okay if it's not a total great fit. It might wind up in your canceled list of projects of projects you don't even surface to an instructor or bring up for a critique with your classmates. And going into it with both of you knowing full well that it may not be working out great for both of you and that that's okay. That it's just the value of it. And so that's why my encouraged activity for this time rather than, and I'm not going to give you a recommended video to watch. I'm not going to even give you another prototype category besides to say what I recommend here is to try working with two or three different people between now and next time. Now, there's different versions of this you could do. You could try to come up with another kind of project together if you want to experiment with that. You could say, let's try, I'm interested in doing a verbal game. Do you want to try to do a verbal game? No, you want to do a sport game? Let's, do you want to come up with that together? You might try involving them on a project you've already started. And again, this is it's a, it's a different way to navigate that, but it's a healthy, good thing to practice to figure out Okay, out of these ones I've presented, I noticed in the critique you had really good questions about this. Maybe you'd be interested in being involved on this project together. Do you want to try to work together on the next stage of it and see where that goes? Maybe that'll be cool, maybe interesting, and it's okay if it's not. Or a third approach might be, just that notion of like the podcasting, if there's some of the way you want to find a way to collaborate with somebody on some really short, low commitment thing. You want to do a YouTube promotion kind of collab together with no particular audience. You want to do a kind of a TikTok a uh, video short together. You want to, I don't know, co-author a post on some platform that lets you do that. That's all okay. It doesn't have to be that you're actually doing the thing that you're trying to evaluate. It wouldn't hurt. But by real thing, I want to encourage you to prototype you now next time as much as we, you know, have different ways of prototype. And my usual disclaimer, you don't have to do this. If you're just not feeling it, you super want to be solo. It will limit what you can do in your world because collaboration is where we start to really tap into skills and perspectives and insights and networks outside of any given individuals. But I recognize that that is a personal choice. So if you want to do that, but I'll encourage again, if you're open to exploring the possibility, another thing to add to your repertoire of things to prototype is who am I working with? And remember, and keep in mind when you're documenting these things to document all your stuff as best you can, what you might want to bring to that isn't just the documentation, but the artifact itself. Here's what we were trying to do. Here's why it changed. But acknowledging, and there are some differences about, and it's not to be a, a negative conflict, you know, the other person saw, it felt like it should go this way. I felt like it should go this way. Here's how we navigated that together. That can be a great thing to document. 
Uh, it could be something where someone later comes onto a project as a team grows and they're trying to get some context on why is it done this way? You know, was this ever discussed? Oh, it was discussed. And we had a reason for the way it kind of wound up leaning. It could also be a case where what you part you discuss is that how working with that person either brought a different side of you. If it shaped your project in a direction than where you initially had a thought, it doesn't even be a necessarily inherently positive or negative. But it's to recognize out of like all the things you prototype from a, a, a chance to draw from in the future, realizing that when you work with different people, there's different effects that it has on how you work and vice versa. It's the nature of being human beings. And that if you're working on a project in the future, you're like, oh, you know what this needs? There was a person who they really simplified stuff. That was just their whole deal. They just love to simplify, making it easier to understand and clarify and easier to communicate. This project could use that person to loop them in. Oh, this person's lens. You know, there's something about it was just, I don't know, they uh, they really are into designing stuff for kids. That's just what they're about. That's when, as soon as they got involved in me, there's just clear, like, they really want to make this work for children, which is fascinating. It's another challenging space to kind of design and market for and all that different challenges for a different day. But it is a say, again, if you can figure out there's something about someone likes an educational lens, someone has a serious games lens, someone is really adept at Unity, someone is a really adept at board game design, someone is a really great writer, working with them even if this wasn't a particular project, adds to both your mental tool sets one more contact in the future to reach back to to say, hey, we worked on that thing and I realized something that you'd be a great partner or collaborator for this other thing I'm trying to start or I've already got going. So that's why I encourage you to prototype between now and next time and document that experience again, whether it's a new prototype that you do together, in which case both list in your documentation if you're doing it that way, uh, to involve them on a project that you one of you has already been doing. And it might work the other way around. It might be that you figure out that, okay, we would like to work together. Let's both bring up together and navigate which one of our projects do we want to kind of collaborate on the next week. Could both collaborate with each other if you feel like you've got the bandwidth and interest in doing that. But then to make sure again the documentation of whoever's helping the person on the other ones includes some documentation from their lens as well in the documentation you're accumulating. Uh, or this other third idea of just some other way to collaborate on something to feel out, uh, I got to know this person a little bit better. I, you know, We'll take that with me. That's still a valid answer for this type of prototype. One of my only disclaimer asterisks here. Um, gosh, I'll tell you what, if you did all of these for the rest of the weeks of just testing with different kind of people, I'm not sure it'd be really serving the function of uh, the prototyping video course we're aiming for here. So, you know, for the most part, where possible, try to build something together, try to go back to your prototyping together. But want to experiment with teammates because that's one of the ways that things scale up and get better and more awesome. We can fill in for each other's weaknesses with each other's strengths. We can add each other's perspectives. When the artist, more art trained person helps us spot some things that should be changed. When the programmer helps us spot some things that should be done a little bit differently. When the designer, the writer, other people have a different lens to it. That is part of the power of teamwork. So I want to encourage experimenting with team collaboration this week. And I will catch you next or next month, next day, whenever you decide to paste these out for you. We'll be talking about developing a prototype into something more publicly releasable. What goes into really taking it off that launch pad, which we'll be then doing Focusing on really for our last month, in addition to still covering some more topics from a prototyping lens. But I'll see you next time. Welcome back to our rapid prototyping series of videos here. What we're going to talk about today is going to be developing from a prototype into something more publicly releasable. Now, there's different versions this might mean. This might mean that you just really want to get it out in your portfolio, you want to get it out on the internet. And that's a valid answer to this question. It's a, it's a lower bar than some other ways of publicly releasable. But right, that means that you can put it in front of a stranger and they can play it. And that is something where many prototypes, that's not the case. It might mean that there's supporting features around when you initially did a prototype, it could have been hyper targeted. Like when we first started talking prototypes in this series of video courses, we were also giving examples of where you could really prototype a system, an inventory, a menu, a part. Obviously, to release it to the public, it's going to need more supplemental pieces around it. Now, it may be a case where you can put around it sort of the most generic, straightforward, simple answers to just frame it so that it can kind of exist in the world around you. But it's not enough to have a player movement system if there's no environments for them to move in. It's not enough for, uh, you know, you have a design for a certain way a ship might be able to navigate in the water if there's no reason for the ship to go anywhere. But this is where the minimalism may still be an answer in that, like we talked about from the lens of arcade, digital, or real-time prototyping, you might be able to get reuse out of an environment. You might be able to get a scrolling, repeating space. You may be able to figure out even a case of some games, if nothing else, if all you have is mobility of the character, we can go back to that rollover lane, coins kind of approach. You can make collectible so the player has to gather all the parts as quickly as possible. It's not elegant, it's not great, but it's more releasable than a run around an empty space. 
And now someone can play it, they can have a goal, they can have an objective, they can measure their success at it. Do people understand it? Are they confused? And so this is where you often want to be, again, doing more testing. This might be a little more outside the circle. We talk about expanding those concentric circles of solo to teammate to friends and family to kind of people on other teams who might share the skill set closer into people who may be acquaintances. This possibly might be a useful way to leverage your LinkedIn network, your Facebook network, whatever sites you might have of following your Twitter mutuals who are open to checking it out. And if they're comfortable with it, and some people aren't, some people are, but if they're comfortable with it, your best way to get feedback isn't just to prepare a Google form and some questions. It's not a bad way to do it. That's a functional way to narrow down some answers. And it scales nicely because people can do it on their own time. But if you can find someone who's willing to let you watch them play it so that they're screen sharing as they're playing your thing or that they've got a camera pointed at, they've printed out your board game or they've gathered your pieces according to your rules for how to play checkers or something. That's a situation where observing them trying to play it can go a long way to realizing things that they would not have thought to put in a form. But the moment you see someone else experiencing it, you're going to wince. You're going to want to correct them, resist the urge, unless it's really got them stuck. Make a note of it. And it's going to help clarify what you need to say next time for your next tester. And another version of this, by the way, is a technique you can use in this kind of testing. It's called the Think Aloud, Pro- uh, Think Aloud Protocol. That's basically where we're encouraging them. Rather than you telling them what to do, or you're trying to read their mind, you invite them to verbalize as they're trying to figure out what are they thinking? Why are they trying to do what they're doing? What do they think is supposed to be happening? And it's it takes practice to be on the other side of receiving into that because you don't want to correct them. You don't want to just constantly be pointing out where they're wrong. And it's also to acknowledge that there's a little bit of that that even happens on a commercially shipped finished product in terms of part of our relationship to the information around us is having a theory, testing a theory. I thought this would open the door. It didn't open the door. I thought this might be the direction to go. This was the direction to go. We play commercially produced AAA games that way. That's a part of our navigating the environment, but it is identifying, especially if there's patterns in people keep getting the wrong idea about what to do, where to go, how to do it. This can also help surface things where we've had plenty of situations where someone makes a prototype of a game and say home team game dev or one of their communities. And until we test it, we don't realize we never actually tell the player how to double jump. We never actually tell the player what button is inventory. We never, we know we forgot to tell them that you have to open doors manually. And part of the puzzle there is that if you don't show them, tell them, make it real clear, make it so they can't miss it, have a pop-up, a tutorial tip or whatever, then they're not going to get to see the rest of the content after. They're not going to see the rest of the work that was put into this project, even no matter how much more polish you put, they get stuck. So that testing is a critical part of making something that was just first a prototype where you kind of play it with somebody, yourself, or show someone else who's able to have a discussion with you to getting it ready so you can really put it in front of a stranger who doesn't have you there watching with them. And sometimes the answer is as simple as a text tip that pops up, not before they need it, but on the spot, when they're in the spot where they're confused, the tip that pops up that shows them what to do, avoids them getting stuck. And the iterative testing is where, again, it's a version of this prototyping where they have an issue and you probably don't want to fix the issue the way they talked about it, but you can recognize because you have different awareness of the trade-offs, the reasons for things, a different fix you think will work. That's just a theory. Like all of our prototyping, you still have to test that theory. And part of what happens is when you next test it with somebody, it's going to either validate it. It might also surface another problem where sometimes when there's a layer of certain level of usability issues, we don't even observe the next layer of problems. Once we get past that, then people start to surface all kinds of other problems about, okay, I know how to do things. I don't know what to do. I know what to do, but I don't know where to go. Those become more evident to us because we get a communication challenge of how we make clear to the player what to do. And the other thing that wind up happening is that sometimes the fix pops up new problems. It's the old, you know, you plug one hole in the dam and water pops out another. This is just part of the experience and it's part of developing a prototype to something that's more publicly releasable. To do a more full round of testing, this is where, again, if you can get people to screen share with you, that's awesome. If all you can do is get them to answer a short Google form, that's valid, still helpful. And that's something where to really go through a full lap of that takes longer than you might think because so let's say I need at least a handful of people who are fresh set of eyes minimum three at least five would be great uh, recognizing really I'm looking for is patterns right any given person might be an outlier they might just totally have had a weird day if the only person with a thought listen to it but you're really looking for patterns right what's the recurring issues people are having so it takes multiple for a test round but then, so you had to make that form, you had to put the build or the prototype or the printable PDF or the instructions about how to assemble your board game or how to play the sport out there. 
then you need time for them to fit in playing it. And since you aren't paying these people, they're not actual full-time workers who are doing a job. They're just friends trying to help you out with a second set of eyes, offering their opinion about something. You might need to give them at least a week to fit in a chance when this works well for them to do it and to fill out that form. So then that suddenly turned, okay, you authored, they had to wait a week for that. But then you still have to implement those changes. And if you're doing something digital or analog, there's still going to be cases of you've got to kind of iron out the details and rework the wording and figure out the surface new bugs. And before you can start another round, it's probably been another week of work or so. At least that's what we tend to find in home team. And so each round, which can make a pretty big difference on it, they will eventually get diminishing returns. But each early round can make a huge difference. Might be two more weeks on the prog- prog- project. So even if something was a game jam level sophistication, took a weekend to do it, a prototype you did in a few hours, a prototype you kind of had off the top of your head and you just did it real fast, to put through a proper round of testing is still going to be a couple weeks per cycle, probably minimum. You might find the numbers fluctuate depending on the intensity of who else is willing to work with you. But remember, we're talking about a fresh set of eyes. Ideally, it's people who haven't seen you talk about it. So even if you're in a group of people who are learning this together, we're not talking about testers now peers, group, family, again, LinkedIn connections, Facebook connections, people who are open to it, but probably not people who have been in the group learning with you. If they've heard you talk about your idea, if they've seen you play it, if they were part of critiques and you talk about your process, they're polluted as a source just as badly, or at least in the same way that you are, as you know, what's supposed to happen. You know, how you're supposed to play it. You know, what's supposed to work. You know, what's supposed to happen. And as soon as they have seen that they're polluted. You want a fresh set of eyes. And that's, again, the thing where someone outside of your brain, someone outside of you, doesn't matter if they're a more experienced designer, doesn't matter if they're a better communicator, doesn't matter what the background is, what you really need is you need a set of eyes who haven't yet been polluted by, I know what it's supposed to be doing. I know what's happening under the hood. I understand the objective because I'm the one who set it up or someone's shown it to me or talked to me about it or I saw how they did it. You just need people who don't already know those things to get a real gauge. Otherwise, your testing data is polluted. And this is also why when you see a board game, And it may seem like it wouldn't take a super long time to print the words on those cards or something. It's going through a lot of this kind of testing to get at a level ready for public consumption. Weeding out what cards confused people, what cards offended people, what cards just didn't resonate, which which things was this game doing that we seem to lose people over. And so much of this work that was going to be going back to trying to make it as simple as possible to understand, to explain, so someone can jump right and start playing figure out what the goal is, what to do. And if you fail at those things, again, they won't get far and they won't actually enjoy the rest of what you put together. So sometimes this actually can also mean not just figure out how to communicate better to the player what they're supposed to do, but looking at, okay, how ruthlessly can I simplify the thing I'm trying to get their opinion on? Am I asking them to try to learn too many different systems? Am I convoluting too much? Why do I really need three different kinds of health bars? Why do I, is it necessary to have so many different types of things in the interface. And if I can reduce what I'm trying to explain to them, it's going to be less in the way of the parts that can shine. Going back to our notion of rapid prototyping, occasionally less will be better. And we can no longer remove stuff, right? The old Japanese tea garden example that's done when you can no longer remove anything else from it. It's an invitation when you test and people find it complicated, overwhelming, stressful, confusing to simplify further. And it takes a lot of work to get to simple and good. It's not obvious. It's not easy. It's not the first answer. Part of what also happens too in this prototyping space, start branching and iterating. And I've saw this happen for many of my projects. I think of this example, I think I talked about one of my audiobooks, but basically that it's like a, if you want to carve a hedge into a shape, you have to let it overgrow, right? You can't add plant mass to it. You got to let it grow too big. Then you can cut back to the shape, the size, the sculpture. And in the same kind of way, it is normal and expected that as you were branching, designing, iterating, polishing, attempting to add supplement, build piece around it. It was kind of overgrowing and kind of a gnarly way in different directions. You had to. There's no shortcut around that. That's the only way forward. And then you go back in, you trim it down to what part people recognize that's aesthetically pleasing, that makes sense to them, they can understand and follow. That is a big part of the work. I stressed early on and hopefully throughout this video series that hacky, unshippable code was the goal. That ugly placeholder aesthetics that we knew we would not want to leave in for final release are the objective. And obviously, this is the things we have to start addressing. This is why the next video we're talking about prototyping lens to art and audio. Bit of some terms around that, some basic practice around that. Basically, just bringing focus to that being a next stage to prototype on. But it is something where we need to change those because in order for us to keep working on it, we need to make things easier to work on. Sometimes this takes into account things like refactoring, 
so we can distill out what are the variables relevant for us to change. And so let's say I've made a game where it's, I'm jumping on clouds or I'm, I don't know, having a little racing game or something. And there's parameters that previously were in the code, but if I can tune them in the Unity inspector or I can change even a single number in JavaScript that then something else does what I need done with it, that's going to be easier to modify. And so a lot of where energy winds up being well spent is on not just making the code prettier, not just making the code more elegant in some, I don't know, kind of abstract sense, but very practically, what are the ways that if we can tweak this, it's going to help us get closer to our end result faster with less mental overhead of having to dig back through and figure out how did this whole thing work? How do these pieces work and fit together? But part of the Cerny method, this is part of why he also recommends, and again, this is 20-year-old technology, so some of this has changed for modern platforms, in some cases basically starting over to say it might be such a mess. And I've had this happen where I prototyped a racing game. It was a hover-related racing game. And the way the driving system worked in the initial prototype was so off base from how it needed to move. It was actually easier to start a whole new project doing the hover system the way it was supposed to work. The prototype was there for a sketch. It was there to show potential teammates. It was there to get my head on straight about, yeah, this this excites me. I'm interested. I like what this is. This, this look, this angle, this perspective, all this makes sense to me. But mechanically, it was better there to start fresh. And it may be in line with the Cerny method of the answer isn't to go back and rename all your hacky variables and organize your class structures. It may be easier to start fresh and clean and carry across just the parts you need, especially if you're not bringing across all of it to something that's more publicly releasable. And then lastly, a bit of a weird feeling here about suggesting this one, but it's for my outside recommended viewing or reading. And this one, I can, if you're one of my students in home team or something, I can give it to you that way. Uh, for anybody else, I think it's an affordable course. Um, but completeeveryproject.com is a video course I've produced about long-term project planning, about how we break down a schedule so we can finish the thing on time. So if I say that this is going to be done at the end of July, if I say it's going to be done at the end of October, if I say it's going to be done a year and a half from now, how that works, how we evaluate what the tasks are, how they spread out, how we update that schedule to keep it useful. And the reason why that's my suggested viewing, and I'm going to say suggest because I'm not going to hold you to that. I realize, again, it is not a free course. That's why I can't include the whole thing right here for you. But it's something where part of moving forward out of a prototype into a public releasable thing is sizing up what's it going to take to get there? What are we going to get if we put the time and energy to it? How long is it going to take to do it? And this is why that course, CompleteEveryProject.com, which I think is actually Complete Every Project You Start, Be Your Own Producer, is the actual name of the course on Udemy. It's about a four-hour video course, but it's something that it really goes into that sort of methodology. And it's essentially like if you were looking at items on a menu and you're deciding what do you want to order, you're not just asking yourself, does lobster sound good? Do I want a hot dog? You're asking yourself, would I rather have a lobster or $25? Would I rather have a hot dog or $4? And we're evaluating things based on the cost it's going to take us. And so this is a case where if we're trying to decide what prototypes to move forward on, it's not equivalent that some prototype could be two weeks, two months from being publicly releasable. Another prototype might be, honestly, to do it justice, a year and a half or two. It's built around this really interesting and convoluted but complex procedural generation terrain caves system that's really interesting and fascinating. It seems worthwhile, but it's going to be a year and a half or two years cost. A thing I mentioned in that course that is also relevant to this lens is that often tasks are what I call squishy. And this is the sense that if I ask you to draw a house in five seconds, it's going to be a square with a pyramid on the top. If I ask you to draw a house in five minutes, you might do some kind of basic vanishing point perspective. If I ask you to do it in five hours, you could really put in some detail and go find a reference house, whatever. If I ask you to take five years to do it, you might take a class in art and draw lots of houses to pick your best. And there's a whole process around that. And so any given project, you could conceivably say, well, those are versions I can get after two months or two years or what have you. There's a bit of a choice there. This is still where it's so essential to be able to have that ability to translate from. I have a prototype idea. How long is it really going to take to do this justice and get this done right? Is sizing up and looking at being able to generate, just like we prototyped, different project ideas, different approaches, different teammates we might want to work with. We can prototype using an approach to scheduling Okay, if I gave this prototype two more months to finish, of course, in the course structure we're following here, it's probably a month left if you're doing a week per video. If I give this two months to finish, how would it come out different than if I gave it six months? How would it come out different if I gave it a year? Because that's really what we're choosing between when we decide which schedule to move forward on. We can look at those and say, that, well, you know what? The year one takes longer, but it's going to be worth it. Or 
The year one will be a little bit better, but only marginally better than the six month one. When we can realistically scope out what it's going to take to do different versions of a project at different time frames. And this is a key part of deciding which prototypes to move forward on about what it's going to take. Because sometimes the answer is, I might need to raise funding to do this justice. I might need to figure out a way to get a Kickstarter. How much am I asking for? How long of a runway do I need? And again, it's this exercise of translating from a prototype to publicly releasable is going to be some version of that. If you're going beyond just, I need it in my portfolio in a way people can see. That's really the low bar I'm kind of establishing here for the final month. At minimum, we just want to make sure that this is as polished as can be in the time frame. If you again, I'm expecting you're maybe doing this once a week, then that's kind of the goal we're aiming for. But it is totally a case where you can size up, prototype different schedules, just like you could for different projects. Once you get proficient in this kind of way of breaking up time to say what time is it worth to me? And it's because like another point that I bring up in that course is that the blueprints are the time to change something. It's much easier to drop three or four different versions of blueprints to decide which one to build than to just build three or four buildings. And your schedule, your sense of how long something's going to take to make it releasable is a prototype. So this is where even if you don't decide to take that course, what I would encourage you to do for the prototype for this time, again, if you want to stay, keep in my pattern of uh, exercises between sections, it's up to you slash your instructor if you have one locally or group of peers or something, is to really engage in this exercise of whatever project you're most leaning towards moving forward or perhaps testing. Maybe you want to now test two or three in parallel to kind of see even how people initially react to them. But whatever project you decide you want to move forward, trying to come up with an articulated answer to what version of this could you get in two weeks, four weeks? So how would it be different if you had six months? You can obviously use any time frames you want, but I think those are going to be meaningfully differentiated. Two weeks, four weeks, six months. And one reason to think about it this way too is again, we're often looking at opportunity cost. Because if you decide that the two week version is not as good as the four week version, but is actually pretty approximately about as good 85, 90% is good. You could then instead to take the final four weeks of time that we've been planning and actually do two projects, each with two weeks of polish to then weigh between those and decide which is your best winner out of that. Suddenly, it wasn't about two weeks versus four weeks for one project. It was about four weeks of one project versus two weeks for two and picking your best. And especially if one's a little more chaotic, a little more risky, a little more innovative or experimental, but you want to give it a shot. It's a lens you might look at. And a reason I bring that up is because when we think about rapid prototyping, it's about the opportunity cost of how we're not spending our time on the wrong things. It's can we have evaluated before we went six months deep? This was not going to be the way to move forward. So that's part of why size is up. Because if we could say again, the same lens, if there's a version I could do with six months, is it actually going to be that much better than if I did the one month version of six different projects and kept the best? bit more of a prototyping mentality and some of those more so than others the way certain businesses conduct their work or back to this game of if I only show you my best drafts my best releases of things that really come out that's part of how we create the impression of the outside world that we only produce great stuff we are just stuffing into the archives things that we don't want them to see that uh weren't our strongest work so anyway, that's the thoughts here I wanted to share on developing a prototype that's something more releasable again the recommended viewing if you're open to it uh is my complete course if you're one of my students and home team or something else, I can get it for you at no added cost. Uh, if you are seeing this on the internet on YouTube, yeah, I'm saying it's worth it, saying it's affordable, consider it. Uh, but if nothing else, then the exercise here I'm going to encourage is to weigh those process and priorities for one of your projects, at least. What would the two week, four week, six month, two week, four week, six month version of it look like? including again at this point it'd be great to start play testing at least one maybe two or three of your games with people outside of people who've seen it before talked about it before to start gathering some feedback whether you're observing them on zoom whether you're getting them to fill out a google form for you for some feedback those are helpful oh and by the way if you're doing google forms for feedback i want to encourage make sure you have a spot on there for if they'd like to be credited for testing even if they're not doing a fully rigorous again like kind of qa professional lens on it being asked to reproduce cases and documents stuff in jira or something if all they're being asked is just for their attention and time it's still a good time to capture there where they like to be credited. If so, by which name? So you don't get them by the wrong nickname. If they don't want their last name public or something, make sure you're getting that information from in your playtest form if you're comfortable with that. And my usual back to my disclaimer from introduction. This is my broad note for if you're doing this on the internet on your own time and energy, 
if you're with an institution, there may be additional privacy considerations about credits and how people are mentioned for things. So heads up about that. Again, I'm just telling you some general rules of thumb that we might use in something like home team. That's it for now. Thanks for following along for this video. We are now reaching our, our end of this quarter or this chunk of videos, which means again, we're at a checkpoint between now and next video. I want to encourage if you have collaborators or a group you're practicing with, a class you're practicing with, figure out next time how to go into some critique. And it could be about talking about anything you've done so far in this course. It could be about the playtesting different people we worked with. It could be about the playtesting forms. It could be testing interactions with other teammates. It could be about your schedule, things you gauged. It could be about any given one of the prototypes you've done so far up to you, what you want to bring to the critique and being hopefully an active participant in it. Or if you're solo, taking the moment to reflect on if you added more energy and cycles back to any one of these, including the one you might be tackling this week, how would you spend that energy? How would you do it differently? What would you do next? Next time, we'll be picking up on our last chunk of videos about the final month in which the main work is going to be on polishing, narrowing down. You might use a decision matrix. You might put a round of testing against a few of them that you narrowed down to. Which one you really want to give these last few weeks of polish and final deliverable to have a showpiece about your best work out of this video series. That's what I want you to focus on. Meanwhile, I'll still be covering some other ideas that are not so much the focus of this course, but still use that prototyping mentality in different ways that I think are really helpful to add to your tool belt. One is about narrowing a search for if you're doing design work for like levels, for puzzles, for items, how we explore those spaces, some basic rules of them for that, so that if you're trying to polish your thing and you need to find out, I need a playable area, I need, suddenly I need uh, power-ups or something in this experience. Some ways to do that, we'll talk about briefly. Uh, some visual and audio target prototyping again. There's going to be not a whole lot to talk about that. These are mostly going to be work periods in terms of some basic notes, point you in another direction to explore and think about, and then really encouraging you to keep polishing on, taking further, perhaps branching prototyping your main project. We're talking about visual and audio target prototyping. And then lastly, knowing it's not many of your primary focus, we will be talking about kind of a, a prototyping lens on marketing or even some business considerations about ways that certain kind of work might get greenlit commercially or that what goes into testing audiences, messaging, presentations that work to the outside public because that can also be part of, you know, we talked about your documentation so far, it's mostly been internal facing, right? It's been notes to yourself, essentially, or perhaps to your instructor to be able to review or evaluate or discuss with your peers and critique. But if what you're working on is you need to show a little video trailer, you need to show some screenshots to make your game look good, that is a version of prototyping that we can take a marketing lens to. So that's what we're going to talk about in our final sections. I uh, hope, hope you'll continue to join me here for the last few blocks. See through, take one of those prototypes. Again, uh, you've said it before, the reason for the sample product is to figure out what to order the main dish of. You've now tried lots of prototypes. I hope you can follow along making some things, analog, digital, physical, whatever it is that spoke to you and your interest. You've been doing some of these exercises. And I know it's hard and it's uncomfortable. We want to narrow it down. If the decision matrix helps, if playtesting helps, narrow it down. Pick one between now and next time you really want to be carrying forward as your focus to put as much of your focus on you can in the time remaining, how to finish it up. So I'll catch you next time for our final section. Welcome to the final section, which there's still a few videos left. But they're going to be shorter than some of the other ones, because once again, our real focus in this last few weeks, assuming you're doing these weekly of the prototyping course are going to be really on you branching forward your prototypes, of the work that you've been doing so far and or narrowing down which one of those you really want to take forward. So I hope you've made a choice about that. And if you're being conscious about you choose to take two halfway to finish before you finalize, which one you really double down on, I trust you as an independent adult to navigate that. So what I'm talking about today though is first narrowing down our search space from what kind of project to, okay, and now we're in a project, we're about what to do with it. And again, if, whether you're in an alt control experience, whether you're in kind of a novel, chaotic, physics-based engine gameplay, there's a lot of possibilities that you could narrow down and what to do with them is really just want to offer a couple basic lenses. And then I'm mostly going to be giving you some recommended watch today of another YouTube video about some design work I did for boom blocks because some of those same patterns can apply. The first step is basically to take into the design space of your project, whether it's power ups, enemy behaviors, environments, something else or board game equivalents of how many, how long should your board games number of tiles be? how many cards should be in certain stacks or decks or something, how many should be in a hand, is to experiment broadly. In the same way as we did for early on experiments at which project to do, 
when you're in a new space, start by scattering those darts far apart to try to even feel out which directions they might go in. And so a version of this that I did for Medal of Honor Airborne was I was at an early inflection point in the project where I was trying to establish some relationship between the outside spaces and the inside spaces, but then for combat engagement, standardizing about how big is a medium room for this player's move speed, for the enemies and obstacle density and so on. And so we tried a variety of empty and populated rooms to size up, okay, well, on average, a hallway in our environment might be about yay. And keep in mind, this is different for a digital game than it might be in reality because real measurements in architecture are often different from how we perceive it on a screen, how our characters can move through spaces, how props can and can't be scattered in a way that's still navigable for characters who are trying to use them for cover and so on. So it takes some experimentation, but it started by broad experimentation. What is definitely too large was definitely too small. Split the difference. How is this? Okay, well, this is kind of a large, medium, small option. How tall do we expect a player to be able to duck under and feel like it's comfortable, which isn't just a physics question. It's also a rendering question. What looks about right for our field of view of our camera, our height, all these other factors in the environment. Start from broad scatter first, identify your boundaries, work your way back in iteratively from there. Another version of this can be if you're when I was doing level design stuff for Boom Blocks, which is going to be the recommended video uh, after this is broad samples to just try to identify. Are there some patterns we can find here? And think about this like if you were trying to invent music, which one way to think about game development that I've found helpful for me trying to get people to think about a design lens as opposed to an engineering lens is that your programming is sort of creating an instrument and the design is sort of trying to play a song with it. And that you can make a really good instrument and if you don't play a good song with it, no one cares, right? It doesn't help that's a really beautiful trumpet. It doesn't help it's a really beautiful piano if you can't play a worthwhile song with it. Well, every time we're making a game engine game structure game framework game code that runs or other implementation then we still have to do something coherent with it that's meaningful to people and so the way i think about this is a bit like if i was trying to invent music and trying to identify what are some genres and so i might start just kind of trying to play different instruments in different ways and again it's kind of obviously some hand waviness obviously going on here but if i could figure out okay well there's some like countryish stuff there's some kind of hip-hop-ish stuff there's sort of some classical stuff there's giving ourselves too much credit for how quickly we rediscover all, you know, all the different segments of culture of developer, these different traditions of music creation. But what we're looking for when we're kind of a scatter shotting a bit inside the engine is we don't quite know what we're looking for yet to establish a grammar. But if we can try a lot of things, we might start to recognize, oh, there's a whole pattern here. And this is where when I was doing the boombox levels. I could be like, okay, there's a certain kind of approach we could use for bridge levels. There's a certain kind of approach we could take for levels about verticality, a certain kind of pattern we could take for levels about utilizing the chemical reaction blocks to have certain effects and something. And what this allows you to do is then to group and chunk information more meaningfully to players. This is where if you're a new, if you've never done level design before, it's kind of like a child with a crayon box and you use all 64 colors. And someone who's never done level design before might put every enemy in every level, might show everything immediately. And that's a mistake because it all sort of turns together into this goo, into this gray, undifferentiated, just mess you can't tell apart and if instead you become very intentional about this first section it's about verticality the second section is about pacing the third section is about density the third section is about a certain power appears for the first time for the player because they've already kind of learned the basics now there's a trap to look out for for this which is that in a game by a professional trusted publisher or a professional studio people have recognized now for decades they can take a while to get to the point Right, they. If you are playing a Metal Gear Solid game, if you're playing a Call of Duty game, if you're playing a Mario game, if you're playing a Half-Life, something or other, they can kind of take their sweet time because people know that it might take me an hour to get in, but when I get to that part of Baldur's Gate, when I get to that part of Final Fantasy, it's going to be incredible. I know that there's gold on their side of this weight. If you are not Hideo Kojima and you're not Shigeru Miyamoto and you're not Will Wright and so on, people don't usually have that amount of trust in you. In fact, you could even be notch and people still didn't even try out his other stuff you have to kind of get to the point in some way shape or form to show them how good it gets even if you then for pacing reasons have to differentiate it but it becomes a figuring out okay well in doing this how can i show them a snippet up front and then still a differentiation so there's a variety of tools games have used for this which include things like starting the player off powerful or with all abilities and then some narrative excuse happens for they shed their armor they lose their powers they suddenly get knocked out and forget everything until they relearn the abilities for gating 
It is a easy point of entry, though, to figure out, okay, well, I need this differentiation for my levels, but I still need to show the player a lot up front. There's more happening. Another strategy used in even older arcade games like Double Dragon was basically showing you early on a boss who then walks off the screen to make clear that there's more happening that way. And something as simple as that, reusing the same walk animations or something, is another tool we can use in, okay, there's more I can show that this engine's capable of doing, but if I bore the player immediately by only showing them one thing, they won't get the idea. So it might be a version of, like some of the things we're talking about, a sampler platter of sorts of early on, if met, say, to borrow from Super Metroid era, there's an alarm going off, there's a sense of urgency, I've got to kind of rush the player along because something's collapsing, but I can kind of railroad them through showing a variety of some stuff they might be seeing later. That's another way that then we can sort of start them off in an exciting, okay, look, there's lots of stuff coming. Of course, they're literally Nintendo. But then we can build back to some pacing or something more intentional that's not about bam, 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 maximum all the time. How much can I throw at them? But instead, setting them up to see, okay, we can show you lots of things, but they're going to be packaged coherently and cohesively. I'm going to have a series of levels about this, series of levels about that, or being strategic then about what order to put those in so that they're more learnable. So there's sort of adjacency going on of keeps the player learning some novel things as they go. That being part of what we're designing as game designers is that learning experience. And obviously here I'm mostly talking about digital games because that's my experience, expertise or background. But if we were applying the same sort of search to board games, card games, and so on, again, we could very easily apply the same sort of filter for, I don't know, something as simple as how, how many players is really too many for this game. Can I overdo it just to prove to myself and be right? Because maybe I'll surprise myself and actually, oh my gosh, this game actually works with eight players. I assumed it would be up to four, but when I tried it, it was kind of fun for different reasons. I can lean into that. It might be, how few do I actually need? I assumed, you know, three. Can I pull it off with two? Can I play this game solo? Is there a version of this game I could play solo? And those kind of things can help players figure out that they like it enough to introduce a friend to it, which is one of those barriers sometimes we run into in board games. I don't want to waste someone's time with this if I haven't heard of it. And I have no way to check it out on my own. The same thing applies to all of our tuning variables, where when you're doing stuff, initially the programming lens is often, uh, you know, I could jump... So that's done, checkbox. I can shoot, so that's done, checkbox. I can pick up a power-up, so that's done, checkbox. And what we don't want to lose sight of, and again, this is a design lens that it's time to bring back to it as we are prototyping to bring something out of just prototype into shareable public, is revisiting all those tuning numbers to say, should a star power be twice as long or half as long? Should the number of points this enemy is worth be worth twice as many or half as many? Should the timer be twice as much or half as much? And the reason I say twice and half is because sometimes those are a nice way, commonly used in game design, I didn't invent that, to even size up, is this variable relevant? Is this variable even a constraint? Is it variable even connected? But it's a nice way to check and see, okay, well, initially we just had a value, but what if it was way higher? What if I could have a higher attack rate, higher damage? Is it play better or worse? And even when you're sort of exploring those sort of niches of designs and parameters, well, I think I would encourage in that as well, if you can, again, think about ways to kind of build more of a test harness or console into the thing that you're developing, which now we've got a few weeks is not out of the question, is to be able to flip between entire modes of settings. And this is because when I talk about these different tuning parameters about, for example, player gravity, which might be different from everybody else's gravity, and player jump force, about about rate of fire and how much is pickup in boxes or something for refilling magic and mana on the player's spellcasting character, often the values are going to be tuned in relation to each other. And so we're back to this earlier question of if you're not careful, you can kind of optimize your way iteratively into a local maxima, which is to say the best version of the direction that you took, but it may not have been the direct, direct, best direction. But if you can build it so you can basically switch between entire sets of tuning parameters, picture it as something as simple as set A, set B, set C, set D. And in those, you can begin by changing something massively. Player speed, player floatiness, something about the enemy attack or danger or something. And then tune other variables to pivot off of that. To figure out what's the best version of the game we can make if the player moved really fast. What's the best version of the game that we can make if the player kind of took a really long time between being able to cast spells. And you can then test them more meaningfully than if you just iterate locally and say, well, this can't work because I don't pick up enough mana to cast spells that quickly. Those two numbers have to be in balance with each other. So having an entire set of tuning parameters you can toggle between is a great tool for being able to do that, to be able to size up. And then back to my earlier discussion about all this experimentation is still coming back to you doing the work of curating for the end user. What you don't want to do is just say, I'm going to put on the menu, you can switch game mode A, B, C, or D. 
certain games in history have got away with a version of that. For the most part, you're better off making a choice for them because you have context they don't. They're not a mind reader. You have to better figure out, for most of our players are going to reach, this is the one they're like. Now, again, this could also be, this is a version of, uh, we have a little video a couple times talking about some marketing relations to things. A-B testing is a part of where in the marketing world, we try different headlines to see what people respond to. We try different posts to see what people respond to. And it's entirely valid that you could have different tuning parameters. And it's not out of the question if your product is online, if your game is software, that based on a user, their account or something, they might be served a slightly different version of the game. That then you can figure out, okay, well, are they not playing as far? Are they playing farther? Are they having a better time? Are they worse time? Now, it might not hurt to make players aware that there's a bit of testing going on. So they don't wonder how come I watched the streamer and they had a very different experience than I did or my friend had a very different experience than I did. They may not even be that dramatic, but things like this absolutely happen in commercial game development and it's a tool we consider in our tuning of there might be sets, again, of whole variables that tune differently against each other, have a different feel or play, and you might find that you can experiment with those in the testing audiences, even as simple as having two different itch pages, version A, version B, that you play test to gather notes on to see is there an obvious indicator of which one, relatively speaking, people are preferring. So my recommended viewing this time is I gave a presentation for uh, Siege. I can't remember if it was this year or last year. It must have been this year, I guess. It was last year. Anyway, gave a presentation for Siege about boom blocks, level design, and our process, our mechanics design for that. It covers a lot of different kind of tools and lenses into this in greater detail than I spoke about today. So that'll be linked in the description or somewhere else, just another free video. Uh, in terms of the exercise for next time, again, at this point, I'm trying to not steer you in too many different directions because I really want you to focus on what is best next for your project. The other thing I want to go back to is to reiterate a point from longer ago about branching prototyping as being another way you can also be testing this stuff. And that is where besides this kind of ABC variable tuning test, besides grouping some scattershot testing for level design or something can be a version of, I took my whole project and I split it, forked into three different, completely different ways that how does the player win? Did they win on time? Did they win on score? Did they win on hit points? Did they win on what? And then trying those out to compare before I decide which of those to branch. And this can very quickly explode if you're not careful in terms of just the amount of work that can happen, the amount of thrashing in the code that will happen. But it is totally an option in this amount of time we have left. It's a part of prototyping that internally can be used to help steer and gauge in a way that it'd be hard for us to really picture exactly what the game would play like until we try it on device. So if we start doing some testing, it might even be broader than just tuning some numbers. It might be a totally different algorithm is being used for acceleration, deceleration, damage, movement curves, etc. Things to explore. How gravity works. Different versions of platforms have different behavior gravity. Anyway, you got the gist. Check it out. Try out some stuff on your project. If you want to keep doing more prototypes, you can. But at this stage, I would probably encourage stick to the ones you got. You might still be reflecting on again at the end of this time period. I would encourage either your instructor, your peer group or whatever to be looking back at your documentation of your favorite, say, seven or so of the projects you put together throughout the course, um, disregarding the ones after that, or if you can pick a different number if you prefer, but being considered which ones of those you think those might be, even while you're still keeping your attention mainly on the main one. You might also then go back and think about it. Anything you might borrow from those other ones that you're looking for. So anyway, that's it for now. Um, next video, we're down to our last two videos in this section. Next video is going to be on visual and audio target prototyping, which is going to be super lightweight. So I want to make sure we give time and space to that as a conversation at this phase of your cycle. Catch you next time. All right, so there's another one of these videos is going to be super short as part of our rapid prototyping course. As we're nearing the final stretch here, the last couple of videos or so, uh, as a reminder, folks, if you're missing context of where you just dropped into this randomly, who knows how, Check out for the playlist in the description or something related about how to find the start. If you're interested in going through this process yourself, this is going to be one of the shorter ones because kind of like when I talked about board games or sports design, it's just not really, I'm not the right person to teach it. It is to say it's a valuable part of the prototyping experience and understand how things happen on a team. This is about video and audio target prototyping. It's about trying out different things to find an aesthetic style or a, or a look, a sound, a character type, a tone, Something which may be not the first idea that came up. It may be a totally different look. And a couple of tips for how to do that, at the very least, that I've seen work for me as a non-art, non-audio specialist. So the first one of these, right, is to recognize the, the function of some experimentation. And this may go without saying, but that's obviously the nature of the prototyping stuff. But there were teams I was on where their approach to art was, 
the talented, capable artists generate lots of possibilities of a way a character could look for the rest of the team to discuss and say, we like this one, we like that part of this one. What if we merge these two together? And it's still leveraging their strengths, but it's still engaging others in that conversation. When I worked on Alice in Bomberland with uh, David Hellman, he was the animator on Braid. There was a case where he designed so many different variations of Alice for how she might look before he animated her. Because he didn't want to put a bunch of energy into like, yeah, probably 64, 128, a ton of animation poses for smooth, fluid jumping and running and so on. And all the different power-ups and things that happened. And so before doing the animation, wanted to try, okay, different outfits, different styles, different colors, different hairstyles, different looks, different proportions to find that character before we went wide on that style. So it's also where, say, if you have a musician involved on a team and they're producing music, rather than saying just run with it, make music, which obviously welcome to that too. That's a fine thing, especially if they just want to have fun and do things that they want to. If you're trying to produce a product that kind of the whole team can rally around or feel like isn't aligned with something or they can test it with the audience or so on, it might work off better, right, to instead try a few sketches. Can we try four different variations, a little more intense, a little more playful, a little more, I don't know, thoughtful, whatever variations might make sense for this person to try. Or even again, we might try a scattershot. Are there some very different styles of music you might think fit? And if so, how we might approach those. This thing I've had happen too for projects where in my very early age, before I could really collaborate with musicians and find teammates to work with who were comfortable composing or trying and composing myself, I would use something like Kevin McLeod's Incompetech, which Kevin McLeod is a tr tremendously prolific musician, um, a huge admirer of the guy for decades. But he just put out an incredibly massive library of his music online as Incompetech. There's a royalty free music section that became widely used on a bunch of YouTube videos, a bunch of indie games all over the Internet because his deal was if you credit him, it's free to use. You say music by Kevin McLeod. And I think there's a note about S, you know, Creative Commons 3.0 attribution, whatever. But that meant it was everywhere. And part of what made this part of a, a good connection to my process when I was starting out was I could start with my prototype of my game. And even just trawling through hundreds of Kevin McLeod songs, searching by beats per minute and filter and modes and whatever, and this might still be like stock stuff you're evaluating at first, just to try out connecting different ones to my game of wildly different styles. Rodeo uh high tech just to see and surprise myself sometimes about you know what i i wouldn't have th i thought this one sounded like a call waiting music but it's actually it's actually pretty compelling for this puzzle game it's a fit and it can become either in those kind of cases because it was my first sort of stirred student early age projects uh that was the music that i went up using in that case it could also be a situation where you might and i'm sure musicians and artists will have their difference in opinion about this as part of the process but that may be part of the communication process of at least saying, well, I've tried some different things. I kind of like this style. I don't really know where to go with them there. I don't know, you know what's best about it. That's why you involve someone who knows the field better than you do. But it might be a case of at least getting them on the right page. So they're not really playing the game of, I don't know what I want, but I'll know it when I hear it or see it. Because you can kind of point in the right direction of like, I was thinking something like this. And maybe it surprised me and I realized I was wrong. But this is kind of the sound I was thinking about. It's a decent starting point that can start from, again, working from a big library of stuff out there, including, and there's cases where for my audiobooks, for example, my video courses, sometimes I'll be browsing different songs online that are stock. I can pay for them. I can buy the rights to use them, but I still play different ones on top of the audio when I'm trying to testing and figure out, even including, you know, used from this source, do not reproduce because it's not going to be distributed yet, just to feel out which one is then worth me paying the licensing fee for to then move forward on like, this is the one that I want to use. Now, speaking of which, another version of this that is helpful is something called a mood board. And that's where if you decide to take my course that I mentioned earlier, completeeveryproject.com. Again, it's an affordable, I think, course on Udemy. If you are one of my students at home team, I can get it for you at no extra cost. If you're outside my groups, not someone working directly, still hopefully accessible to you. But there's a section on there about mood boards and the function that they serve. But the high level is basically, it's a thing where even on commercial AAA teams that have budgets and professional artists and so on, it'll help them to kind of identify some still frames or pictures or even songs or whatever from existing other media. And it's not they're saying we're going to copy this whole thing. It's becomes, it becomes a shorthand to say, we kind of like the tone of this shot from Aliens and the environment and the atmospheric. So we sort of like this, look at this, the way this ship is designed from this totally other artifact or uh, we're kind of inspired by the architecture from this ancient period. And here's like an artist's rendering of it. And they're not using that stuff directly, right? But it's a, it's a means of getting people on the same page about rallying and discussing well I, I disagree what if we took it kind of this color scheme and finding a reference for what they're referring to 
because they can use those as reference points having to redevelop all that internally. And you go back to this prototyping practice is about saving time doing the wrong thing. It's about if we could have disagreed about this color scheme, that look, that style, that ship, it looks too organic, looks too much like a bug. That's not what I had in mind. The sooner we can surface that disagreement because we've put no real art internal time onto it yet, we will have the conversation before that point, the better. It means that what time and energy we do have gets spent on doing things that we're better aligned on. We've sized up. It was not worth going down that route before we went too far down it. This is though, is still, there's obviously going to be some always overlap of each individual, even people who are professionally skilled in things, have their strengths, have their weaknesses, have their things that are kind of outside their wheelhouse that they would be the wrong person to do. And so recognizing that a bit back to our earlier kind of prototyping sense of dumping on the table, what skills do I have to rapid prototype with? You may also be obviously having to navigate a bit within your visual and your audio space with teammates who may still be specialists in it, coming to understand what are the styles we can pull off? As much as maybe when I was prototyping, Unity was my tool of choice, or I was proficient in game maker, constructor, pie game, or whatever the thing might be, Bitsy, for example, Twine. It could be a case that, well, for our artist's style, they're really good at, you know, I don't know, flat shaded, low poly. They're really good at Easter pastel kind of color scheme stuff. That's just their wheelhouse. That's they're good at it. So we got to find the intersection of the Venn diagram, what they can do, what kind of still aligns to the rest of what this game has got going on. And ideally, obviously, some overlap if we're looking at the kind of commercialization as the next section after this of what people might actually want outside of us. And that's where we can try to validate that a little bit through some sort of testing, audience testing, focus groups, which I know that can feel gross. So I'll talk more about that in the marketing video ahead. Again, it's a form of listening. It's a form of respecting that my audience is a different person than I am. And just because I like something better or worse, if I'm indifferent to certain decisions, I may as well try to get a gauge on, they seem to prefer this. That's not the detail that's most important to me. I can listen to that and respect that. Figuring out again early on to minimize our work and our waste. That's really our prototyping mentality. I want to make sure we're bringing to our art and our audio lens as well. To not have someone disappear for months and come back up and be like, I did it. I got the song. And if they had just discussed it earlier with the team, everyone could have been happier, including them not feeling like, shoot, they went down a wrong direction or that the rest of the team just is so not feeling it, they don't have to bring it up. Those should be avoided. And that's part of our better quarantine and planning about how to prototype those things. And so even if you're not primarily uh, a visual artist and audio person, what I encourage here is in this stage of it, do some prototyping, some experimentation of on the project to narrow down to be your focus is final period to try some vastly different again scatter those darts wide at first and then iterate within them at adjacencies to explore totally different looks totally different styles more pixelated less pixelated more low poly more high poly i don't know right even perhaps even on your physical board games how small is the board game how big is the board game does it affect your feel your experience if there's an old game i think it might have been 16 tons and it was a room-sized board game that showed in a museum and we had to kind of carry these pieces around it's about labor and stuff it's a fascinating game but the the game scale there was part of the experience of it and again when we're at this prototyping we can experiment with the extremes that includes our visual or audio or presentation layer in a way that we ignored when we were doing rap prototyping first for gameplay and game mechanics now we would do want to pay attention to how's it sound how's it look because we're running out of time to pull this off at least the version we're going to release in our end portfolio piece here and we've got one more video i believe talking about our marketing prototyping i might throw another video after this kind of a little micro close but that's probably our last substantial video here talking about some marketing prototyping stuff catch you next time so this is our final section maybe i guess i'm probably still put a section after this again to kind of close it up with some final notes about your final deliverable suggestion you know, you don't know anything I'm on YouTube uh, or whatever service I want to post this on. It may not be that one. So this is the thing where I want to talk a moment about applying prototyping mentality to marketing work, which I can know for some people who are artistic or engineers. Otherwise, it can feel a little gross. But the other reality is a couple of things. One, if you don't learn how to do it, you can't really sustain doing your main craft, your art, your comics creation, your programming, your board game design, whatever the thing. It's going to behoove you to have a lens and how it works. Also, because... It's a case where if you don't do it, you may wind up being reliant on someone who's less ethical about it or you feel less good about the way that they do it in terms of alignment to your values. That's a thing. And if nothing else, too, having some sense of what to look for, if you're sizing up someone else says that they can do marketing for you, having a sense for like, well, is that applicable to your thing, including anyway, let's get right into it. So basically narrowing down some ideas about 
what you can figure out before you wind up contacting somebody else outside of yourself or even to how to do it for yourself. But one of the things we'll talk about, right, is when we bring up this prototyping lens throughout, it's often about testing. It's about trying different things. It's about getting feedback on those different things. And in a way, that's really a big part of what the marketing stuff is about. It's about trying some different things to figure out what's working or what isn't. What are people resonating with? What kind of messages? What kind of posts? What kind of videos? Is There's probably very different ways to frame and look at the game that you've designed, why it might be appealing to somebody. And so rather than picking a plan and deciding that that's the number one best way to do it, you're probably better off picking a few different simpler ways to try to do it at less level of high production value just to get a feel for, well, this one really fell on its face. Some did better than others. Let's explore why. Were they more colorful? Were they more high energy? Was one more thoughtful? Is one better matching the energy level of what someone in our board game audience might want? It comes from experimentation. And this is something that you can experiment with a bunch in terms of posts online, in terms of how you want to design your itch pages, your portfolio site, your landing page. If you want to involve building a list of testers or something at some point in your future, you can very much test different versions of those things. And in the case of itch, it could be as simple. It could be as simple as literally having two versions posted with different page art just to kind of gauge people's response to measure somehow. And that measuring is an important part of it which one's working or isn't compared to the different alternatives you were able to roll out, even just relative to each other. There was an instructor I had who talked about how his rule of thumb was he would give you feedback on the assignments since the creative writing class. And as long as you did on the feedback what he asked you to do, you'd pretty much get an A. He was pretty upfront about it, pretty handy. There's still people who somehow didn't get an A because they didn't do what he asked them to. But it's a version of this can be thought of in the marketing realm for when you're testing stuff, figure out what kind of cover art do people respond to well to? What kind of icon do people respond well to? What kind of title do they respond well to? In a version of it, you're getting feedback from the collective of people who you might be able to reach with your work to find out that they're trying to do what Coach Vanderpool is trying to do to say, hey, if you'll make these changes to it, that's the one we're going to like. Now, you could still, like the students in that class, decide I'd rather get a B on this and do it my way. Knock yourself out. The world's not going to stop you from doing that to yourself. But if it's a thing that's not your most important detail of it, it might be a moment to listen to that feedback and figure out, okay, well, I tested a few. I wasn't super committed to any of them. The audience seems to respond better to this one. Let's let them have what they want for that because there's something else that's a bigger, more important message I'm trying to get across or share through my work. Let's figure out how we can make that work. Consistent with our discussion about the strategies for art, level design, general gameplay mechanisms, and perhaps hopefully a theme throughout this entire video course series, has, is basically the same thing for test first, what I'm calling separate your darts wildly, right? Very different directions of tone, of style, of audience you're trying to reach for it. Not making too many assumptions that you already know the right answer because you may be wrong and you may be overlooking a huge potential segment that something else could have resonated with. So at the very least, even your initial search, while it's good to have reasons for different things, again, the reason could be, like I've said before, to get because this is going to be a very different attempt to reach a different kind of audience than the other ones we've tried. Realizing it may fall flat, it may not work, that's okay. Part of what's nice about the algorithms is that if it falls flat and it's just not for people, it probably won't go anywhere, and that's okay. Not got a lot of eyeballs on it to be upset is part of the nice thing about if it's just not a not landing for people, you're kind of okay. But you may also find there's a different way to position your work or the angle on it that you want to share on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Twitter, on I guess X now or whatever. Um, whatever the platforms are on blue sky and so on recognizing that within that audience there's a certain lens a state of mind that they're coming at it from to look at and that each time you're testing you're not finding a universal best message everywhere you're finding this is a way that the people who happen to be able to reach on facebook that's how they're responding to it as opposed to some other group and recognizing if you're going to try to adapt promoting work to some other platform it might be a different pitch to again test differently in different channels When it comes to audience testing, it's not assuming that you know the best audience to reach. It is figuring out how would we position this to speak to a different audience to try to see if that audience will resonate with it. And it's a common thing that happens in online business and business in general that who really shows up in droves in your audience may surprise you, may not be your own personal background, may not be who you thought. But if you ignore those people, they're not going to find you. There's a thing in the marketing world called NASCAR blindness of A lot of people who don't personally have an interest in NASCAR assume that nobody else is into it. And there are a lot, a lot, a lot of people who are. And I just like that as an example. There can be an enormous segment of the world, of the population, of people's interests. And maybe that's maybe you're in that segment and I'm not. 
but that if you overlook and forget about that, those are people who might enjoy your game. You're missing out. So at least to try it, to give yourself a shot to reach different people in different walks of life in different ways. You may have different needs, wants, interests, and so on. And it's part of what can be, be exciting about the prototyping experience because we can try theories and we can accept if we find out that we're wrong about it. If the answer was no, I tried the theory and now I have, I've done my due diligence on, I feel better at the direction I am going forward in because I tried the other options to see if it wasn't a great answer. I think I want to highlight from this course that comes up here again at the marketing stage is that most prototypes should probably never go forward to full development. Now, it may be fine to have it go in your portfolio to have a version of it, especially if it has some documentation, some storytelling, a part of your role, your position of that isn't so much to promote the product itself, but you and your design sense to a potential employer, or collaborator, or just the world around you. That's a valid lens on it. But most things aren't probably going to turn into sellable games and shouldn't. And I sometimes have seen the mistake from people. I want to make sure we're closing on this kind of note for this sort of trajectory about rapid prototyping that they'll think of it as I'm going to do step A, which is prototype. And step B, I'm going to build it bigger and better. And step C, I'm going to fund it and go get Kickstarter and whatever. And that makes an assumption that's inaccurate, that a prototype should always move forward. In many cases, it shouldn't. And it's like I alerted to in the case of the Kickstarter, because it's such a clear example of where sometimes the marketing reveals this thing shouldn't be commercialized. We're going to lose more on it than we would make. And it's a hard thing to face. It's a harder thing to not face if you should have. And there are games that have been fully operational, fully developed, fully worked, fully ready to ship. And they tested, they figured out the arcade cabinet when they put it in test locations, not enough people stuck to it, not enough people played it. You might ask, should they have prototyped it earlier or more? Maybe they tried but they didn't mass produce it because they figured out the math, the numbers just didn't work out. And again, this goes back to this version we talked about. You could prototype schedule links and figure out what's the, is the one year version that's worth it? Is the six month version that's worth it? Is the two, four week version that's worth it? And the trade-offs of what else could be using that time and energy on. And some as part of the marketing is figuring out, okay, well, hopefully we could figure out earlier if that was the case. Is there an audience for this? And this is where one of the strategies that marketing people use, I, and it can feel a little slimy to some people if it's just not the world that they're used to seeing, and realizing the good that it does and saves people is they'll market an advertising that doesn't exist yet. They'll make a landing page, a banner ad, a ad words, you name it, to test if this did exist, would you want it? And they might then feed you to a mailing list where they're going to contact you when or if it becomes available. They might then just have had one guy who uh, he just directed the traffic to a competitor's website and was like, well, here's something kind of like that. So whatever is another sale for them. We're not spending enough at scale to really meaningfully move their needle. We just want to figure out which ones out of the ones we test ran, people clicked on these, they didn't click on those. Are there ways they can figure out sooner rather than later? Would this be a mistake to develop? Is again, a part of that marketing work. You know, at a bigger studio and I was highly specialized in rapid prototyping. That's why I'm talking about talking about today. And I'd talk to someone in the marketing department and they would tell us just total confidence. They believed marketing should be involved from the beginning. And I just wanted to, I just, couldn't hear it. My skin crawled, felt awful, still kind of visceral reaction to even the thought of how I felt when I heard it then. But now I understand. What I understand is that there has to be an overlap between the thing we can build and want to build and are the right suited to build and what is ultimately going to be able to reach people, what we can find an audience for, what people will resonate with. But people at this moment in history that we have a way to reach, whether whether on our websites or promotions or our audience or whatever, that they'll want it. And if they don't, then perhaps we can be a little wiser about, is there something else that still also fits within what we can do that we're capable of that we want to do, but a little better aligns to would keep us in business for another year or would justify at least its cost and be more likely to recoup its costs rather than so many projects. So, so, so many projects, even once they go through publishers may not recoup their costs. That is part of why the publishing layer exists. This is part of the business world. They are essentially doing their own tests to figure out some things you can't tell till they're running on device. Some things you can't tell till it's being sold. This was not a hit. And they hope the hits are enough of a success to outweigh the other ones. But that is a very real part of the business world that they are very much trying to be as careful as they can about making choices for this one's worth launching. This one's moving forward. This one's funding. This one isn't. And respecting that when you're going through this kind of conversations, perhaps with a publisher and figuring out, okay, we got a prototype. We can bring it to a pitch meeting. We're going to make a case for why this should be moved forward. 
realizing that they may say no because they're not a right fit. They wouldn't know how to do it the way that would be a match for what you're building. Doesn't mean it, no one does. Doesn't mean it's totally wrong fit for everybody. It means that they aren't the right collaborator for it. In the same kind of way when teammate prototyped earlier about what if I worked with different people on my project or their project or a new project? How do we interact between each other? Same kind of things happening there for funding sources. They're looking not just at is this good on a linear scale from zero to 10. They're asking, is this right for me? A particular individual or company with a particular set of strengths, connections, audience reach, and so on. So I think it was Casper Gray of Arsenal Agency, longtime buddy of mine through Met through Indicate, and he talked about how, you know, some people get frustrated. They would try to pitch their horror noir game to a strategy game company, and the strategy game company would decline and they take it really harsh. And it's just like, no, they know how to sell things to strategy customers. They have a great reach of strategy customers. You're barking up the wrong tree and to understand that that's part of the process of trying these. And so we can engage with it then. If we're going into pitching, if we're going into trying to find partners, realizing that too is a prototyping lens of I am trying these connections just like we did for our teammate period of this course. If you hopefully were able to engage in that from that way to figure out who is a match so that we can construct work together and not taking personally any more than you sank half the prototypes you did in this course before you even get them evaluated or discussed with peers any more than we sank all but one before we figure out this is the one we want to forefront in a portfolio side or on your online presence or share because you feel like it's your best out of all the work you've kind of scraps you've thrown together in the garage. This is the one that's really the best shot out of any of them you have. Maybe you do this matrix decision spreadsheet on it. Same thing for those partnerships to realize that any given one's a prototype. It's trying it out. It's exploring, hey, could this be it? Maybe it's not. That's okay. All right? You're going to have more of those things that don't pan out than do. That's true for any successful game developer author, writer, artist, you name it. That is how the business and the marketing world work. And if you don't go in there with that expectation, you can wind up very frustrated, very burnt out, very jaded very quickly from, I must be doing it wrong because I asked three people I got no's. You got to ask more no's before you get to any yeses. Two more bits I want to share here. Uh, one is about business model prototyping. And again, this is a thing that I know bugs some people, feels gross. It's, it's a useful lens to understand that I mean, when Pokemon came out, part of what was happening was that Nintendo was trying to sell Link cables. They needed a reason for people to use Link cables with their Game Boys. That's part of why Pokemon exists. A lot of arcade games I grew up liking were designed around a quarter mechanic. A lot of games that uh, people saw happening throughout the late 90s were trying to hedge against. If a game was repetitive on the same play field, they would just rent it and they wouldn't buy it. That was part of the ecosystem back in the blockbuster era. And recognizing business models have an impact on the relationship to the project itself of what gets rewarded or incentivized. And so if we think about it as a, if I'm designing a game and it's the kind of game where they're going to derive hopefully maximum enjoyment if they keep doing it for a long period of time, if they do it at least once a month or something. Well, if it's a game that they buy once and then they never pay for it again, that doesn't help keep it in operation for people who enjoy it most. If it's something that can be set up somehow and structured in some way that they are okay with the deal, that it's on a subscription model, but they're happy, they're getting what they want out of it, beats other ways they would want to allocate those funds, and that they're enjoying the fact they're maintaining progress in the community or something, that may be a better way to make sure that the people who are just want to try it out can try it out safely at a lower cost. People who are really enjoying it can enjoy it longer, sustainably, and that they can help the proportionally pay back what they're enjoying out of it. And again, it it took me a long time to kind of get over some of my own hangups about how some of these systems work, but realizing that in many cases, where there's even things that, again, I don't love free to play, but I've also seen games that I think do it pretty well. Sometimes what they're doing is that they're realizing that by having some people who are able and willing and interested, assuming it's not an addiction, I mean, it's a different, it's absolutely a problem. It's a different thing I'm talking about. Able and willing to kind of support the structure of the entertainment and the updates enable so many other people to enjoy an experience who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford it is maybe a lens that helped me understand how that sometimes has a place in the world. And the only reason I mention this is that business models are continuing to evolve, experiment, and be invented. This is not something where every possible pattern has been solved or done. And when you kind of zoom out a little bit further from game design to realizing that you're sort of in doing product design, you're sort of doing experiential design where it's relating to them in their lives in a certain way. And if what's happening is that through some sort of partnership with a concert, through some other kind of mechanism, this gets funded, right? I've got friends who they work on the plane games that on an airplane in the back of the headrest or some custom puzzle games or whatever. Friends who worked on that stuff. Those are games, right? No one's buying it in a box. No one's buying it off of Steam. No one buys it on the App Store. That's not how those work. They get funded in a very different way. 
business models and how those deals happen are incredibly useful lens to consider if you're looking at doing this stuff commercially as a market, making a case to investors, et cetera, about what we might be able to recoup, how we might be able to get there, having a lens besides, well, I really want to pay for it with quarters. Sorry, you're alive at the wrong time. That's not how those projects work anymore. There may still be a niche for that to exist somewhere. It's going to look very different, though, than it used to in the 90s when arcade cabinets were being manufactured. This is also a case where it may be a version of looking at adjacent to entertainment space. And again, market is much more broad than just how do I sell effectively to someone who I assume I'm selling it to. If you assume you're selling this for entertainment to entertainment players, you are already put yourself in a certain bucket. There is an enormous range of serious games being developed for training, for socialization, for helping uh, team building exercises, whether it is a verbal game, whether it's a digital game, whether it's a board game. There are board games that help kids learn financial skills. And that's a different way to position it and market it and develop it than assuming this is just supposed to be a fun game for people who want fun. That's a fine thing. That's valid. There's plenty of that in the world. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. I enjoy a lot of that stuff too. Realizing that this is part of what we can prototype is exploring, are there fish in this pond? Is this something people are receptive to? I mean, I even know a person who, uh, he made a ton of money on a project that probably, I don't know, 20 people tops looked at because what he was doing was using Unreal many years ago to do architecture visualization for people trying to decide, is this, I don't know, $400 million skyscraper, whatever the heck it costs, is this a worthwhile investment? And it was not a mass market reach. It was not an in-app purchase. It was not a subscription. It was a, I can help you get this deal across more successfully in your pitch and find a way to connect that to making it funded and make it happen. It's a very different model to think about than what we're talking about. So serious games, games for training, games for learning, games for education, games for socialization, like talk about again, this is verbal games might be something a summer camp wants to license, have someone come in and facilitate. We had Playfair, I think, operating as part of the orientation program when I went to college. So thinking about these lenses is something that, again, is another tool in your tool belt for just like you might think about, well, would I rather have my game be on Switch or on iPhone? Would I rather have it on a Steam computer? Would I have it on a VR? It's not necessarily inherently wrong to also be asking questions about which way would people feel right about buying it as a good match for the kind of experience that this is aiming to be? And or where is there alignment between the kind of experience we're designing where if what I'm building is something that they finish in an hour and they never look at again, but it's really memorable, that's not good for subscription model. But that may be a case where they would love merch because I still think about Outer Wilds all the time, right? I still think about Mist all the time. My desk has a huge Mist mat on it. Anytime I see Outer Wilds merch, it's mine, <laughs> especially if it's official stuff. And these are things where it starts from realizing what is the appropriate way for the relationship of this game or this piece of software this activity we perform and people to engage with as part of a curriculum is it part of a, a plan is it part of a deployment for homeschooling all of these are valid options to weigh when you're looking from a marketing prototyping lens and not just assuming that the goal of marketing is to get more eyeballs without regard for which eyeballs they are or how you're finding them for what purpose so anyway got a couple suggested watches at the end of this one uh one's a bit of a You'll hear some echoes here of I only recently gave this class talk before I recorded this, but I was guest speaking for a friend's comics class online about indie marketing for small teams for solo people. A bunch of that is different than what I talked about here, so hopefully it'll still be useful to you. I encourage you to check that out. I'm going to link to that. It's just free on YouTube as well. And then uh, one of my old PhD presentations from many years ago, might have actually still been a master's, I think it was PhD at the time, about business models in relationship to game mechanics, aesthetics even, about how they afford different assumptions of the player experience from if a game looks like a low poly from if a game looks like pixel art and again these are marketing considerations of we're inviting a player in to say come with expectations that this is going to play like nes come with expectations it's going to play like a commodore 64 and when we're doing those is not just about what's more resourceful for our art pipeline or what's easier within our ability for i'm not going to mess up if i only have four colors to make mistakes in my color choices like with using overdone gradients or something it's realizing what we're communicating to our users, our players, our customers, our fans, our people reaching, even if it's free stuff. These are still things to think about. The whole section of that video is about if you're making free games and how does this relate to the work that we do? I've helped people release hundreds of free games. The course talks or the video, the second video about payment models connects a little bit to that stuff too. So check that out. Those are my recommendations. Again, I'm not quizzing you on stuff, not testing you on it. I just encourage you to check them out. I think they're worthwhile. I'm going to make one more little video here just to close things up, close the loop. Final week. Again, if you want to still do another prototype, 
I don't know, maybe between now and next time you discover a verbal game that only took you five minutes to come up with, but wow, this is it. This completely blows out of the water. The other thing we're trying to polish and test, you could do that. That's up to you. Or you could just put your all your energy on really finishing, following through, polishing, testing, play testing, applying the things we're talking about, perhaps some marketing testing, thinking about if you did commercialize this, if you did have some sort of economic model that's connected to payment, funding model, whatever, what might that be? Put it in your put it in your notes, put it in your documentation, think about it. You don't have to actually do it. Could. But next time we'll be trying to look at how to package your end results. We'll just talk momentarily about that. It's gonna be a short video just to wrap things up. Thanks for following along. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you following. I'm so hopeful you've actually been doing these exercises, not just listening and watching. If you have been, congratulations to you because we're almost there. Catch you next time. I want to here just close on a few notes about positioning your final released thing. HIO is I have found a great site currently. That's itch.io for releasing projects. It's what in my outside stuff and home team game dev, my main work that I do. Uh, it's all been on there and it's been outstanding, right? We've got 180 games on there. They're posted either from a central account or from a lead and other people can drop it into their collections. So this is great, right? If you wind up doing teamwork on your final project, if you wind up working with a collaborator, you can both put it in your itch collections, add your portfolios, and you don't have to both re-upload it separately, which is awesome. This also means you can customize there uh, the background for the page. Some people do background art. Some people do other kind of page styling. You can set colors for edit game thing after you upload. Real easy stuff on itch. It's good for stuff that plays in browser. It's good for stuff that plays on download only. It's also something where on that website for itch, I, well, I'm not trying to study anything. This is a free stuff, all this on itch. You can also sell things on itch though, if you wanted to. I've got to think of some of my textbooks and things on there. But it's something where when you post it, you can think about what is the copy you're putting next to your game. And again, this kind of makes you think about that marketing prototyping. Sometimes where that sort of evolves from, if you especially want to get that kind of brings up a level, can be from you've practiced talking to people about it. So one of the values people get out of when they go to something like Game Developers Conference or Indicate or Siege or one of these other games conferences, PAX East, PAX West, you name it. Some, Indicate EU, if that's in person again at some point. These are things where talking about your work repeatedly with dozens of people back to back to back to back, you start to find these patterns in how I talk about the thing and realize some things confuse people, some things people get immediately and I can really lean on that. So sometimes if you see great copy that's like on a Steam page that someone develops, which so this this lead here, Robo Hunters, he's also putting his game up on Steam, even though mostly developed in home team. He's doing something where he's figuring out, can I you know, position it better on that platform than he does over here, just for contrast to it. And the wording for a lot of good Steam stuff comes from, again, talking to people at the game, figuring out what resonates with them, kind of stump speech, a version of prototyping. How do I explain my game efficiently to someone who's not me? And that's part of the exercise of releasing your things. I just want to pull up this Jeremiah, jeremiahgames.com. I think it used to be called Jeremiah Makes Games. It redirects now. But he was a member longer ago in our groups all his games portfolio again it's an itch collection which is very easy to assemble where he can put his custom notes these aren't the shared blurbs everybody else says it says what did i do what are my contributions it's often your interest and you're trying to show something something in your portfolio what was your involvement never mind everybody else's it's also nice where you see that this one's uploaded by him uploaded by another project lead the same person as the robo hunters uploaded by him uploaded by the central account the, that lead of pro that the different lead casts and basically what happens is no matter who uploaded it, again, everybody can include in their portfolios. It links to the same page with the same design, the same setup. And so those are things where it's a nice benefit of using itch for your portfolios. It's easy to update, add more projects to. If you have game jams, other class and school projects, other side projects, solo projects, club projects, whatever you want to add, anything on itch, including commercial projects on itch, you can put it all in your collection. You can rearrange the order. You can change the blurbs. I just can't keep singing the praises enough for how cool itch.io is for putting your games online, making it distributable, make it easily accessible, whether it's free, whether you want to put a price on it, whatever. And then also want to point out to, I think, he's really got some good examples here of documentation that I still wind up holding up for people. If he built some levels for a VR game we did, and he just got good examples of his kind of process, why he did the spaces the way he did, how it fits into the big picture. And notice it's not super long, right? You got to assume people are really busy. But thinking about when you're trying to make your work appealing as a designer, realizing a lot of people are, are not going to go play your game. They're going to read about it or look at it. So this is another one. I love this one here. Notice how he shows his process steps here. Screenshot of the levels it used to be. It kind of before and after where he filled in, where it went. Some new perspectives. He talks about some mechanics he added about rotating platforms to make it possible. 
what he wanted to do with the design, how it interfaced to the jump mechanic, capture these little short animations. That's a great way to show on a page. If you're not primarily an artist, you're primarily a level designer, you're primarily a programmer. Sometimes the stuff in motion will go a long way to help better convey what you did, how you did it, better fodder for interviews. So one reason I'm bringing this up, right, is not just about your final project, which I always, again, suggest put it on each of you can. And if it's an analog, if it's paper, again, you might still have known people who have sold PDFs or given away PDFs on itch as a distribution platform because they can then track the metrics for how many people downloaded it with links that they come in from all kinds of cool advantages like that if they want to host their work, put a file anywhere online if you're comfortable with it being public. But I like this kind of example too because it's a reminder. So the examples you've been documenting for your own notes, for your own purposes, and I hope you really took to heart when I said take screenshots, take photos, make notes to yourself. If you can go back and pick the strongest of those, and maybe not even all seven that you kind of, I keep suggesting, you know, narrow down to get evaluated the top half for an instructor, for me, if you're in home team, for teammates, if you're collaborating with other peers and just online discords or something, it's something where you may want to go back and uh, turn that material into something presentable as a portfolio. It's different than trying to sell the game to people. It's different than trying to say, this is great. It's saying that this is something that I learned from, I can articulate, I have a process around. That's going to make you look a much stronger designer than someone else who's also done the same thing, but hasn't bothered to surface it, to get it across, to make that message effective about you have a thought process, you rapid prototype. And this is the thing I went up having to kind of couch myself against all the time because people will be like, you're a prototype, you just spaghetti at the wall. Not really. As I hope this course made clear, there's a lot of process considerations, factors, things of doing this that are different than I just try stuff and see a little bit of that, not a lot of that. And this sort of thing is so pivotal to help show like, oh, they can communicate with others. They're not just going to some lone wolf off in the corner. They can do things that other people can understand. It's going to come from putting together a good portfolio site. I guess the last thing I'll have to just the last thing I'll throw it out to by the card.co. Again, not trying to sell you anything. This is not my service. Um, card.co, C-A-R-R-D.co, C-A-R-R-D.co. I have found has been a really good site for designing my websites. Once I figured this thing out years ago, I've been using this now for most of my websites. It's just a good personal portfolio creation site that's different than if you want something more document, documentation, telling, storytelling, as opposed to what we've been doing here with the kind of itch portfolios of here are links to the games. Because remember, like I said, potential collaborators, HR people, family members, whatever, they're less likely to actually play these games. They're more likely to actually just go check out your website to read your summaries, to browse your animations. That's how they interface to it first. Only then, if they're really interested in that, will they further punch through to actually play the game. So it's good to have the game online. Don't expect most people to actually go out and play it. Expect they're going to navigate your documentation first. And perhaps it becomes part of your marketing angle. If you can kind of help sell on TikTok, on YouTube shorts, on tweets, on something, the process of creation that can engage people with it in another lens. So then they're kind of curious to go check it out. But anyway, I just want to share these kind of ideas here to help get you started about positioning your final project, how you want to put it online. Obviously, again, this is a note for... I'm just talking here for if you're just on YouTube, if you're in home team, doing things on your own. If you're an institution, there may be additional constraints to be aware of. Find out what those are about public work, about which names are public in a project. I'm very aware of and sensitive to things like FERPA. There's restrictions on even making clear who is in which classes or who was where, when, and so on, because some people are trying to stalker concerns, family they need to avoid, any other variety of issues that are all valid and legit. So keep that in mind before you just go put someone else's name on public if they're your teammate or even your own if you're sensitive to those challenges. But I want to raise awareness there for some options, card.co, C-A-R-R-D.co, or some of these options like you see here on itch.io for posting your project and how you want to frame and set it up on that page so it gets a good first impression for people. That's it for now, though. I want to thank you again for following this course. I'm really curious to see if you want to share, if there's some way to share in comments wherever you're at, wherever you're seeing this, a link to your end result. If you want to drop a link there, and I bet YouTube probably going to try to snap those down and say that it looks too much like you're doing spam. If you just want to maybe give us some clues and say, hey, I worked on this. I had a really great time doing it. Here's some things to Google that might lead you there. Um, maybe try that. You're welcome to try and share a link. Again, I think it might get blocked by the algorithm as suspicious. Anyway, I'd like to check it out. If you also can find me online somewhere and post it at me on some service, email it to me, etc. Uh, again, I may not run your executable because I'm very security aware. Uh, but I might like to read about some of your documentation, check out what you're up to. And I can't offer any feedback on everybody who does stuff, but it would be cool to at least see what you're up to, some of the writing out there. And of course, if you are in home team, then yeah, I can absolutely engage with you and work on this stuff at a more detailed level. Anyway, that's it. Thanks so much for following along. Hope it's been helpful for you. Uh, really proud of you for following through on this, for finishing it. 
Um, hope it's been useful and look forward to seeing all the cool stuff we're doing in the future ahead. Thanks for being here. And uh, yeah, best wishes out there. Go create awesome things. Thank <laughs> you.